services. This is a public hearing. It's designed to be set up, set up so that we can hear from the public. That's why we're here this morning. And so we, as is traditionally done, we'll hear from uh, someone to introduce the bill. That will be Representative Meyer. Then we'll hear from the proponents, the folks in support of the bill. And then we'll hear from the opponents against the bill. And there are a couple of folks who want to testify neither for nor against. If, you've, if you were signed up by 8.30, we'll get to you in the order in which we can. At, uh, at the end of the signed up folks, we'll ask if there's anybody else who wants to testify just to make sure everybody has a chance to have their say. Uh, that'll be later on. And given the numbers of people who are testifying today, we'll be using a three minute clock. If you'd like to watch so that you don't have to listen constantly uh, with a handheld, whatever, uh, you can go to legislature.main.gov, look under committees, um, legislative committees, and choose HHS, Health and Human Services. There you can find a link to our YouTube channel where you can watch and listen at the same time. This is all recorded too, so you can hear old uh, meetings. Um, so uh, let's introduce ourselves and then I'll have some other specific remarks about how the day is to flow. So uh, let's start with Representative Lemlin. Good morning, I'm Michael Lemlin. I represent House District 88, Chelsea, Jefferson, Whitefield and half of Nobleborough. Thank you, Representative uh, Silver. Thank you, good morning. My name is Holly Stover. I represent House District 89, including the towns of Booth Bay, Booth Bay Harbor, Southport, Edgecombe, Westport Island, and part of South Bristol. Representative Perry. Good morning, I'm Ann Perry. I represent House District 40, 140, wrong, wrong direction here. Uh, and I represent the communities of Indy Township, Baileyville, Barron, Callis, Charlotte, Robinson, Perry, Pembroke, and Pleasant Point. Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. I'm Margaret Craven, and I represent House District 59, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Javner. Left of Jan Javner isn't right available right off, so we'll go to Senator Moore. Oops. Good morning. I'm Marianne Moore, and I represent Senate District 6, which is all of Washington County, as well as Goldsboro, Winter Harbor, and Sullivan in Hancock County as well. Representative Griffin. Good morning. My name is Abigail Griffin. I represent House District 102, which is Glumber and Levant and Kodeske. Thank you. Well, we'll check in with Representative Javner again to see if she's available. If not, we'll go to Representative Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, and thanks to everyone for joining us here today. I'm Representative Michelle Meyer, proudly serving Southern Maine's House District 2, which is all of Elliott and parts of South Berwick and Kittery. And I'm Ned Claxton. I'm honored to represent the folks of uh, Senate District 20, which includes Auburn, where I live, Minot, Mechanic Falls, Poland, and New Gloucester. So um, as you will see, there'll be people coming and going through this meeting, uh, committee members. Uh, we're trying to be in multiple different committees at any one time. So uh, that's why the changing faces. Uh, before we get to some other instructions, let's introduce our staff. We'll start with Ms. Braun. Good morning, my name is Kristen Braun. Um, I'm a researcher with the Office of Policy and Legal Analysis and um, I will be taking notes during the hearing and um, at the end, I'll be taking any information requests that committee members may have. Thank you. And uh, Carrie Withy, when you're ready. Good morning, my name is Carrie Withy. I'm the clerk for the Health and Human Services Committee. Again, if you need any assistance today during the hearing, you can email me at hhs at legislature.main.gov. Yes, Representative Perry. Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention, because I didn't see Representative Talbot Ross's name on the roster of testifiers, is that I will be reading her testimony this morning. Very good. Thank you. And uh, 
with that, I'll go to the, get into the specifics. Everybody will have three minutes after the bill has been uh, introduced. We'll go in order of the folks who are proponents, followed by the folks who are opponents. Uh, there's been requests from both groups uh, about a certain order, and we'll try and respect those. We also will try and pull in folks from the executive branch who are here on limited time and uh, prior legislators uh, like the Honorable Jeff Gratwick also get special dispensation. So we'll try to get him in here as soon as we can. Um, and uh, any other thoughts? What we have found through these meetings is that the important content often comes at the very end of your testimony. Three minutes is about a page and a half of tight material. What we need to hear as a committee is what why this bill is particularly important to you. We need your story. You'll quickly see that we will have plenty of statistics to deal with and plenty of information at the very start. But what we won't have is your experience and uh, your story. And that's what rounds out the testimony. So if you could get to that pretty quickly, uh, we would be grateful. Welcome, uh, Senator Davis. We'll be introducing the bill shortly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Good morning. All right, so let's start with having the bill presented and we'll begin with Representative Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Claxton and distinguished members of the Health and Human Services Committee, I am Representative Michelle Meyer in service to the people of Southern Maine's House District 2, Elliott and parts of Kittery and South Berwick. I am pleased to introduce LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. I have spent my professional career as a registered nurse. I've had the distinct honor of providing care to others across the lifespan, from the delivery room and the miracle of childbirth to the final hours of a life sometimes long lived, but too often, sadly, ravaged by disease and taken too soon. While it may seem a cliche, I chose the caring profession because quite simply, I was drawn to helping and making a difference in the lives of others. I see my role as a policymaker as a direct extension of my nursing practice. The 13 of us on this committee have the ability to impact the health and well being of every Mainer our older citizens, our families, the children, not just today, but for generations to come. There may be few other bills we have considered together that have the potential to make such a significant impact on the health of Maine kids and communities. Tobacco use puts our children's health and future at risk. It's an addiction that begins in adolescence and too often ends in early death. Smoking kills more people than any other preventable illness and it causes chronic disease and disability, harming nearly every organ of the body. At the root of all of this is nicotine addiction. Nicotine addiction is really only possible in young developing brains. If you have not started smoking by the age of 26, it's unlikely you, were ever, you will ever do so. The tobacco industry knows this, of course, and has spent decades marketing products specifically designed to lure and hook youth and young adults. That's where it's beginning. With the majority of smokers starting in their teens, and most of them with flavored tobacco products like menthol, mint, and candy flavors, all making it easier for kids to give cigarettes, chewing tobacco, and now e-cigarettes or vaping a try. These, there are thousands of these flavored products in 80% of kids who use tobacco started with a flavored product. The tobacco industry is ruthless and predatory. 
They are willing to do and say anything to preserve their ability to manufacture, market, and sell deadly products with few limitations, products designed to lure kids into addiction. As a legislator and house chair of this committee, I see the alarming rise of tobacco use among Maine's children as a policy failure. By allowing tobacco companies to continue to peddle flavored products in our state, we are setting up our children and our grandchildren to experience adverse health outcomes in years of addiction. So the most important thing for us to remember because it makes it easy to see where to apply public policy is that without youth and young adult tobacco use, there would virtually be no tobacco related disease and early death. That means longer, more productive lives and it means big reductions in healthcare costs. Like most every other area of policy of particular importance to me, this legislation is also personal. Tobacco's youth recruitment efforts were trained on my own child. Do you know that tobacco manufacturers have aggressively targeted certain communities with their menthol products? people of color, LGBTQ people, my son fell in both categories. His was often the only beautiful little brown face in a classroom full of beautiful little white faces. And coming to terms with his sexual orientation was challenging. There was never any shortage of those who would remind him he was different. The tobacco industry convinced kids like mine that smoking was a means to acceptance. It convinced my young person struggling with the development of his identity that being a cool, confident, gay guy of color started with a pack of menthol cigarettes. While his smoking career was thankfully short-lived, the same cannot be said for 95% of adult smokers who started before the age of 21. There are many behind me waiting to provide testimony on LD 1550. You'll hear from advocates and experts and fellow Mainers who want you to know that their nicotine addiction may have been avoided had they not been enticed, seduced as kids and young adults to start smoking or vaping, sweet, minty menthol products that made smoking so easy to start and led to, de to a dependence on a substance that robs those who are addicted of full, healthy lives. You'll hear too from those carrying the message of the tobacco industry, an industry skilled in scare tactics and falsehoods, an industry that preys on our children. Last week, the US Food and Drug Administration announced it will be issuing tobacco product standards within the next year to ban menthol flavored cigarettes and all flavored cigars. Armed with strong scientific evidence, the FDA believes these actions will launch our country on a trajectory toward ending tobacco related disease and death in the United States. This is an important step forward, but FDA action often takes years to go into effect. We have an opportunity here in Maine to take swift action to protect Maine's children from developing nicotine addictions through the use of flavored tobacco products. LD 1550 would prohibit the sale and distribution of all flavored tobacco products flavored e-cigarettes and cigars. LD 1550 is a game changer for every child tempted by sweet minty flavors and quickly caught up in a lifetime of addiction. We have an opportunity to change the trajectory of young lives, to push back on an industry 
long preying on our kids, to use the unique honor of our service to this state to advance policy out of this committee that will literally save lives across the lifespan and for generations to come. Healthy kids ready to learn, healthy workers more productive on the job, and healthy older adults able to remain independent in their own home, enjoying their years of active and involved in life. Let's stop the cycle of addiction, of chronic illness, of untimely death. Let's stand up to the tobacco industry deception and ruthless targeting of our kids. Let's end the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Let's do what we were sent here to do, to improve the lives of all Mainers and to protect the health and future of our children. I wanna thank the committee in advance for your time and attention to what is likely to be a long day of testimony. And I wanna thank all of those, everyone here to present their testimony. I urge the committee to support LD 1550 and thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Representative Meyer. Are there any questions of Representative Meyer from the committee? Not seeing any, uh, we'll give Representative Javner a chance to introduce herself. Good morning, I'm Representative Kathy Javner and I represent House District 141, which is located in Penobscot and Washington counties. And as is tradition, we then go to uh, legislators who want to testify uh, at this time in support and we'll begin with Senator Davis. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Senator Clarkman, Representative Myers, and colleagues on the Committee on Health and Human Services. I'm Paul Davis, and I represent and have the honor of representing Senate District 4, which includes all of Piscataquis County and parts of Somerset and Penobscot. And I'm here to speak on this, uh, this LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. And that is exactly what the bill does. It prohibits the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes. Now, <clears throat> you're gonna hear from advocates behind me about the science behind this proposal and the research that shows it will significantly, significantly reduce tobacco consumption and prevent youth from ever using tobacco products. This is something I strongly believe that we need to address as a state. It's interesting to think about tobacco. Tobacco is the only product when it's used as it's supposed to be used, as it's instructed to be used, causes death, addiction, disease, and all kinds of problems, not just to the individual, but socially and to folks all around them with secondhand smoke and whatever. I know this personally. When I left the Army back a long time ago, Senator Claxton, you and I were a lot younger, <laughs> um, I was heavily addicted to smoking. I smoked at least two packs a day. I'd reach out at two or three o'clock in the morning when I woke up and get my cigarettes and lay there in bed and smoke a cigarette. My faith in God allowed me to quit and it was a real struggle, but I did. And tobacco has also tragically affected my family. I lost both my father and my brother to lung cancer. They both were very heavy smokers. And I believe my mother passed away because of secondhand smoke and breathing it on her married life. My generation and that of many of us in the legislature and of our great state have been gripped by the addiction of tobacco. Many of us started smoking long before the dangers of smoking were well known, before the tobacco industry was caught lying to Congress about the health effects and the addictive nature of tobacco. We can, however, help ensure that the current generation of young people in middle schools and high schools and colleges all across the state don't get trapped by this addiction. And they, in fact, could 
become the first tobacco-free generation. Sadly, my family is not alone in experiencing the tragic effects of tobacco use. I was very surprised to learn that Maine has the sixth highest rate of tobacco-related cancer cases in the nation. Only the United States, the little state of Maine, has the sixth highest rate. And the 11th highest rate of tobacco-related cancer deaths. Sadly, again, Piscataquis County, a beautiful county that has Mount Katahdin and Moosehead Lake in it, has the highest adult smoking rate of all the counties in Maine for more than one in five adults that smoke. In Maine, more than one in four high school students use e-cigarettes, a rate that nearly doubled in the two years between 2017 and 2019. My county, Piscataquis County, or the county I live in, I guess I should say, saw the greatest increase in high school e-cigarette use in that two year period where the use rate quadrupled. We got to do more folks. Now, I also sponsored the bill two or three years ago, at least that long ago, time goes quickly, uh, that raised the age to 21. I learned a lot doing that. The American Cancer Society had asked me to do it and I, I agreed to. Uh, one thing I did learn was the monetary loss. Now this, I certainly consider the pain and suffering and the loss to families and everything that go along, but far more important than monetary loss, but the monetary loss certainly is what we need to consider as well. At that time, it was said that the state of Maine tobacco related diseases amounted to about $800 million a year in costs. About $400 million of that was public money. The rest was private insurance or people paying for it out of their own pockets. I dare say that's far more than that today, even though it's only been three or four years, uh, prices certainly have spiraled an awful lot. That's just a monetary loss. That has nothing to say about the anxiety and the anguish and the sorrow that goes along with the suffering and the pain and everything that people have to go through because they're addicted. I remember my father sitting on the edge of his bed and coughing until he was all out of breath and he could only make just a tiny, tiny noise. My mother gasping for breath, my brother suffering. I remember it very well. Now you're gonna to hear today from opponents of this legislation about how this legislation will do more harm than good, how businesses will close and the sky will fall. In 2017, as I said, when I sponsored legislation to increase the minimum sales uh, of tobacco products to 21 years of age, opponents made the same claims. Labian, the policy is radical, saying businesses would close and that it would cause illicit sales. If you look at the testimony submitted on that bill, you would likely see the same arguments as you hear today. And as Representative Myers pointed to, the same folks that are providing the money for it. <clears throat> I was proud when Maine became one of the first states in the nation that passed legislation because I knew it was the right thing to do. And amazingly, Governor Christie in New Jersey very shortly afterwards signed legislation doing the same thing. And amazingly again, President Trump signed the federal legislation raising the legal sales age. There's a lot of people that agree with us all across the political spectrum. When we passed the law in 2017, we did not see so-called unattempts, unintended consequences the industry warned us about and I doubt very much if we'll see if you good folks pass this legislation out of the full legislature and we enact it and the governor signs it, that that'll happen again. You will hear there are legal problems that some adults enjoy. There are, excuse me, I said that wrong. You will hear these are legal products that some adults enjoy and should have the choice to buy. When I was younger and smoking two packs a day, it didn't feel like a choice. Losing a brother and a father and a mother, the lung cancer, man, secondhand smoke. And I look back on it all, and certainly I didn't have any choice in the matter. 
Something that is worth protecting, however, is the health and longevity of future generations' lives by putting a stop to enticing and addictive products such as flavored tobacco. Let's stay focused on the point of this straightforward legislation. Most kids first use tobacco products that are flavored. The flavors attract them to use products and make it harder to quit. I remember sitting in the woods when we were hunting and a friend lit up his pipe and he had cherry blend in it. And what a wonderful aroma that was. And another friend that I worked with when I was in the state police, he used to smoke flying Dutchman. And what a nice aroma that was. It was very enticing. Flavors like menthol also make it more difficult for adults to quit. Getting rid of the flavors will prevent and reduce tobacco use when Maine ranks in the top 10 for tobacco-related cancer causes. We cannot wait for federal action. These cancer cases are real lives that impact, impact real families like mine and more than likely, sadly, some of yours. We must lead the nation again because it is the right thing to do. Thank you very much, Senator Claxton and Representative Myers for considering this legislation and allowing me to speak. And thank you, Senator Davis. Are there any questions? I don't see any. So thank you again for being here. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. You too. Next, we'll go to uh, Representative Perry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am uh, reading uh, Representative Talbot Ross's uh, testimony. Uh, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Tal uh, Rachel Talbot Ross. I represent House District 40 which includes the uh, Portland neighborhoods of Parkside, Bayside, East Bayside, Oakland, and the University of Southern Maine campus. It is my honor to offer this testimony in support of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. I want to start by saying that I cannot thank the committee enough for all the time and effort you have put into doing the critically important work of public health policy during dual public health emergencies. The relentless impacts of both COVID-19 and systemic endemic racism and on our health, our communities, our economy, and our humanity are tremendous. But I am honored to be working with all of you to dismantle some of the most egregious systems that have perpetuated health disparities and generational poverty and to rebuild new policy framework through an equity lens, prioritizing our shared resources to create new opportunities for all people in Maine. When things are complicated, especially as we work to unravel long held but dysfunctional policies and practices, it is always nice to have some low hanging fruit. Well, it would be difficult to name another widely available commercial product that has caused more deadly harm to African Americans than menthol cigarettes. For decades, the tobacco industry has been marketing menthol cigarettes directly, systemically, and relentlessly to African Americans, particularly African American youth and young adults. They have done this through sponsorship of community and music events, free sampling, magazine advertising, and retail promotions. In the 1950s, less than 10% of black adults smoked, uh, smoked used, who smoked used menthol cigarettes. Today, after decades of tobacco industry targeting, that number is 85%. Let me say that again. More than eight out of 10 black cigarette smokers smoke menthols. This is absolutely no coincidence and menthol cigarettes continue to be heavily advertised, widely available and priced cheaper in black communities. Tobacco use is the number one cause of preventable death among black Americans, claiming 45,000 black lives every year. Black Americans die at rates higher than any other racial or ethnic group in the US from diseases such as cancer, heart disease, stroke, and stroke. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in the black community. 
And now black Americans are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The US CDC has found that smoking increases the risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Smoking is also a major cause of underlying conditions like heart disease, diabetes, that disproportionately impact black Americans and make them more vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic. The connections are not hard to see. We know the devastation of tobacco use on the health and productivity of black Americans is no accident. It is the result of the tobacco industry's long history of targeting the black community with menthol cigarettes. As you will hear from other speakers, menthol numbs the throat and reduces the harshness of the tobacco, making it easier for first time users to become addicted. Long-term tobacco users. Menthol also makes it harder to quit. The data shows that while more black smokers try to quit, they are less likely to succeed. So when it comes to justice and fairness, strong tobacco control policy and menthol specifically are low hanging fruit in confronting the disparities that are created and perpetuated by the tobacco industry. This bill is straightforward. It is about getting one of the deadliest products designed and marketed to lure and hook kids and black Americans off the store shelves. I hope you will join me in saying enough is enough to black people dying from menthol flavored tobacco products. I want to close by saying that I am saddened and deeply offended by last week's effort by the tobacco industry to co-opt the ongoing tragedy of police violence against black Americans for their own purposes and benefit. When the FDA announced that they would begin rulemaking process to prohibit the sale of menthol cigarettes, a process we know will take years to complete and to implement, the tobacco industry began stoking a duplicitous fear that criminal gangs would begin operating illegal markets of menthol cigarettes in towns large and small across Maine. And at the same time that black people would be at greater risk of being targeted and fairly unfairly attacked by police for appearing to possess menthol cigarettes. In this chaotic imagery, there is something racist for everyone. It is important to know that Maine law does not criminalize purchase, use, or possession of tobacco products. The PUP laws were eliminated when this legislator passed Tobacco 21 in 2017. And federally, the FDA prohibited prohibition on menthol and most flavored cigars would also not apply to individuals who possess or use these products. So no matter how you hear this convoluted story of gangs and police violence, the tobacco industry is stoking fear, telling lies and casting doubt in order to shift the narrative from their purposeful and perpetual predation on black Americans. I am asking each of you to reject this cynical argument and to remain vigilant for other tobacco industry attacks that only serve one purpose, to preserve their ability to manufacture and sell addictive, deadly products to Maine youth and young adults. Let me repeat that ending the sale of menthol cigarettes will disproportionately benefit Black Americans by reducing smoking and saving lives. I ask you to vote yes on LD 1550 and end the sale of flavored tobacco products. I thank Representative Meyer for bringing this forward and I thank each of you for your time and commitment to the health of all Maine people. Thank you, Representative Perry. I don't see any questions. I see we're joined by a couple of members of the Maine CDC. We'll start first with uh, Nirav Shah. Well, welcome, doctor. Good morning, uh, members of the committee, 
Uh, Chair Claxton and uh, Chair Meyer, thank you so much for allowing me to spend some time with you this morning. Uh, I am delighted to be here to speak in favor of and discuss the implications of passage of LD 1550. Where I'd like to begin with is taking a step back. Uh, if, if you take a look back at the 20th century and large parts of the 21st century, it almost seems as if the system we had in place was designed, architected, and engineered to hook as many young people on tobacco products as possible. There's a saying that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And when you take a look at the tobacco policy and the architecture that we had in place around tobacco for the last 50 plus years, it seems that much of it was almost entirely designed to get as many young kids as possible to, be, to get them to become smokers. It should be no surprise then that rates of youth smoking have been high and have stayed high, even though they've come down just a bit in recent years. That's unacceptable. We know the implications to young people and their developing brains to large scale exposure to nicotine and other products. But again, when you take a look at the way that we conceived of tobacco products, it should be no surprise that we were left with the results that we got. LD, LD 1550 is an opportunity to change course and make a permanent and lasting impact on tobacco policy in Maine, and therefore, and thereby, affect and improve the lives of young people across the state. I suspect that many of the statistics have already been discussed this morning, but they do bear repeating. The tobacco industry has had a long history of targeting kids with flavored products. And the evidence is clear that flavors play a role in the choice to initiate tobacco, as well as the choice of which product is used. Flavors improve the taste of tobacco and they mask the harshness of the tobacco products themselves, making it easier for kids to try these products and ultimately become hooked on them. That is why ending the sale of all tobacco fla flavored tobacco products is critical to putting an end to the youth smoking problem we have in our state and in other states. Now, other states have already taken action, to say nothing of numerous cities. Maine now has an opportunity to join those who have said that they will no longer tolerate a system that is designed to hook as many kids on smoking and tobacco as possible. According to the latest data, from the 2020 National Youth Tobacco Survey, about one in every five high school kids and one in every 20 middle school kids were currently using e-cigarettes. Now again, and as I noticed, as I noted, this is a decline from 2019, which is a good thing, but it comes on top of an unprecedented increase, explosion in the use of e-cigarette use in recent years. What's driving this explosion? It's one thing, primarily, flavored tobacco products. As was just noted, about eight in every 10 youth e-cigarette users use flavored products. E-cigarettes are sold in over 15,000 flavors, ranging from mint to menthol, from gummy bear to cotton candy. And they are sometimes framed as low risk or even no risk by some members of the tobacco industry but that's just not true. The US Surgeon General concluded that youth use of nicotine in any form, including via e-cigarettes, including via flavored products is unsafe. Nicotine is highly addictive and can cause harm to adolescent brain development, particularly the parts of the brain that are responsible for things like attention, memory, and of course, learning. Menthol in particular bears a special note in discussion. There is ample evidence in favor of ending the sale of menthol products. The reason menthol is added is to cool and numb the throat and thus reduce the harshness of tobacco smoke, making menthol cigarettes more appealing for kids who are starting to smoke because of the less harsh appearance and the less harsh experience they have. Indeed, over, youth, over half of youth smokers choose menthol cigarettes. Menthol alone is found by the US FDA 
to increase smoking initiation and progression, increase nicotine dependence, and reduce the success in quitting smoking. I suspect the committee has also and already discussed the disparate racial impact of menthol. In the 1950s, fewer than 10% of black smokers used menthol cigarettes. Today, it's over 80% of black smokers who use menthols. This is not an accident. Indeed, none of these statistics is an accident. Whether the high rates of youth smoking, the high rates of youth e-cigarette use, their reliance upon flavored tobacco, and the disproportionate impact of menthol cigarettes on racial and ethnic minorities. None of these things is an accident. Indeed, they were intentional and by design. Why, would, why otherwise would flavors be marketed in the way they are, in the manner they are, to the groups they are? We have an opportunity today through LD 1550 to change course and make youth tobacco something of the past, not of the current. And that's why the main CDC is prou proud of and pleased to support the passage of LD 1550. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Claxton, Chair Meyer, and to all the members of the committee. I appreciate your time this morning. I'm happy to take any questions as the chair deems. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Are there any Are questions, there any questions doctor? doctor? I'm not seeing yes. any. So we'll go to the, to, uh, to, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce your name, but we'll go to uh, Hermione Pierre. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Senator Claxton, Representative Mayor, member of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Hermione Pierre. And I am the health program manager for the tobacco prevention and control program at the main center for disease control and prevention. I am here today to provide testimony on behalf of the main center for disease control and prevention, and will be speaking in support of LD 1550 an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. The main Center for Disease Control and Prevention, main CDC, supports this bill and offers the following information for consideration. Flavored tobacco products, no matter the type, appeal to youth. Cigarettes are prohibited from containing flavors except for tobacco or menthol. Other tobacco products, including cigars and e-cigarettes are available in myriads of fruit, candy and other flavors that mask the harshness and are appealing to young people. The vast majority of adult smokers first start before 18 years of age and are more likely to start with flavored products. Mentor has analgesic property, making even easier to inhale, increases the likelihood of nicotine dependence, decreases the likelihood of quitting and contributes to disparities, to disparity in use in certain population. Many states and community have restricted the sale of flavored tobacco products, which resulted in a loss of tax revenue. Although it is difficult to predetermine the magnitude of the bill's fiscal impact, states like California found that the healthcare cost savings and quit rates offset the potential loss in, rev in tax revenue. Any projection of loss revenues would be speculative in nature since data will be gathered following the implementation of the bill. Federal courts have found that federal law does not limit 
the authority of the jurisdictions to prohibit the sale of tobacco products in accordance with the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act passed in 2009. Research has also found that laws that do not include menthol cigarettes and, or that do not apply to all tobacco retailers may reinforce health disparities. Additionally, the main CDC suggests that the language specific to electronic smoking device found in the bill be reviewed for potential impact on regulations governing men's medical use of marijuana program, and specifically that the legislation clarifies whether the provision of this bill apply to these laws that refer to perm permissible paraphernalia. Thank you for consideration of this matter and for the opportunity to provide testimony today. I can address questions from committee and I will be available to participate in the work session. Merci beaucoup. Have Je vous en prie. <laughs> <laughs> Has any, anybody any questions from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move to the Honorable Jeff Gratwick. Good morning, sir. Can you hear me, please? We can. We can't see you, but good. we can hear you. Well, good. Um, good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and the august members of the HHS committee. I'm Jeff Gratwick. I live in Bangor. But really, my other address is in your committee. I feel like I'm somewhat adrift now that I'm no longer anchored in your particular august committee. It's a pleasure to be here and indeed I'm speaking in favor of LD 1550. Given my background as a physician, it's perhaps not um, unexpected that I talk about some of the uh, addictive effects of nicotine um, because I think this is a foundation that you need as you begin to just think about this issue. Nicotine is a plant-based alkaloid it's very rapidly absorbed either through a respiratory route or through your skin. It takes really only seven seconds to get from your lungs to the, your brain. Um, it has many, many physiologic effects. It, nicotine increases the heart rate, increases your blood pressure, constricts peripher peripheral blood vessels, and this can be a particular problem uh, in both old and young people. It alters uh, clotting function and platelets, so people clot more easily. Um, and interestingly, it promotes tumor growth by decreasing apoptosis. And apoptosis is a very interesting um, concept that is it's programmed cell death. All of the cells in our body at some point are, are programmed to die. And this, um, in certain cancer cells, they do not, they're not programmed to die anymore. And also, it increases angiogenesis and neovascularization. And these are both complex words, but mean that there is basically more blood vessels that are gonna be around um, growing cells. And this is a, um, this is tumors love, cancer cells love uh, apop uh, decreasing apoptosis and increasing blood flow for them. Nicotine has many central nervous system effects and it's taken up by very specific receptors in the brainstem. It has bad deleterious effects on brain metabolism, neurotransmitters, and brain development. It certainly acts as a stimulant. It can increase alertness, but it decreases sleep, alters your mood, alters attention, alters concentration, and certainly it alters the ability to learn. The mechanism of action is actually rather fascinating. Uh, because it acts on the reward circuit and pleasure center by, by increasing dopamine. And in this way, it's just like any other, um, any other drug. It's like narcotics, which also do that, the same addictive process where we like when we get more dopamine, it's a pleasurable sensation and we, we want more and more. Nicotine has certain benefits to be sure, but they're somewhat rare and not very well documented. It may help with Parkinson's disease, and it probably helps with certain um, conditions in which people have very high estrogens um, and certain kinds of um, ovarian and uterine 
uh, cancers, it may be a benefit in them, but really there's no other benefit uh, that's worthwhile with nicotine. As I'm sure you're aware, addiction is a major problem with nicotine and addiction defined as compulsive drug seeking despite negative consequences is a, um, it's a desired effect for people who are selling cigarettes. As you get in increased consumption of a drug, nicotine, you need an increased dose to get the same effect. You need to smoke more. Um, the persistent desire to smoke or use nicotine products, um, despite their, um, despite your efforts to quit, is another way you can define addiction. Um, so that's the basic thing you should know about nicotine, which is really the um, the aspect of it that keeps people going back and back and back and makes it so hard for smokers to quit. I respect someone like Senator Davis who was able to do so. The second thing, just very briefly, uh, is the healthcare costs of smoking. You're going to hear that uh, from proponents that we're going to lose a lot of tax money, excise tax money in Maine uh, due to smoking. And I think that you'll hear this several times, but roughly the figure is $120, $140 million of excise taxes from tobacco. That'll be a hole in our budget. On the other hand, the current, um, this actually, this is two years old, um, as mentioned before, the healthcare costs of um, smoking and nicotine are $800, $850 million. In other words, four or five times more. So when you hear economic arguments, so it's going to decrease excise tax, remember, we're paying four or five times more than that uh, for healthcare costs. Um, so in conclusion, uh, products that contain nicotine are addictive. Early exposure to nicotine can lead to smoking. Smoking kills. And with that, thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Gratwick. I don't see any questions. I do want to, uh, oh yes, Representative Jabner. Thank you very much, Senator Claxton. To hear from you, Senator Gratwick. Yes. I have a quick question for you. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Um, so you gave a great, um, lots of great information there concerning the effects of smoke. I just have a quick question about, um, I know this is not talking about marijuana in this bill at all, but I am curious if you could tell us if those effects from smoking marijuana is any different since our state has just legalized um, recreational uh, marijuana. Um, um, Representative Chavitin, thank you for your uh, questions. Um, there are two, uh, there, there are many, many aspects of smoking, of smoking cigarettes, tobacco, and I just, I just focused on the nicotine and the, its addictive process. Remember, though, when you smoke tobacco, nicotine doesn't, doesn't cause cancer, doesn't cause bronchitis, doesn't, is not implicated there. There, it's rather the tars and the tobacco um, that cause the lung disease and then can cause the change of cells, which are then the, um, which are the processes for cancer are accelerated by the nicotine. Marijuana is a very different thing. There, it's, it's the smoke uh, that is causing the problems with lungs. Um, and the marijuana, the um, uh, THC is, and all the, the 150 variants thereof um, have different effects than nicotine. So that's a whole other lecture, on, um, a mini lecture on pharmacology. So the, the smoking- Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. I see no other questions, Dr. Gratwick. So thank you for being here. Thank I you. just want- in the interest of fairness, I just wanted to point out that it's a longstanding tradition to recognize uh, speakers from the uh, legislature and to give them some extra time. And also former members of the legislature and members from the executive committee. We will be uh, going to a, a three minute clock at this point. And our first testimony in support uh, from participants outside the committee here is Niall Sokbasan. Would you unmute and join us, sir? 
Can everybody hear me okay? We can. Senator Claxon, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Niall Sockbeeson. I'm a proud member of the Penobscot Nation, and I reside on Indian Island, Maine. I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. I'm lucky enough to be able to work with our incredible tribal youth here on Indian Island. Though I am here on my personal time, my professional title is the Penobscot Youth Engagement Educator at Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. I believe that a healthier future starts with empowering youth and ending the sale of flavored tobacco products. I would like to share my story of how I became addicted to commercial tobacco through flavored products. I hope my story will serve as one of the many examples as to why flavored tobacco products are dangerous, especially to kids. Today, I'm 25 years old, but I was 14 years old when I first used smokeless tobacco or dip. It first became accessible and more desirable when the older, cooler, and more skilled players on my high school hockey team were using dip. One day, I asked one of my teammates if I could have a pinch of his flavorless can of dip. Like many people who first try smokeless tobacco, I proceeded to feel nauseous, throw up, and develop a headache. At the time, I did not have any desire to try this product again. A few months later, the same teammate offered me a pinch of grape flavored dip. So coming to the peer pressure and ignoring my past experience, I accepted his offer and enjoyed the flavored dip very much. So much that this pinch of grip, that this pinch of grape dip led to a near 10 year struggle with smokeless tobacco addiction. These flavored tobacco products appeared inviting and harmless to my 14 year old self. The taste was immensely more enjoyable than the flavorless dip I had previously tried. Today, I am nearly two years free of smokeless tobacco use. It took me years to quit and I was lucky enough to have the support and education from my mother, a dental hygienist. She noticed my mouth deteriorate over the years and helped me tremendously in the difficult process of quitting. I am one of the four out of five kids to become addicted to commercial tobacco through flavored products. My addiction was smokeless tobacco, but the same storyline is seen with, use, with youth using cigarettes and e-cigarettes, especially when these products are designed and flavored to be appealing and addictive to youth. Flavored tobacco products need to be inaccessible to kids and the sale of these products need to end. Please vote yes on LD 1550. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I will now answer any questions. Thank you for being here. Are there any questions, uh, Mr. Sockbison? I don't see any, sir. Thank you again for being here. Next, we'll go to uh, Deborah Hagler. Welcome, doctor. Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Dr. Deborah Hagler. I'm a pediatrician that's practiced in Brunswick for 24 years, and I'm the president of the main chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I live in Harpswell. For those of us who have known and loved someone who smoked and heard stories of their first time, or we've watched movies and seen a youngster take a drag off a cigarette for the first time, that dramatic cough and gag is real and it results from the harsh and unpleasant feeling caused by the alkaline nature of smoking nicotine. Add menthol and anesthetic and it creates a cooling sensation in the back of the throat, the feeling goes away. Menthol, the magical flavor that makes numb the back of the throat, makes it easier for the initiate to start smoking, become dependent on nicotine, and develop addiction. Half of all teens who smoke use a menthol product. When I ask a five-year-old or an eight-year-old what they want to be when they grow up, I usually hear things like astronaut, firefighter, teacher, or nurse. I never hear, I want to become addicted to nicotine, spend my every living moment thinking about when I will be able to have a smoke so I don't feel sick and I can keep functioning. It's not a route people choose. Most addiction has its roots in adolescence. Young brains are still growing and maturing. They're acquiring new skills and knowledge at a remarkable pace. They're wired to be impulsive, take risks, and anything rewarding feels really good. The centers of the brain that help with decision-making and judgment are developing during adolescence, and they are some of the last to mature in the late to mid-20s. 
Nicotine happens to fit very well into a receptor for a key chemical in the brain that is important for learning and mood regulation. The growing teen brain is undergoing remarkably rapid change, both structurally and functionally. New connections between cells are being established. New receptors are being deployed. These new receptors become used to the presence of nicotine and now how the brain is functioning, feeling, and learning comes to depend on the presence of that nicotine and the young brain is addicted. Exposure of the brain at critical developmental periods can have lasting impact on how a teen learns, how they regulate emotions, and it can even make them more susceptible to other addictions such as cocaine. So if you were in the business of selling a highly addictive product that causes a host of health problems and you needed new customers, you would go after teens with comfortable, tasty products. Four out of five teens who start using a tobacco product do so for the flavors. Kids start for flavors, they stay because of the nicotine. The tobacco companies know this. The American Academy of Pediatrics strongly urges you to ban tobacco flavored products. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm not seeing any questions. So we can go to Veronica Vicki Wegman. Hi there. I was timing myself because it makes me happy to make sure I'm sticking within the timeline. Thank you. Um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Veronica Wigman. I go by Vicki. Um, I've been the substance use prevention coordinator and counselor for the Lewiston Public Schools for the past 34 years. Um, I'm also a certified prevention specialist and a certified tobacco treatment specialist. Uh, I'm here to testify in favor of LD 1550 and act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. And I feel like I know what I'm talking about because I actually work with the young people who are using these things. Just wanted to add that. I know that's a little informal, but I wanted you to hear that. So I've worked with young people for my entire career, both helping them make their best health decisions and all too often helping them to identify and take steps to improve negative health decisions, including the use of tobacco in its many forms. I'm proud of what our state has accomplished. I'm not going to um, rehash statistics in the time that I have, but I personally am bearing witness to an incredible surge in use of products, uh, primarily through electronic means. Um, the widespread use of these electronic means caught many of us unaware and tragically gained a key foothold in the world of adolescent substance dependence. In addition to the covert nature of these products and the fact that they can be stylized in, in color and shape and whatnot, the lure of using is not only that so many peers are using them, but hands down the myriad flavors available to young people. Uh, I, it is not uncommon for me to hear from somebody, oh, I'm not vaping. I'm just using this liquid that's pineapple flavored, or I'm using cotton candy flavored. They always highlight the flavor and totally are unaware of the fact that there's nicotine or tobacco. As I looked through my own bin of collectibles here in the office that I use to educate adults and students alike, I see names like Maui Sun, Blue Raz, Candy King. I say without reservation and based on extensive experience in my office with real young people, not just numbers, they're real young people, that the flavors draw youth forward to these products and the nicotine keeps them coming back. As I prepared the testimony today, I had a couple of recurrent thoughts. One of them is, why are we still talking about this? We need to take action. And the other is, why in the world would they make these products flavored in um, clearly youth attracting um, categories, if not to lure them in to use and then become a dependent. As adults, we have a moral and ethical responsibility to protect and preserve the health of young people and ending sale of flavored tobacco products will go a long way towards this effort. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Craven, do you have a comment? Thank you. I just wanted to shout out a hi to Vicki and say thank you for your work. <laughs> nice to see you. Likewise. Representative Craven, 
Representative Craven's in charge of that for the community. She does that. She knows everybody. So uh, next we'll be joined by uh, Florence Edwards. Welcome, doctor. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Florence S. Edwards, DDS. Uh, I'm speaking in support of LD1550. I'm a dentist practicing in Auburn and Topsom, soon to be South Portland, and a board member of Equality Maine and coded by young women of color. I also live in Portland. Before I was a dentist, I was a child who often spent her time reading Jet magazine. Jet was the pop culture magazine geared toward descendants of American slavery, the majority of Black Americans. And every issue, there were full page ads of beautiful Black people smoking menthol cigarettes. The tobacco industry's long history of predatory marketing targeting Black Americans with menthol cigarettes is well documented and something I was very familiar with. Equally well documented are the devastating results. Over 80% of Black American adults who smoke use menthol cigarettes, and Black Americans, excuse me, die at higher rates than any other racial or ethnic group in the U.S. from tobacco-related diseases. Following this tried and true playbook, the tobacco industry has also preyed upon people who are lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, and queer. In California in the 1990s, the industry campaign to market to homosexuals and homeless individuals was called subculture urban marketing, abbreviated as SCUM, S-C-U-M. Uh, LGBTQ people smoke at higher rates than the rest of the population. And we're now seeing the effects play out. A recent CDC report on the unequal impact of COVID-19 confirmed that LGBTQ people were more likely to contract and suffer severe symptoms of COVID-19. That's because we're, we suffer disproportionately from asthma, COPD, strokes, heart disease, and hypertension, conditions often caused by tobacco use. And knowing that the younger generation overwhelmingly chooses flavors, the industry pushes everything from menthol to cotton candy to cream brulee flavored tobacco to dig the next generation. There are now over 15,000 flavored tobacco products on the market. We know that these flavors are not meant for adults. Before I wrap up, I want to mention that I wrote a, an op-ed about this topic that appeared in the Sun Journal this week. It was too long to include everything from it in my testimony, but I did attach it to the copy of my testimony and encourage you all to read it if you have time. In conclusion, Maine's youth deserve a healthy future free from tobacco and the chronic illnesses associated with its use. Banning flavored tobacco is an intersectional advocacy opportunity. I'm asking that you vote ought to pass on LD1550. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Edwards. Thank you for being here. I don't see any uh, questions. I know we've been joined by Representative Rebecca Millett, and we'll give her a chance to testify next. Thank you so much, Senator. I'm, who would have thought Friday mornings would be so busy? Okay, all right, get this up. Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and esteemed members of the Committee on Health and Human Services. I am Rebecca Millett, and I represent House District 30, which is most of Cape Elizabeth and I am honored to testify in support of LD 1550 and act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Since I first came before this committee with leg legislation to address the scourge of vaping and flavored tobacco, the news has not improved. One out of four of Maine's high school students now use e-cigarettes, double what it was just two years ago. Maine high school students aren't the only young people using e-cigarettes and vaping products, however. Middle school students and even some elementary students are as well. Young people are often unaware of the health dangers that can be caused by chemicals in e-cigarettes and vaping products. A recent study found that an astounding 63% of 15 to 24 year olds who use the product Juul didn't know that it contains nicotine even though one jewel pod is equivalent to smoking about a whole pack of cigarettes. 
nor did they know that nicotine delivered via e-cigarettes is more readily absorbed into their bloodstream. Nicotine is highly addictive and adolescents are especially susceptible because their developing prefrontal cortexes make them uniquely vulnerable to addiction, according to the president of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. Nicotine also can exacerbate underlying mental health conditions and lead to hyperactivity, depression, and anxiety. Many kids have no idea that the flavorings in these products, which often have insufficient labeling, can contain harmful substances, including lead, formaldehyde, acrolein, and di diacetyl, the chemical blamed for causing popcorn lung, according to a study last year by the Harvard School of Public Health. And the adults don't know either. Students have shared with me that parents are supplying their kids with e-cigarettes. Recently it's come to my attention that now it's often because the withdrawal from e-cigarettes are so terrible that their parents are left with no alternative. Flavored tobacco products use enticing flavors, colorful packaging and lower prices to hook a new generation of tobacco users. Sweet flavors like watermelon, cherry, chocolate, mint, and gummy bear appeal to kids and teens. And the flavorings mask the harsh taste of tobacco, which makes it easier for youth and adults to, well, youth to initiate and adults to use tobacco. The US Surgeon General has warned that flavored tobacco products help new users establish habits that can lead to long-term addiction. Most smokers begin their lifetime addiction before 18, and the majority begin with flavored products. Flavors like menthol in tobacco products make it harder for users to quit. The FDA also has had more than enough evidence to ban the sale of menthol cigarettes, and I think we're finally making some progress. As today's filing noted, youth and young adult smokers are much more likely to smoke menthol than non-menthol cigarettes as compared to adult, older adult smokers. A comprehensive FDA report on menthol cigarettes issued in 2013 concluded that menthol cigarettes lead to increased smoking initiation among youth and young adults, greater addiction, and decreased success in quitting smoking. Simply, flavors are about making the consumption of tobacco more pleasant encourage consumption, and provide the gateway for a lifetime habit, period. It's about profit, huge profit at the expense of our citizens, citizenry's health. There are some main businesses who are concerned about the loss of sales and points to laws that limit the age of purchasers, but we all know it's not working. I'm pretty sure they don't wanna be part of any effort to hook our kids on nicotine and would rather be a part of our community's efforts to reduce this public health threat. I hope you agree that these flavored products are a threat to our children's health, their health as adults, and to the overall public health of Maine. So please join me in supporting LD 1550. Thank you, Rebecca Mallette, representative. Any uh, questions? I don't see any. Thank you for being here and good luck with the rest of your morning. Well, next here from Mary Lou Warren. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Mary Lou Warren. I live in Winslow with my husband and two children, Carly, a senior in high school, and Jake, a student athlete in college. I am testifying today in support of LD 1550 to end the sale of all flavored tobacco products. I started advocating four years ago with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network when I realized my 17 year old son was vaping. I quickly learned how big tobacco companies targeted our youth with their relentless e-cigarette marketing campaigns. Jake is the quintessential story of the success of an industry that preyed on him. They duped him into believing these harmless products were just flavored water vapor. When Jake was in elementary school, he would tell me about how bad smoking was. I never thought he would use tobacco products and I believed we, the adults, did our job. Instead, we let our guard down. I was surprised to learn that the state had done little to educate Maine parents and children about the harm of these dangerous products. Meanwhile, vape shops popped up all over town, school bathrooms became known as vape rooms, 
and students had trouble getting through the day without a nicotine fix. Jake tried to assure me he had done his research and he had this under control. He could stop anytime. Jake went off to college to study business entrepreneurship and play D2 soccer, his dream. I made a surprise visit in the fall and found him in the cafeteria with a big group of friends. He had so much to tell me and I was excited to hear all about it. He was doing great. He said, I'm figuring this out, mom. After his winter break, when I realized his nicotine addiction was taking over, I sent him an email. He needed to know I was on his side. He was having headaches, coughing, breathing issues, along with trouble focusing and sleeping. His bank account was dwindling because of expensive purchases at Cumberland Farms. He needed to know I was on his side and I wanted to have an honest conversation when he was ready. When I visited him, to, when I visited him in the spring, I hardly recognized him without his big smile. He was agitated, depressed, and distracted. At breakfast, he didn't eat and felt sick. Both my husband and I made excuses. It's getting close to finals. His coach is working him too hard. His knee is bothering him. Then it hit us like a ton of bricks. He is vaping. It took an all hands on deck approach to support Jake in battling his addiction. My husband and I were in agreement. While we wanted to support him leaving the nest, we could not send him back to college in the fall knowing he would fall deeper. Our relationship was being tested and it wasn't easy to get Jake on board. I found little information readily available to help Jake quit. He needed more help than I could give him. It took, seconds, please. it took years for him to stop. Even today, when, I, when life gets stressful, I worry the addiction will win. Jake describes his addiction as a toxic artificial love. He will say he can still remember his favorite vape flavor, a Red Bull flavor called Energetic Bull. It's been three years and he can still taste it every time he thinks about it. I'm angry at this industry that profits off hooking kids when they should be held accountable for the problem they created. I hear he's an adult, he can make his own choices. What can you do? My response is I'm still his parent. I will do whatever it takes to protect him from danger. So here I am battling this giant big tobacco. The state has an important role in protecting public health and that includes the health of our youth. We must keep our promise to our kids and protect them from these dangerous addictive products. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Are there any questions? Appreciate your being here. Uh, not seeing any, we will go to uh, Ed Miller. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Health and Human Service Committee. My name is Ed Miller. I'm a resident of Hollowell and a retired public health professional with more than 40 years of experience and involvement in tobacco policy in Maine. I worked for 13 years at the Maine CDC as their lead tobacco pro program person, uh, followed by 20 years as the CEO of the American Lung Association in Maine, and 10 years as senior VP for public policy for the American Lung Association of the Northeast. I'm here today as chair of the Maine CDC's Tobacco Prevention and Control Advisory Council to speak in favor of LD 1550. The Advisory Council was established in statute in the late 1990s to provide advice to Maine CDC's tobacco prevention and control program and to ensure coordination with other public and private organizations. In addition, it's to report annually to the governor and the legislature with recommendations or proposed legislation to further the purpose of the program. While the council was dormant for a number of years, this administration reestablished it, and it's my pleasure to chair this group of experienced public health professionals. We recently provided you with a copy of our 2020 annual report. LD 1550 is consistent with two of our six public policy recommendations. The end, the, end the sale of flavored tobacco products in Maine and to create more equitable health outcomes by addressing communities disproportionately impacted by tobacco use and tobacco industry marketing. I also wanna share a little reality check when uh, you consider the opposition later on today. In my decades of experience in tobacco policy, I've heard countless doomsday predictions from the tobacco industry and their surrogates. When the legislature last raised the, eight, the tobacco tax over 15 years ago, they predicted mass smuggling and armed gangs would threaten law and order. Obviously that didn't happen, yet we hear it over and over again. Some of their more dire warnings were made about the very smoke-free laws we wouldn't consider overturning today. Their claims when these proposals were being debated seem ridiculous today, but here's just a few. If we ban indoor smoking, they claim the following would occur. There'd be an end to public participation in town meetings. Juries would be unable to deliberate. Workplace productivity would tumble. 
Grocery stores and malls would lose customers. Restaurants and bars would go out of business and tourists would find other places to vacation. This industry and its allies focused their creativity on addicting people to nicotine, then maintaining that addiction. Flavor is only one of their strategies. As the public became more concerned about the health effects of smoking, they invented light cigarettes to give smokers a false sense of security, even though the menthol in some light cigarettes made them even more dangerous. When youth smoking rates began to drop dramatically in the 1980s, they recreated Joe Camel as their cartoon mascot. As Maine and other states were banning smoking in bars and restaurants, they rolled out a product called Nico Water, a nicotine infused beverage so customers didn't even need to go outside to smoke. Fortunately, Maine banned this and lawmakers saw through their tactics. I urge you not to be fooled by their arguments and to pass LD 1550, a common sense and likely game changing response to the increasing epidemic of nicotine addiction among our youth. Thank you very much and thank you for your service. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miller. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any, so we can go to Lisa Sakabasin. Welcome. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. Good morning. My name is Lisa Sakabasin. I'm joining you from Green, Maine today. I am a citizen of the Passamaquoddy tribe at Medot McGook. I have years experiencing experience working on issues of health equity and justice. I am here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. The Wabanaki communities in Maine care deeply about the health and well-being of all people. We carry the responsibility to our Wabanaki youth as well as our future generations. For decades, Wabanaki people have been recipients of disproportional targeting from a variety of sectors, whether it be government, healthcare, education, or industry. Each sector displays their beliefs on the value of indigenous black and brown lives by either focusing on our communities too much or by simply making our communities invisible. Often our communities become customers of those behaviors that are known to be detrimental and the resources to address the detrimental impacts do not follow the people that are most impacted. Our society, our state should be troubled by the continued use of targeting adverti targeted advertising to attract young people and especially young people in marginalized communities to begin smoking at ages that are younger and younger each passing year. Commercial tobacco companies have developed an array of menthol, candy, and dessert flavored products in colorful, colorful packaging to attract new users and to addict them to tobacco. The commercial tobacco industry does not intend these flavors to, does not intend for these flavors to create new adult users. They are targeting children. They are targeting children who have already been marginalized by our society and systems. They are targeting indigenous children whose sacred medicines include the tobacco plant, and it is working. I will not provide exhaustive statistics today. It is well documented that the commercial that commercial tobacco steals lives of indigenous black and brown people disproportionately. You know that brain development is not complete until age 26, and young adults are more susceptible to addictive behaviors. In our Wabanaki communities, this fact seconds, is exacerbated by additional environmental factors like lowered life expectancy, generational trauma, poverty, increased risks of a disease, and lack of tribal sovereignty. This complex combination has created a crisis for the health of our children and future generations. Our children won't win against the commercial tobacco industry. Our Wabanaki people won't win against the com commercial tobacco industry. We need your help. We share this challenge to overcome together. This is not for our children to solve in the future or our future generations to solve. This is our problem. The future generations will have different challenges to contend with. Let's not leave them with ours. We need your help. Please join us in voting yes on 1550. She Woolly One, thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. 
Good to see you. Any questions, Representative Stover? Thank you, Senator. I would just like to say thank you to Lisa Sakabason, my friend and colleague, for all you're doing to improve Wabanaki health, and you're doing some amazing work. So thank you. You're welcome. I thank all of you for your support in that. Okay, let's hear now from Allison Prone Drag. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative Myers, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Allison Perrin Drag, and I am the Government Relations Director for the American Heart Association, representing Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. We are here supporting LD 1550. You're going to hear a lot from the opposition that Massachusetts made a mistake and that you should not make the same one. I'm going to speak to that as my expertise as being one of the leaders of that campaign. From the start in Massachusetts, we had strong bipartisan support, including leadership from Governor Baker. Everyone agreed that there'd be a revenue loss, that as a state, it was decided to put the health of our residents over profits from deadly products. The biggest beneficiaries of the law would be future generations who would not start smoking because they are bombarded with menthol ads and other flavored products in stores and are not driving to New Hampshire and Rhode Island to start smoking flavored products. The Massachusetts Department of Revenue said the loss from the flavoring elimination would be between 120 and $160 million, and we have landed in that range. The opposition had said that Massachusetts would lose well over 300 million. We have not. We have been tracking those numbers, and as of March, Massachusetts is down just over 111 million. It should be noted, though, that from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20, we had dropped by almost $30 million a year, simply because fewer smokers were buying fewer cigarettes prior to the flavor, flavor elimination passing. So while there is and will continue to be a loss of revenue, we were already trending downward. In New Hampshire through March, their tobacco tax revenue had increased just over 31 million, but their trend had actually been going up. From fiscal year 20 to 21, they had an increase of 13.7 million prior to the Massachusetts flavor elimination. In Rhode Island, their tobacco tax revenue had increased by 14 million, and in both states, we have seen those increases start to trend down, which is historically what has always happened. Those who live closer to the border have always bought their products in our neighboring states. It's always been cheaper and for some more convenient. But if you took the increased revenue from both states, you would see much of our loss shows that we've accomplished what we set out to do. Stop current smokers from smoking and have kids not start smoking these deadly products. Maine will also see the benefits of protecting the health of all residents and survive their loss of revenue. It should also be noted that Massachusetts, we have not seen stores go out of business. In fact, in the United States, cigarette sales have been steadily declining since 2005, while convenience stores have steadily grown. Ending the sale of menthol cigarettes and all other flavored tobacco products is necessary to prevent youth tobacco use and reduce health disparities. We recognize that the legislator is and will be under extraordinary pressure Jesus. from the tobacco industry and their allies to put profits above human life by limiting or curtailing elimination on flavored products. We are asking for you to stand up to them by saying no to selling of menthol cigarettes and all other flavored tobacco products, say no to the continued predatory marketing of flavored tobacco products, and say yes to the health and welfare of our kids who are most vulnerable and say yes to the protection for all residents of Maine. We look forward to working with you on this bill and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, we've been sitting for about an hour and a half. And so I'm proposing we take a bit of a break. Um, five minutes, 10 minutes. Everybody okay with five and go with that? Okay. Let's take a five minute break. We'll be back. Um, move around as you're interested and able.
So we can resume. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to take a break every once in a while. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, we'll be using a three minute clock. We'll be hearing from those who are advocating in support of the bill uh, for a while longer. Uh, somewhere along the line, we'll take a break about 12 for lunch and resume afternoon. So uh, let's start with hearing from uh, Alicia Melnick, if you want to unmute and join us. Alicia, are you there? There. I am so sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm sorry. We can. Okay, great. Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Alicia Melnix, and I am an attorney at Bernstein Schur, and I'm here on behalf of my client, Equality Maine. Equality Maine supports LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Health equity has been a core tenet of LGBTQ advocacy for decades, particularly since the advent of the HIV AIDS epidemic. We support policies that will make Maine's LGBTQ community healthier and better able to enjoy life without chronic conditions holding them back. And LD 1550 does just that. Two well-documented trends help us understand why this bill is needed for our community. First, we know that LGBTQ people suffer disproportionately from diseases caused by smoking, a direct result of the tobacco industry's marketing to our community. Second, we also know that young people overwhelmingly use flavored tobacco products ending and ending the sale of flavored tobacco products is a crucial step to ensure the next generation of LGBTQ Mainers do not suffer the long-term health impacts of tobacco use. The relatively high rate of tobacco use in our community is not random. Instead, it is the product of deliberate tobacco industry marketing. The tobacco industry has taken out ads in LGBTQ publications, sponsored pride events, marketed rainbow themed products, and even done product giveaways in the community. As a result of their tactics, LGBTQ Americans now smoke at a higher rate than the general population. This high rate of tobacco consumption has led to significant health disparities between LGBTQ Americans and the general population. Members of our community suffer at higher rates from a number of chronic and acute conditions, including asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, strokes, heart disease, and hypertension. In Maine, data from the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey shows that LGBTQ high school students use tobacco at much higher rates than their peers. If we are to prevent the next generation of LGBTQ youth from suffering from the long-term impacts of tobacco use, ending the sale of flavored tobacco products is crucial. The industry has pushed flavored tobacco products to young people in particular. Tobacco manufacturers are certainly aware that 95% of smokers begin the habit before they turn 21 and that eight in 10 kids who use tobacco products begin with flavored products that mask, ma uh, mask the harshness of the traditional tobacco smoke as you've heard this morning. This is a deliberate strategy to get kids hooked and turn them into lifelong customers. The tobacco industry must take us for fools if they expect us to believe that a product named Unicorn Tears is intended to be used by an adult smoker. Young people overwhelmingly use flavored tobacco instead of traditional back tobacco, a direct result of predatory industry marketing. Absent desserts, thank you. Absent these dessert and fruit flavored products, these young people may never have started the dangerous habit of smoking in the first place. We owe it to the next generation of Maine youth to take the necessary steps so they may live free and healthy lives. Please vote opt to pass on LD 1550. Thank you so much. Thank you to the sponsor and the co-sponsors and for all of your attention this morning. Thank you for your testimony. I'm not seeing any questions, so we can go to Alyssa Goodwin. Welcome. If you would unmute and join us. Hi there, can you hear me? We can. Sorry, let me get myself. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm at work and I just ran back from um, a checkup, so um, perfect timing. Well, I'm glad to he be here. Um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Dr. Alyssa Goodwin. I'm a pediatrician at Martins Point Healthcare and a parent in Brunswick. And I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. As a primary care pediatrician and school physician, I see firsthand 
the devastating effects of flavored nicotine in my practice every day. Like many parents and healthcare professionals, I learned about and came to understand the significance of flavored tobacco products well after the adolescent vaping epidemic was out of control in my community. I'm extremely concerned that tobacco use among Maine youth has skyrocketed as you've heard today. I talk to my adolescent patients about substance use honestly, um, and the trends are terrifying. In my practice and across the state, um, we see often that by seventh grade, which is 12 years old, the majority of my patients, they know someone who vapes, um, they may have tried it themselves, many of them see it in their home or in their school. My high school students um, speak of needing to avoid um, using the restroom because of the rampant uncontrolled vape use. Um, and so while in my practice, I've seen that combustible nicotine products use is almost unthinkable to the teens I see, they do not bat an eyelash when asked about vaping because in their world, it is everywhere. Tobacco companies, if you have heard this morning, have developed an array of menthol, candy, and dessert flavored products in colorful packaging. The sole purpose of these products is to attract new users and addict them to tobacco. With sleek covert packaging and fun, fun flavors like Pop-Tarts with a Z, the intent of the packaging is clear. Flavors are designed to hook kids and create a customer for life. As a pediatrician, I can tell you with authority that kids are uniquely susceptible to nicotine addiction because their brains are still developing until about age 26, as you heard Dr. Hagler talk about. Many teens that I see are vaping the equivalent of one pack per day of cigarettes or more every day. And this is because of the extremely high concentration of nicotines, nicotine in the pods that they use. Many of the patients who I see and try to treat vape um, throughout the day they're so addicted that they're using at home and at school and honestly often right underneath their parents or teachers radar or noses because of the packaging treating seconds please okay treating this kind of addiction is one of the most challenging things i do in my my practice these are kids who often need the highest dose of nicotine replacement to be successful and they're being triggered all day um, our kids won't win against the tobacco industry they're hooked before they have a chance to understand the risk our children deserve better and they deserve our protection. Please help me take a stand for Maine's children and Maine's future. It's time to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Please vote yes on LD 1550. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. Good to see you. Any, I don't see any questions. Uh, so now we'll go to Annie Coates. You would unmute and join us. Annie, are you there? Because we're not hearing or seeing you. Let's go to uh, Philip uh, Potenziano. And uh, we'll come back to uh, Ms. Coates. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon or good morning. Can you hear me? We can, go right Excellent. ahead. Thank you very much. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Dr. Phil Potenziano, Superintendent of Schools in Brunswick. And I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Today, you've heard uh, from a lot of testimony from other individuals, so I'll keep my testimony brief. I provide testimony first as a superintendent, as a parent, and as a resident of the great state of Maine. Maine's future depends on our healthy kids, and Brunswick School Department cares about all of our students and their overall wellness and good health are essential to the readiness for school, uh, for in school and their success. Maine depends on all of our children to be healthy. And I've seen firsthand the harmful effects that tobacco flavored products have impacted my students, our students. 
There's no denying that it happens in our hallways, in our schools, our classrooms, locker rooms, buses, and schoolyards. Students are using tobacco products, vaping products. I'm growing increasingly concerned that tobacco use among Maine youth has been skyrocketing to one to three students in Maine's, in one to three students using some form of tobacco product, including cigarettes, cigars, e-cigarettes, and chewing tobacco. Ponder that for a moment. One in three Maine children are going to be addicted because tobacco companies have developed, as you've heard, an array of menthol, candy, dessert flavored products to colorful, in colorful packages and tools and devices that they use to addict our students and thus cause them to be incapable of learning effectively in our school buildings. When I've spoken to students about tobacco addiction, they report that it tastes good. It makes me feel good. The fact is that flavors hook our students and students are uniquely susceptible to nicotine addiction because their brains are still developing. You all know this. I welcome any of you on this committee to come to visit my schools and come to speak to my administrators, my nurses, my counselors, my teachers and coaches. They'll all agree. <clears throat> They'll also have stories to tell about harmful effects of flavored tobacco product products and how it hooks their students, our students. If you take one thing away from me today, one small thing, it is that tobacco flavored products are by far impacting our most vulnerable students in Maine. Students who are <clears throat> students who our society has repeatedly marginalized and students I and us in Brunswick strive to ensure they have a fighting chance to succeed. Help me take away this one impediment to their student success. Please vote yes on LD 1550. I appreciate your time and thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Thanks for being here. Uh, we'll go, we'll try uh, Annie Coates again. Uh, if you can unmute and join us, that would be great. I'm not hearing or seeing you, Ms. Coates, so we'll. Uh, instead, go to Carol Kelly. Thank you so much, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Carol Kelly. I'm a public health consultant in Portland, and I am the uh, coordinator of the Flavors Hook Kids campaign. Um, I've worked on many important public health efforts over the years, uh, opioids, obesity, toxic chemicals, and tobacco. And I enjoy public health for many reasons, but not the least of which is something that uh, Senator Davis mentioned earlier, which is that it's just naturally a nonpartisan issue, that we all want our kids to be healthy, we want our parents to live long, healthy lives, and we want our community fabric to be strong, connected, and hopeful. Uh, so I, I won't repeat what so many others have already shared uh, and others will share after me uh, about the problem of youth tobacco use in Maine, the role of menthol, candy, and dessert flavors in luring and hooking kids, uh, and the role of tobacco in the broader disease of addiction. Rather, I will share the perspectives of two health professionals who couldn't be here today um, but have an important uh, voice here as well. The first is Lonnie Graham. Lonnie is a retired family practice physician and she's the former chief public health officer in Maine. Uh, this is Lonnie's, uh, a segment of Lonnie's uh, remarks or, or testimony, which you have in your folders. Uh, Lonnie says, I have been involved in tobacco prevention and control for at least 30 years, but over the years I have been consistently impressed by the creativity and determination of the tobacco industry to assure the continued use of its product. But in some ways, the introduction of flavored tobacco has been the most creative and deadly invention of them all. With flavored tobacco products, the industry is able to lure in the very best customers used and create a strong addiction before someone is even out of high school. Better yet, the industry is able to target low-income girls and boys with the drama of sophistication mm -hmm. and variety. For the health of Maine's next generation, the invention of flavored tobacco products has been a public health disaster. The other uh, testimony segment I would like to read is from Kathleen Dunbar. She's a dental hygienist in, uh, with Eastport Healthcare. She says, I'm very concerned about young people getting hooked on tobacco products because of the long-term detrimental oral health effects. The flavors not only target youth specifically, but also mask the harsh toxic properties 
flavors seem fun and appealing and menthol specifically is dangerous. Aside from being kind of minty, it cools and numbs your throat, which is why it's used in cough drops and sore throat sprays. In regard to oral cancer, smokers are 10 times more likely to develop oral cancer than non-smokers, specifically squamous cell carcinoma. It's responsible for about 40% of all, all oral cancers. One of the saddest stories I've heard in my professional career was from one of my colleagues. They said they received a late night phone call from either a friend or a parent. That person was panicking and distraught. They were going to have surgery the next day to remove oral cancer, which involved having their tongue cut out. They were never going to be able to speak again and they were having a hard time coping with that. So if we can do something to help prevent that, I think we most certainly should. I hope you'll consider uh, these stories. Uh, they're all across Maine. This has been an incredible um, project to work on for me personally and professionally. Um, and I certainly hope that you will support this important bill. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Any, I don't see any questions. Good to see you, Carol. And next we'll hear from uh, Corey Calderwood. <clears throat> um, hello, my uh, for Senator Claxon, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Corey Calderwood and I live in Brunswick and I am here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. I'm a public school teacher who has seen this problem on the front lines in our bathrooms and hallways of our schools. For many teens, the yummy taste and smell of these tobacco products means that they are not as bad as cigarettes or chewing tobacco. Many believe because there isn't a flame involved or harsh taste that makes them cough, that means that there isn't anything harmful or wrong with these products. This is especially true with the menthol flavored products because not only does this flavor taste good, but it has the effect to ease the harshness of the tobacco, which in turn makes it easy to ingest, which then in turn makes it easier for a habit to form because that's what the tobacco industry has done. It has hooked another customer on their line. As any parent, teacher, or person who regularly engages with children and teens know, their brains are not fully formed. And the part that is last to form is the protective part that helps adults make decisions about what is safe and what is harmful. The tobacco industry understands this fact too, which is why they market directly to young people and not adults, because our frontal lobes recognize this truth, untruth easier than our youth can. This is why it's vitally important to pass this legislation to continue to do our jobs as adults, parents, and teachers, which is to protect or educate and even legislate rules and laws that work to improve the lives of all Mainers. I primarily teach juniors and seniors, many of whom who had tried these products when they were younger in middle school and as freshmen and sophomores. And many speak to knowing better as they got older and felt ashamed at their younger selves for falling for the idea that because a tobacco product tastes good, it means it's not bad for you. So I testify asking for all the adults in the room to do our jobs, protect our kids from misleading and untruthful marketing and keep these harmful and unnecessary products away from Maine by ending the sale of flavored tobacco products before they are able to lure and hook another generation of young Maine consumers. It's time to end the sale of flavored tobacco. Please vote yes on LD 1550. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony and for your work with the kids. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Dan Warren. Good morning, Senator Dr. Claxton and Representative Meyer. Thank you for sponsoring the bill and members of the committee. I'm Dan Warren, Director of Communications and Government Affairs for the Maine Medical Association. I was born and raised in Representative Margaret Craven district for Representative Craven and the rest of the committee. Um, I'm here today to testify uh, in favor of LD 1550 on behalf of the Maine Medical Association. 
Um, just want to start a little personal. Uh, as I listen to all these discussions, I'm a former smoker. Um, I started by chewing tobacco when I was a sophomore at Lewiston High School. Um, my, all my friends chewed Copenhagen. Um, I tried it, thought it was disgusting, and uh, picked up Hawken. For those of you familiar with tobacco, why did I choose Hawken? Mint flavored. Loved it, and I could chew, and I could be with my friends as they chew. Then when I was an 18-year-old in the United States Coast Guard, I was bored on watch at midnight. A fellow Coast Guardsman who was in his 30s said, here, have a couple cigarettes as he went to bed and I took over the charge. I smoked Camel non-filters that night. And I said, ah, it's all right, something to do. Uh, then I went to Marlboro, Mar Marlboro Reds. And then when I was at a bar one night, someone gave me a Salem menthol cigarette. And right there, that was my cigarette. Why? Menthol. I loved it. Smoked for uh, I, I have been smoke free for 25 years, coincidentally, when I met my uh, medical school physician, now physician wife, and she said, what the heck are you doing? I'm not going to date you anymore if you use that crap. Um, but I'm telling you, it's been 25 years. And although I haven't been around cigarette smoke very often as a 53 year old father of three, I'm not so sure I would say no uh, if somebody offered me a menthol cigarette at an outside bonfire. I honestly would consider it 25 years later because I can still taste it right now, but I can't taste the other tobacco products. So you know what the bill does? Um, one of the things that I have in my testimony as a, as a father, they're all in high school now or soon to be in high school, but I thought of something. Uh, one of the ways we got my kids to take medicine was blueberry medicine. So if you think about it, flavors are so appealing to children. That's why we flavor medications. So they'll take it. In order for my dog to take his medicine, I put it in peanut butter because he loves peanut butter. Um, some data in my testimony, it's not new that smoking is lead the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. On average, smokers die 10 years earlier than non-smokers. Those of you on the committee and uh, in the hearing, think of all the loved ones that have died that you know in the last 10 years and think of what you would do to have them here for even one more day. Um, if smoking seconds, continues please. at the current rate among US youth, um, 5.6 million of today's Americans younger than 18 years of age will die prematurely. Uh, that's the entire uh, population of Maine, Vermont, and Connecticut um, that will die early. So um, we urge you to support the bill. And in my testimony, you'll see that uh, the American Medical Association joined an FDA lawsuit uh, in order to ban uh, menthol cigarettes nationally. But that's going to take years. The bureau bureaucratic process uh, in the federal government is crazy long, but you can take take action now to protect Mainers. Uh, the Maine Medical Association supports LD 1550. Thank you for your time and uh, hope you get outside and enjoy the weather today early, early as you can. Thank you, Mr. Morin. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so we'll go to Ann Wollison. Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Ann Wallace, and I'm Executive Director of Consumers for Affordable Health Care, and I'm here today to testify in support of LD 1550. Um, Consumers for Affordable Health Care is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based in Maine um, with the mission to improve access to affordable health care and health coverage for all people living in Maine. I'm here today wearing two hats one is the Executive Director of Consumers for Affordable Health Care and one is a parent of a 22 year old daughter who is truly wonderful, of course, but who is uh, um, addicted to vaping. As executive director of Consumers for Affordable Healthcare, I'm here to tell you that vaping has huge health consequences for people who become addicted and that those consequences lead to increased healthcare cost um, and health um, coverage costs that affect all of us. An analysis by the CDC found that in addition to the human misery smoking effects, it imposes a substantial burden on the nation's healthcare institutions, especially those funded uh, by public tax dollars. And I cite that in my testimony, which hopefully you have. Um, I could go on about the, ex the additional costs um, that vaping is, is uh, creating for our society, but I just really want to emphasize that as a parent, I'm here to confirm that flavors uh, make vaping attractive to youth. I remember finding menthol cartridges in my daughter's bedroom when she was a teenager and in, and in the vehicle that we shared, I was concerned and talked with her and healthcare professionals about it. Um, she is well aware of the dangers. She is hooked. 
She's trying to quit and finding it incredibly difficult. She's starting to become a therapist and most recently worked as a mental health uh, rehab counselor. Um, she knows it's unhealthy. She wants to quit, um, but it's hard. I've seen the vaping effects on her in many ways. Um, there have been times when she has gone without and her personality instantly changes from somebody who is pleasant, engaging, and charming to someone who becomes paranoid, nervous, accusatory, and very desperate. She has trouble concentrating and sleeping at night, and she struggles um, with intense anxiety often. Again, she wants to quit. She has tried uh, quitting. She's tried the patch. She's tried medicine. Most recently, she was, um, I have props, <laughs> uh, prescribed a uh, inhaler that has a monthly cost of $577. Um, this prescription has sat on my kitchen table for six weeks now because she doesn't want to use it until she is ready to quit because she knows of the, the expense that's involved. Um, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, I, I could go on, um, but I guess uh, my point is she, was, um, she became hooked when she was a teen. She used menthol um, when she started. She knows vaping is not good for her. The unfortunate fact of the matter is, however, that this is something that um, she will unnecessarily struggle with for some time to come, if not the rest of her life. So I please urge you to support LD 1550 in order to help and protect other main youth from becoming addicted. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Annie Coates. Welcome. Welcome, doctor. Thank you very much. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Joint Standing Committee of Health and Human Services. I am Dr. Annie Coates, and I am one of four pediatric pulmonologists in Maine. I'm here today to testify on behalf of Maine Health in support of LD1550. Although tobacco companies claim to be responding to adult tobacco users' demand for variety, flavored tobacco products play a key role in enticing new users, particularly children, to a lifetime of addiction, as you've heard throughout the morning. This growing market for flavored tobacco products is undermining the nation's overall progress in reducing youth tobacco use. While almost all e-cigarettes contain nicotine, more than half of main youth who use e-cigarettes say they think it's just harmful, harmless flavoring. You've heard the further devastating statistics about youth tobacco use, but these aren't just numbers. These are our children. And I'd like to share one truly heartbreaking story with you. Approximately three months ago, I was consulted on a previously healthy adolescent who was admitted to the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and respiratory failure. Over the past year, he endorsed smoking flavored e-cigarettes daily. His impression at the time was that he was inhaling just flavored water and that they won't get him addicted because those awful cigarettes, like the awful cigarettes, his parents just couldn't beat. What he didn't understand was the extent of the harmful effects of e-cigarettes and that they did likely have nicotine in them, which he had since become addicted to and directly contributed to his critical health condition. But the damage didn't just stop there for him. Like other children and individuals you've heard about, he had gone from being a good student to skipping school to smoke, which resulted in failing multiple classes Furthermore, he had developed a multitude of daily symptoms far beyond the respiratory tract that included headaches, difficulty concentrating, and abdominal pain, all that can be attributed to nicotine addiction. Before I close, I want to address a misconception that you will likely hear about later today. E-cigarettes are not an FDA-approved cessation method. For individuals looking for support to quit smoking, vaping, or other tobacco use, I encourage them to contact the main quit link at 1-800-QUIT-NOW for free support and coaching. This is evidence-based and effective. The phone coaching program, thank you, quit rate is 36% for tobacco users that complete at least four calls of the multi-call program compared to unassisted quit rates that are generally reported at approximately 3%. 
as a pediatric pulmonologist, as a mother, as a resident of Maine, who has dedicated my career to the health of our communities, please use your voice, please use your vote and support this critical legislation. The well-being of our youth, African-American community and minority populations depend on it. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you for your testimony, doctor. You're welcome. Looks like, looks like you can get back to work. <laughs> uh, we're joined by uh, Darlene Huntress. Good morning, uh, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Darlene Huntress. I live in Hollis, and I'm on the board of directors of Equality Maine, and I'm here today to testify on behalf of LD 1550. I'm a former smoker, um, and I'm really one of those LGBTQ kids that we keep hearing about as you talk through statistics. I had my first cigarette when I was 19, and I had my last cigarette uh, five years ago when I was 52 years old. In between those 30 plus years, I quit smoking so many times that I lost count. And so at some point I started saying, I've stopped smoking, but I'm not entirely sure if I've quit. Um, and even now, five years later, since my last cigarette, I still say that. Even though I feel healthier than I've ever felt, even though food tastes better in my mouth and my lungs are clearer, even though I know that every day without a cigarette adds precious time to my life, I still say that I'm not sure if I've quit. Um, I have a prop to, this is the last pack of cigarettes I ever smoked five years ago, and I keep it with me because I know that I'm only one cigarette away from not caring, caring about any of those things. Um, I know that because I'm addicted and I know that because nicotine is a very crafty drug. Um, and that's why I, I'm here today to justify if there's anything that I could do differently in my life, it would be to have never ever taken that first drag off that first cigarette. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the flavored tobacco. Um, I'm alarmed by it. I'm disgusted by it. I'm alarmed by it because, because those flavored tobaccos of Pop-Tart flavor and Banana Blast and cotton candy, they work um, because four out of five teenagers who have ever used tobacco started um, by using that flavored product. I'm disgusted because the tobacco industry is barely trying to hide the fact that they're cultivating a new younger generation of addicted lifelong smokers. Um, I'm not going to uh, give you all the details, all the statistics, you've heard them all before. I just wanna say, if there is anything, anything that we can all do proactively to protect young, younger generations from becoming addicted to this uh, life-threatening drug, we need to do it. And that is why I am asking all of you to support and, and uh, to vote ought to pass to LD 1550. Um, it's the least we can do for this younger generation of folks coming up. Thank you so much for your time. Um, that's all I've got, unless you have questions. Thank you for your testimony and your story. Uh, next, we can go to uh, Dee Carey, welcome. Hello. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and esteemed members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Dee Carey, a Portland resident and the Executive Director of the Maine Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm here to testify in support of LD 1550. I'd like to share that this bill is very important to me personally. I lost my grandmother to emphysema, and then I watched my father suffer from esophageal cancer, both caused by decades of tobacco use that started at a young age. I'll also be sharing excerpts from uh, testimony submitted by two providers who couldn't be here today. The main chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics has made it a priority to work on reducing youth tobacco use. Youth along with people of color and other marginalized populations are targeted by the tobacco industry with over 15,000 flavors, particularly menthol. Smoking and vaping are irresistibly appealing to young people. The use of electronic cigarettes in particular to deliver high concentrations of nicotine create dependence and addiction. Our pediatrician members are now being trained on the use of motivational interviewing techniques that help them have meaningful 
non-judgmental conversations with youth used around their nicotine use. They are learning about cessation tools for their patients, and they're working with other organizations in Maine to provide programs for youth and families on the dangers of smoking and vaping. Yet with all of this work, we still have an uphill battle on our hands due to the widespread use and high rate of addiction caused by these colorful, appealing flavored tobacco products. I hope you will really take the testimony you're hearing today to heart from the medical community, the CDC, schools, public health experts, young people and community members. This is a serious problem that's getting worse every day. Addiction is so pervasive in Maine. Dr. Perry Bassett, an emergency room physician from Calis shares, he recently had a patient in the ER with an elevated heart rate, extreme anxiety and agitation. After all tests came back normal, conversations with the youth revealed he was smoking one jewel pot a day, the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. He was able to get help, but not all youth are so lucky and some remain addicted. Karen Davis, a family practitioner from Holton, Maine shares, she's worked in primary care in the emergency room and has seen firsthand the seriousness of addiction. She has seen COPD, cancer, and other conditions related to tobacco use, but nothing like the stream of kids coming in now. 30 seconds, please. Related, sorry, lung conditions related to vaping. These professionals join me in asking you to please help this and future generations by banning flavored tobacco products. And thank you for, your, um, for letting me testify today. Thank you for bringing your testimony. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And um, now we can go on the phone to Effie Rourke. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Effie Rourke, and I'm here to testify in support of LD1550. Um, I'd like to share the stories of two high school students today who couldn't join us because they are in school. Uh, they're from Aristic County. Tia Saucier is a junior at Fort Kent Community High School. Tia says, a lot of people my age pass around e-cigarettes containing different pod flavors, saying, try this flavor, it tastes like cotton candy, etc. People my age buy them from people who illegally sell them to minors. If a group of friends and I would be out somewhere and they realized they left their e-cigarette, we would be forced to turn around and go get it or listen to the person complain the whole time that they needed their nicotine. They would even ask around at social gatherings to see if anyone else had an e-cigarette they could use because they needed their fix. They were craving nicotine. It was not all fun and games anymore. They always say, oh my God, stop being so stressed out, I'm fine, or this isn't doing anything to me, it's literally just flavored water. But as we all know, it's not just flavored water. Passing the bill to ban these products would be a huge step towards the effort to save the lives of countless people, including the main target of these products, teens. The second piece of testimony I'd like to share is from Hope Royal, who is a junior at Holton High School. Hope says, quote, Flavored tobacco products have impacted not only my friendships, but also my community in a negative way. Vaping has ruined many of my friendships. That is all anybody wants to do, and I simply don't want to be a part of it. I noticed my friends starting to change. They became less focused on their schoolwork and social lives and start to focus more on vapes and getting the money to buy them. Growing up in a small town, everyone has connections. It is not difficult to buy flavored tobacco products from someone of the legal age. Every bathroom in my school is filled with people gathered around sharing a vape. Banning flavored tobacco products would create a healthier, safer, and cleaner school environment and community for younger generations to come. Thank you for allowing me to share the stories of these two main teenagers. And thank you for taking the time to call in. That worked well, I hope, for you. It did for us. We heard you. Um, next, we can go to uh, Gino Ring. You would unmute and join us. Gino, are you there? We're not hearing you. Have you unmuted? Yes, thank can you. you hear me? We can now. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Gino Ring. Um, I'm a licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselor. I live in Brunswick 
and I contract with the uh, school system here. I'm in here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act in the sale of flavored tobacco products. Um, I've heard a lot of testimony this morning and I send a class with your encouragement. Um, instead of reading facts and statistics that have already been spoken about, I'm gonna change my testimony to be a little more personal. Um, I sit and listen to kids come into my office. Part of my job is to obviously do health classes and we try to you know, um, do a good ed job educating our kids around not starting. But I also deal with the kids who come in who have already started. And I wanna talk about the emotional impact that this substance has on these kids, the horrible self-esteem uh, that it's creating for them because they feel like it's their fault that they got addicted. They feel horrible that they're not strong enough to beat their um, addiction to this chemical. Um, they've stopped participating in extracurricular activities because they can't go that long without ripping the jewel. Um, and so, um, and, and over the, the years I've been doing this, I've, I've been doing this since the 1980s. Um, the, the descriptive term, it's only tobacco, it's only cigarettes is such a misleading descriptive adjective. It's just a horrible drug. And as so many people have testified this morning, it's intentional. This isn't, oh, we didn't mean to do this by the, the nicotine industry. This is intentional. So I'm, I'm thrilled that you folks are you know, gonna consider standing up on our watch to the tobacco industry, the nicotine industry, and say, we won't put up with this. Um, we fought this battle in the 90s when it was more focused on smoking tobacco, um, the legislation and increasing taxes, and et cetera. And I think it's gonna take the same strategies today for us to be able to um, protect our children um, from the industry that's willing to uh, sell them and seduce them into using addictive products. Um, like many of the other people that spoke this morning, um, I'm a recovering addict. Um, it's been 29 years since I had my last cigarette. But like uh, somebody said earlier, uh, I'm certain if I have a cigarette today, part of my body would say, oh, great, you're back. Um, once an addict, always an addict. So um, I want us to stand up and take care of our children. It's the least we can do. So thank you so much. I encourage you to vote in favor of passing uh, this LD1550. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. Uh, now we'll go to Gretchen Pianca. Welcome. Hi, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Gretchen Pianca, and I live in Brunswick and work in Lewiston. I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. As a pediatrician and mother of three, I'm all too aware of how dangerous flavored vaping products are for Maine's children. I want to tell you a story about one of my teenage patients with ADHD, anxiety, and depression. She was struggling with her mental health, her family, and her friends. She was exposed to violence at home and her parents were unable to help her due to their own mental health issues. She always felt stressed. Her older brother was her support person. She reported feeling nervous and worried all the time. We talked about counseling, but she didn't have transportation. I tried prescribing medications, but she would never remember to take them. And then her brother ran away when things got really bad at home. After he left, a friend suggested she try vaping, and she said it really helped her feel less anxious and more focused. She told me about it. She was so proud of herself. She'd found something that looked healthy. It was fruit flavored. When I asked about how much nicotine she was vaping, she said she didn't think what she had contained any nicotine. She promised me she would check. When I asked her how many times a day she was vaping, she replied, oh, all the time. And I said, isn't that expensive? And she said, well, she had a new boyfriend and he would buy them for her. She liked him, he was nice, and he wanted to help her feel better. A few months later, she came in for headaches, stomach aches, and said she couldn't sleep. And guess what? There was nicotine in those fruit flavored things. I talked about the dangers of vaping and nicotine and encouraged her to try to quit. She said there was no way she could survive without vaping. I use that thing a thousand times a day, she said. When she came back for her next appointment, she was having tr trouble feeling like she couldn't breathe and was lightheaded all the time. She always felt like her heart was racing. We talked about nicotine and how she was probably addicted at this point. She was terrified. She wanted to join the military and knew she would have to quit before that. The military had been what rescued her brother from living on the street. She said she felt like those strawberry banana devices had ruined her life. I saw her this last week. She's down to one jewel pot a day and trying to reclaim her life. And I have many patients like this. I've been astounded by how quickly my patients become addicted to nicotine, many without even knowing it's happening, since they think all they are vaping is some yummy fruit flavored water. 
I never thought I would miss how obvious smoking was or how long it took to smoke an old fashioned cigarette. Our teens are struggling and desperate for things that help them feel better, especially since half of the children in Maine with a mental health diagnosis are not receiving needed treatment. This leaves teens to try to figure out on their own how to feel better, and they often choose unhealthy coping strategies such as vaping. Maine teens are more likely to have vaped in the last 30 days than the national average. Those statistics about almost one out of every three teens having vaped in the last month includes my very own anxious 14-year-old daughter. 30 Maine seconds, please. Maine kids need your help. We are working to help them build healthy coping strategies, but this work takes time. As long as flavored tobacco products are so widely available and seemingly innocuous, this addiction will take over their lives, eroding their chance of health in the future before they even realize what has happened. Please vote yes on LD 1550. Thank you for this opportunity and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, doctor. I'm not seeing any questions. I appreciate your being here. Uh, next, we can go to uh, Heather Drake. Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Heather Drake. I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth and a public health professional. I have a Master of Public Health degree from the George Washington University, and I've worked for 12 years in public health, including in substance use and cancer prevention. I'm here today in support of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. A 2011 review conducted a comprehensive assessment of tobacco industry marketing of menthol products. Here's what they found. Menthol cigarettes were marketed as, and are perceived by consumers to be healthier than non-menthol cigarettes. The tobacco industry marketed menthol cigarettes to specific social and demographic groups, including African-Americans, young people, and women, and are perceived by consumers to signal social group belonging. The tobacco industry knew consumers perceived menthol as healthier than non-menthol cigarettes, and this was the intent behind their marketing. Marketing emphasizing menthol attracts consumers who may not otherwise progress to regular smoking, including young, inexperienced users and those who find regular cigarettes undesirable. These findings mirror a similar strategy to what is happening today with e-cigarettes, which are marketed as a harm reduction strategy to traditional cigarettes and are perceived to be safer and cleaner by youth. In fact, most youth don't view e-cigarettes as tobacco products. 76% believe they are less addictive. More than 85% of e-cigarette users ages 12 to 17 use flavored e-cigarettes and flavors are the leading reason for youth use. More than 90% of young adult e-cigarette users use ones flavored to taste like menthol, alcohol, fruit, chocolate, or other sweets. Women and girls are another important consumer for the tobacco industry with campaigns and slogans like reach for a lucky instead of a sweet. You've come a long way, baby. We make Virginia Slims, especially for women because they are biologically superior to men. The tobacco industry strive to entice women to smoke by using mainstream beauty and fashion standards to portray smoking as feminine and associated smoking with women's freedom, emancipation and empowerment. To see examples from the early to late 20th century, I've linked to the Truth Initiatives catalog of ads. These campaigns worked. Research has shown that in addition to a higher prevalence of menthol use among African-American men and women, female smokers of all races use mentholated cigarettes at a higher rate than male smokers. I have included at the end of my testimony some example ads that use menthol to target women. In my introduction, I was remiss to not add I'm also a new mother. Raising and protecting a child in today's society is no easy feat. Passage of this bill will take away the worry that he will be unfairly and wrongly targeted by tobacco, making my role as a parent a little bit easier. I believe passing this bill will prevent youth from starting to use tobacco and will prevent the industry from marketing another product as a helpful alternative to combustible cigarettes when that's actually not true. 30 Please seconds, please. 1550. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm not seeing any questions. We'll go to Jamie Comstock. If you'll unmute and join us, we'd like to hear from you. Hello. Hello, good morning, thank you. All right, um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Jamie Comstock. I'm the health promotion manager at the city of Bangor's public health and community services department. And I'm providing testimony in support of LD 1550. 
I have directed our department's tobacco prevention efforts since 2007, which is 14 years back in the Healthy Maine Partnership days. And since 2015, we've been providing tobacco prevention services throughout Penobscot and Piscataquis counties as part of Maine Prevention Services. We don't get a lot of big wins in this work. In every situation, the addiction industries, whether um, that's tobacco, alcohol, or marijuana, are set up to win because they have more money. And they use their money to advertise in many different ways with the singular goal of creating lifelong frequent users who will feed their money right back into the addiction machine. The tobacco industry especially has engaged in egregious practices, all of which you've heard today. Um, and their flavors are designed specifically to turn kids into lifelong users. Um, I challenge you for fun, the next time you go to a convenience store, just count the number of tobacco ads you see at that convenience store and also make note of how many are at child eye level. In 2009, Maine celebrated a 64% reduction in high school smoking rates. It was amazing and we were ecstatic, but all that started to change around 2013 when we saw the popularity of vaping increase. In the 2019 Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey, 28% of Maine high school students said they'd used an electronic vapor device in the last 30 days, which in the prevention field is an indicator of frequent use. At the health department, we speak often with parents, teachers, and administrators, and they all say that vaping is one of the biggest issues impacting schools today. Vaping transcends both income and social groups and has permeated every corner of school life. No one is immune. Vaping is an equal opportunity addiction. Parents tell us about their kids who have developed intense albatross-like nicotine addictions, addictions these kids developed because they were misled by an industry who promoted the vapor as harmless water va vapor. You've heard a lot of that. In yummy carnival-like flavors, these addictions aren't easy to beat, and instead of focusing on school activities and accomplishments, outings with friends, and looking forward to a future beyond high school, these kids are servants to their addictions, preoccupied with the who, what, where, and how of getting their next nicotine fix. It's shameful that the industry, um, that the tobacco industry has robbed them of their youth and will do anything it can to rob them of the rest of their lives too. 30 seconds, please. Whoops, sorry, that was loud. Um, we're working on the ground as hard as we can, but we're no match for the tobacco industry. We need you, the legislature, to do your part by providing a strong policy framework so we can remove these dangerous products from the shelves and continue to do our best work with youth and communities. We need you to stand up to the tobacco industry in what could be the biggest win for tobacco prevention in Maine. Um, thank you very much for your time and I'm available for any questions. Thank you for being here to testify. I'm not seeing any questions. So we'll go to Jennifer Jewell, welcome. Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer and members of the committee. I submit testimony in favor of LD 1550. I'm Jennifer Jewell, a Portland resident, a pediatrician, a member of the board of directors of the main chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a concerned citizen. We can all agree that tobacco inhalation is harmful to the user and to anyone else exposed to the output of products, including traditional cigarettes and electronic smoking devices. As the child of a smoker, I know the destruction that smoking has. My father began smoking menthol cigarettes at 11 years of age. He stopped when he experienced his first bout of laryngeal cancer in 1974. I was three years old at the time. When I traveled home to visit my parents in late December, 1996, my dad informed me at the luggage carousel that he had a cancer recurrence and that was the reason for his increasingly hoarse voice over the past few months. When he told me that his voice box was being removed less than two weeks later, I was glad the cancer recurrence was diagnosed promptly, surgery was not delayed, and that the prognosis was favorable. This was not the case five years later when his advanced pancreatic cancer had few treatment options. Both of these cancers were directly related to smoking and likely made worse because my dad was addicted to cigarettes before he was a teenager. The single reason tobacco companies add flavoring to their products is to entice individuals to begin smoking without the unpleasurable taste of the native product. The harshness and bitterness of tobacco is disguised with sweet and minty flavors, which are most appealing to children and adolescents. We know that the majority of adult smokers start before their 18th birthdays. 
at a time when one's brain is prone to poor decision making, miscalculation of risk, and underestimation of long term consequences. None of us should be fooled by the tobacco company's claims otherwise. These favorite flavored products are manufactured, advertised, and sold because companies know that the earlier and longer people use their products, the more profitable the companies become. I'm fortunate that my father was cancer-free for 22 years of my childhood and young adulthood, and that I do not recall his first battle with laryngeal cancer. However, my family was a victim to the effects of tobacco. My dad had three episodes of cancer, and despite stopping at the age of 34, he ultimately died from smoking cigarettes that began even before adolescence. Flavored tobacco products are meant to be to hook children like my dad, turn them into lifelong smokers and to benefit tobacco companies by creating addiction and physical dependence. Banning the sale and distribution of flavored tobacco products are sure to curb the initiation and persistence of tobacco use in children, adolescents and young adults. Please- 30 vote. seconds, please. Thank you. Please vote in favor of LD 1550. Thank you for that testimony, Doctor. Thank uh, you, next week, Paxton. Next, we can go to uh, Joanne Joy. If you'd unmute and join us, welcome. Hello, um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Joanne Joy. I live in Bodenham. And I'm a public health professional as well as an advocate for LGBTQ youth. I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550. And I also have some comments from two other people from Washington County who are not able to be here that I will add at the end. So why do I care about flavors? Because I want a fighting chance for all youth and in particular, the youth of my community, the LGBTQ plus youth and young adults to be all they can be. Tobacco is a social justice issue for me as much as it is a health issue. LGBT kids and adults have been targeted for many, many years. I've worked in prevention for over 25 years, first in HIV prevention, switching to tobacco in, 20, um, in 2001. I was naive to big tobacco's manipulation to hook vulnerable people and the higher smoking rates of LGBTQ folks. For over 20 years now, more people with HIV have died from tobacco related diseases than from HIV. I spent years asking for resources tailored to LGBT people to reduce tobacco use, mostly met with blank stares. Big Tobacco has targeted populations with, who experience minority stress, discrimination, stigma, and other systemic harms. We have the opportunity to address these disparities in this legislative session. Ending flavors is one clear step to reduce Big Tobacco's negative impact on our most vulnerable populations. I'm glad to say that in the last year, Maine CDC has launched an LGBT tobacco initiative with community partners. I'm partnering with OutMaine uh, in Rockland that does statewide work with LGBT kids to look at tobacco use and what they need specifically. And I've learned a lot more. About 20% of all Maine kids identify as LGBTQ, which is some of them are unsure. And at the moment, 7% of all kids smoke, but 13% of LGBTQ kids do, and some because of menthol. And all of the demographics are using vaping at about 30%. I've added in my written testimony more details about that data. It's shocking how badly impacted the LGBT kids are. And flavors make beginning to smoke or vape much easier. I want a quick story about a high school student that's a member of a GSTA, a Gay Straight Alliance. 30 seconds, his advisor, please. His advisor and teacher had been helping him work through discrimination, bullying, uh, family rejection, et cetera, and he was doing well, but then he got caught vaping. That was one thing he didn't have any control over once he was addicted. I want to add some comments from two other people, from Angela Focusato from Achayas, who is a cancer patient navigator. She had two patients that she's worked with that started with menthol, and one now has had his voice box removed and works with kids to try to help them quit. And when they ask what happened, he said he was addicted. And another woman 
said that as a teenager, she her friends wanted her to smoke and she couldn't do it. She didn't like the temp flavor. She started with menthol then. And then as she was dying, said the worst lies anybody can tell you is that tobacco doesn't kill you. From Penny Terrio from Princeton, she says she owns a family chi child care, has um, adopted a small child and is worried about her life because it is so prevalent in their community to see young people vaping. And she, all three of us ask you please to vote in favor of LD 1550, an act to end tobacco flavors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we'll go to uh, Justin Grio. Hello, can you guys hear me? We can. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. I am here today to testify in favor of LD 1550 an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. My name is Justin Grillo. I'm a student at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. I stand before you today as a research intern for tobacco-free kids and Main Street Solutions. Growing up, the only people I remember who used to smoke tobacco products were my grandparents. My grandfather always had a stylish pipe hanging from the side of his mouth. My other grandfather smoked an alarming amount of menthol cigarettes. The menthol cigarettes ended up killing my grandfather and my other grandfather who smokes the pipe is still alive at 95 years old. Interesting how one inhaled the menthol and the other never inhaled his pipe. Since working on this campaign, I've learned the truth about menthol cigarettes and how the menthol acts as a mask to make inhaling cigarettes deeper and easier on the lungs. Those menthol cigarettes tricked my grandfather and we have the opportunity here to prevent that from happening to kids. I was duped and started vaping in high school. Any allowance or summer employment funds went directly to Juul products. I remember the frenzy at school concerning where and how to get mango flavored Juul pods. I would take bathroom breaks during class to take smoke breaks, sitting on the toilet with my pants buckled up using uh, flavored e-cigarettes rather than using the bathroom and getting back to schoolwork. I played two varsity sports in high school, lacrosse and ice hockey, and wow, did that have an effect. I really thought I was invincible back then, but I was surprised to know that I felt the effects of tobacco products in my performance. The scary thing was not just that I was 17 years old partaking in flavored e-cigarettes. The scarier thing was that 14 year old freshmen were doing it as well. So when I left high school in June of 2017, I could not believe how many kids were smoking e-cigarettes. And of course they were not legally allowed to be involved. The only reason I stopped smoking Juul is because they discontinued flavored, uh, popular flavors. Over the past few weeks, I've reached out to over 65 businesses in Waterville, Auburn, Lewiston, and Kennebunkport. Almost every business was eager to hear more. During all those phone calls, not once did someone respond saying they do not agree. The sober experience of contacting businesses and store owners has only reassured me that this bill makes sense. People can get behind this. Here are a few quotations from businesses that support the end of flavored tobacco sales. Charles Buckley, owner of Kennebunk Outfitters in Kennebunk wrote, it's time to do better, a better job protecting our kids from menthol and flavored tobacco products. I support this bill. Sandy Heldman, who worked with local youth sports organizations in Auburn, Maine for over 40 years and owns g and sporting goods store in Auburn, passionately stated, I believe this bill, I believe in this bill to end the sale of flavored tobacco and menthol products will drastically improve the quality of life and health of future Maine kids. Teachers, 30 seconds, please. Thank you. Teachers from schools across Maine have been more than willing to support this this campaign's effort to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. I've reached out to over 300 teachers across the state of Maine. I have a few quotes from teachers that I would like to share. Justin Goudreau, a science teacher from Waterville High School highlighted, the addiction of e-cigarettes seems to have increased dramat uh, dramatically over the course of my teaching career. Flavored tobacco products were made plain and simple to hook our youth, so they continue to be addicts in adulthood. Chad M. Bell, principal at Winslow High School wrote, flavored tobacco encourages young students to try harmful tobacco, nicotine, menthol products. Once hooked, it can lead to a lifetime of addiction to these deadly products. Through this campaign, I have realized that the people of Maine genuinely believe that this is the right thing to do. With all the issues that we face today, why not take advantage of this low hanging fruit? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Mr. Grillo. Sorry, I messed up your last name. And uh, next we'll go to Caitlin Morris. 
Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and esteemed members of the Joint Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Caitlin Morse. I am the Policy Associate for the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services, and I'm here today to read written testimony from Mallory Shaughnessy, Executive Director of the Alliance. This is an important issue to Mallory personally, but it is also for our members. Mallory writes, good morning, Senator Claxton, our members, uh, Representative Meyer, and esteemed members of the Joint Committee. Our members and I support LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products for so many reasons. She continues, I became a smoker at 13 years old. Prior to smoking actual cigarettes, I loved the candy ones. Feeling so cool, blowing the powdered sugar out like real smoke. Cigarette addiction has been a challenge for me since I could buy it from the cigarette machines that were virtually everywhere. When I began smoking, it cost a quarter a pack and we didn't know what we do now. I wish at 13 that I had known that my teenage brain was more susceptible to addiction. As a young person, every time a new memory is created, connections are built between brain cells and they retain the memory. Addiction is a form of learning and my brain learned to like and want tobacco. By the time I was 14, I was smoking a pack a day. I have quit and restarted smoking numerous times, sometimes going a decade without it. It doesn't matter how much I want to never smoke again, Wanting a cigarette is something that comes back, especially during stressful times in my life. Those early built brain patterns persist. Most recently, Mallory shares, I started smoking again during COVID. And again, I have had to work to quit. I am a month and a day smoke-free today. Wish me luck. I wish I un had understood that cigarettes lead to disease. The use of tobacco products remains the nation's number one cause of preventable death. Smoking is a major risk factor for the four leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and stroke. Addiction itself is considered a chronic illness. I wish I had understood that the tobacco companies were preying on me when they marketed those, were, when they marketed those fun candy cigarettes. In Maine, nearly one in five adults smoke cigarettes, the highest rate in the Northeast. This year, tobacco companies will spend an estimated $40.8 million in Maine. Fun flavors are the new gambit to market to tweens and teens. Without a flame or nasty taste, kids are led to believe the products are not as bad as cigarettes. We hear of the shame students experience as they grow up and recognize they were duped. Unfortunately, by the time the problem is evident, they have become the one of four main high school students who use e-cigarettes. While flavors hide the bad taste of tobacco, one jewel pod is the equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes. Just as the general public has become smart to the public health crisis of smoking cigarettes, the cigarette companies keep trying to outsmart the public. It is foolhardy to knowingly leave laws in place with such serious public health consequences. And as such, the Addiction for Alliance and Mental Health Services encourage you to vote ought to pass for LD 1550 and join with states like Massachusetts that have already banned this hazardous substance. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, next, we'll go to Kaylee Hess. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Senator Claxon, Representative Meyer, and members of the Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Kaylee Hess, and I'm the Associate Director of the Partnership for Children's Oral Health. The partnership is a collaborative effort of individuals and organizations working to create a Maine where no child suffers from preventable dental disease, and I'm here today to speak in support of LD 1550. It might come as a surprise to some of you to hear us testify on this bill but it's well known in the oral health community that vaping can have serious consequences for children's oral health. There are some of more obvious consequences for, uh, to oral health from vaping, like injuries from batteries exploding, um, which have resulted in broken jaws, permanent tooth loss, soft tissue damage, and things like that. All of this can impact your ability to eat healthy food, which can then worsen chronic oral health conditions in addition to the damage caused by the initial traumatic incident. The less obvious consequences of vaping have to do with the chemicals in e-cigarettes though. So we all know that nicotine is bad and it restricts blood flow to the gums, which can affect the mouth's ability to fight off infection and heal, which can lead to poor oral health outcomes. However, even e-cigarettes without nicotine can have serious consequences for oral health because of how the chemicals in e-cigarettes affect the mouth's microbiome. So propylene glycol, which is the carrier product in e-cigarettes, breaks down orally into chemicals that are all toxic to tooth enamel and the soft tissues of the mouth. And the flavoring, just the flavoring in e-cigarettes breaks down in the way that causes the enamel of the teeth to be weakened. And it causes an increase in the microbes that adhere to the tooth enamel and an increase in biofilm in the mouth, which can 
lead to a lot of bad, bad things. What all of this means is that vaping creates basically a perfect storm in your mouth for the bacteria that cause cavities to thrive and it can cause irreparable damage to teeth and gums through several mechanisms. What this means for children is that they are being targeted with flavoring that can likely hook them on tobacco and nicotine for life, as we've heard from people here today, and it can cause poor oral health outcomes for their entire life. It's important to recognize that the effects of vaping are further reaching than many of us realize <laughs> when considered with the fact that about 30% of children who are consistently covered by commercial dental insurance and 40% of children who are consistently covered by main care do not receive preventive dental care in any given year this issue becomes critical to helping children maintain what oral health they have. Dental issues are one of the top reasons why children miss school, so it's also important to pass this bill to help children succeed in the classroom. We all know that we can't expect children to be able to understand these risks and act accordingly. Yet, as we've heard, sadly, sadly heard from many people here today, these flavorings are being targeted to youth and they encourage youth <coughs> use of e-cigarettes we must act to prevent the myriad harms that youth are subject to through flavored e-cigarette products. And I thank you for your consideration of this testimony. Thank you for providing your testimony. And now we'll go to uh, Cammie Dexter. Sorry about that. Um, Good morning, Senator Cox and Ripsey Meyer and honor members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Sammy Dexter. I live in um, Oakland. Um, I'm a speech clinician at a middle school and a high school. Um, and I've also been active in um, committees for prevention um, for um, tobacco, drugs, and alcohol. Um, I am here to uh, vote in favor, ask you to vote in favor of um, LD1515, the act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Um, I have seen um, use increase among um, adolescents um, and students that I work with, and it usually starts out as, um, usually starts out as, um, an experimental thing. And then um, they get to the point where the flavors hook them and, and then they can't, they can't get off. Um, I also am a mother of three boys and one of them struggles um, with vaping. Um, and he started when he was in, in high school. Um, and again, he is, the flavors really hooked him. Um, on the, the vape pens. Um, that is really, I, that's why I care deeply about this. Um, you, that's really all I have to say. I don't know if there's any questions, but. <laughs> Thank you uh, for being, going to the trouble of testifying from a fairly busy place. Appreciate Sorry it. about the noise, yes. It's an important function. So thank you for being here. Thank you. We've had cats, parakeets, uh, dogs, uh, kids join us before, so this is not unusual. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Next, we'll go to Kathy Wilson. Welcome. Hi there. Thank you. Um, and I applaud all of you for working on this committee. Um, I am almost 76 years old and a former smoker, and I'm also a member of the LBGT Q um, community. I quit smoking about 40 years ago, a little over 40 years ago, being a two to three pack a day smoker. I couldn't even go through the night without a cigarette. And I woke up every night at about 2 a.m. to have a fix to get through the night. I started when I was about 13. Menthol was a big drawer at the beginning, but I soon switched to Lucky Strikes and then to Marlboro's because they had a filter and I thought it would help prolong my life and possibly even save me. But as I stated, it got worse. On a trip to the Museum of Science in Boston one year, I noticed a display case on the way in. It contained two lungs, one from a smoker and one from a non-smoker. It was then that I realized what, I was, what was happening to me and what I was doing to myself. And I decided I did not want to actively participate in my own death uh, and decided to quit. However, it took a year to two years before I had what it took to do so. And it was the hardest 
hardest thing I've ever done in my close to 76 years. But I kept the picture of that two lungs, those two lungs in my mind and kept thinking about how I was helping my death progress by smoking. Plus I couldn't go anywhere without a lighter and at least two packs of cigarette. It was a pain in the, in the butt to have to get ready to go anywhere to make sure I had all that stuff. I also have three very close friends that I grew up with and I've known for years that were not able to quit. And I am the medical POA for two of them. Some years back, I had another friend on oxygen who tripped over the oxygen line and fell and actually died from the injuries from that fall uh, a couple of months later. Uh, she never did quit smoking. She tripped when she was dragging her oxygen outside to smoke a cigarette so she wouldn't blow up the house. <clears throat> Now I have a grandniece that got hooked on flavored vaping. She didn't do cigarettes because she knew that myself and her grandmother had quit and that cigarettes were bad for you. So, but she figured like many have said that it's the uh, flavored water, it was okay. Um, then a couple of years later, she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. She will graduate from college tomorrow. And I've talked to her about quitting and she always has an excuse. And now she says that she's gonna die early from diabetes. So it's gonna be even harder to give up her addiction, which is going to promote her earlier death, I'm sure. She would have never exactly. picked up a cigarette uh, ex except for the flavor. She didn't know that it contained nicotine and now cannot quit. She has a brother that is now toying with the vaping. And I don't think he vapes as much, but they also, they just don't think that it's bad. Um, as you know, none of them are gonna listen to an old grump like me try to tell them what to do. It's plain to see, it pains me to see and hear about so many kids starting this because it tastes good. It's wrong to allow this stuff to be sold. I know other states like New Jersey and I now hear Massachusetts have banned flavored vapes and that it most certainly is a logical and proactive and smart thing to do for the state of Maine, its citizens and its children. I am one of the lucky ones. Um, I was a member, uh, part of a study a few years ago at CMMMC of former smokers, and it turns out had CAT scans and all that stuff. My lungs have healed quite a bit, they tell me. However, I do think that all those years of smoking will shorten my life, and I'm not really ready to go. So um, I think it's time, it's time for us to do the best we can to protect the kids and the citizens of the state of Maine. So I vote and I'm in favor of this. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Uh, now we can hear from Lance Bushy. Welcome. Good, um, still morning. Good morning, Chairs Claxton and Representative Meyer and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Lance Bushy and I'm the Senior Division Director for State Public Policy with the American Lung Association. The Lung Association supports measures to end the sale of menthol and all other flavored tobacco products in states and local communities. And indeed the measure before you, LD 1550, is a comprehensive proposal that was swift enactment and implementation stands to be one of the most important public health measures in recent memory. This is also personal to me as a father of a middle schooler and a son who watched my dad suffer with COPD after smoking for decades and ultimately passed of COVID just four months ago. For the Lung Association, this is about three things. First, helping main kids achieve their full potential. Second, preventing lung disease. And third, creating more resilience to COVID-19 and future respiratory diseases and pandemics. The need is clear that nationally in, and in Maine since the late 90s, we have been making tremendous progress in reducing cigarette smoke into all-time lows. However, this positive news has been tempered by a dramatic increase in youth e-cigarette use and a tobacco use rate that hasn't really changed in a decade. Unfortunately, with this stalled progress, Maine's youth tobacco rate remains higher than the national average, with one in three Maine high school youth using some form of tobacco products, and the cost to our state, both in health and financial impact, is substantial. 2,400 Mainers die annually due to tobacco use, and tobacco costs Maine more than $1.7 billion, including $261 million to the state Medicaid program. There has never been such attention to lung health in our lifetime as the past 14 months. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused nearly 600,000 deaths nationwide, disrupted the lives of everyone in the country, and caused us to investigate how to minimize future respiratory pandemics. The U.S. Surgeon General has conclusively linked smoking to suppression of the immune system, and smoking can cause more severe COVID-19 symptoms, according to the CDC. 
With the threat of COVID-19, in addition to the numerous tobacco-caused diseases, it is imperative to prevent youth from starting to use tobacco and to help everyone quit. And we know flavors are the main reason kids use tobacco products. Indeed, the data shows that kids follow the flavors. Higher levels of menthol e-cigarette use were observed with high school students and middle school students when products were removed from the market. We need a comprehensive approach to address flavored tobacco products. We should not pick winners and losers of public health protections based on the method of nicotine addiction. We must treat all products the same. The 30 seconds, to, please. Thank you. The damage to lung health does not discriminate based on which product is used or smoke inhaled into the lungs. We need to act now. For more than a decade, the Lung Association has urged the US Food and Drug Administration to remove menthol and flavored tobacco products from the marketplace. We applaud the recent announcement by the Biden administration to end the sale of menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars, but Maine kids cannot afford to wait for federal action. We encourage your swift and unanimous approval of LD 1550. With your support, we have the opportunity to make sure that our current middle and high school age kids have the opportunity to be the first tobacco free generation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I think we'll uh, plan to hear from the two folks uh, who have joined us already and then uh, take a break for lunch. It looks like there's about an hour's worth of testimony and support still to come. And then we will hear from the folks who are opposed to this legislation after that uh, with a break uh, sometime mid afternoon. So let's go now to uh, Laura Bogorad. Um, hi, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Laura Bograd. I live in Waterville, Maine, and I'm a student at Colby College here to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Over the last month, I've been working as an intern research aide for tobacco-free kids, and I've learned so much. I wanted to volunteer for this campaign because I've seen firsthand that teenagers get addicted to nicotine from flavored e-cigarettes. When I started high school, nobody smoked, and then suddenly everyone started smoking jewels. First it was at parties, then during school hours. Between every class, the bathroom was crowded with e-cigarette smoking classmates. Every once in a while, the administration would find a jewel and start an investigation, but it was fruitless because everybody smoked. When people offered me to use their jewels, they would always say, it's strawberry, want to try. Nobody ever acknowledged that we were smoking nicotine, only which new flavors they had gotten. I don't think any of us would have smoked unless there were flavors. Since volunteering on this project, I've reached out to over 50 businesses, coaches, and community members. Not once have I had someone said no. Sure, some people don't feel comfortable speaking out, but speaking with coaches especially has helped me see that e-cigarette usage remains an issue in Maine community across teens. They see this problem with student athletes across the board, not in just one school or friend group, but across the state. And they want to see Maine make a change. Um, so I just want to quickly highlight the remarks submitted by Mayor of Bangor, Dan Tremble, who is unable to be here today, and also the owner of Fairmont Market. Um, he says, we opened our doors in 1925 and have been serving the neighborhood around Fairmont and Fifth Street Parks ever since. We get all walks of life coming through the doors, and we try to have something special for everyone, including tobacco products. We don't sell flavored baking products. We do sell some menthol flavored tobacco. And of course, if we end the sale of flavored tobacco, including menthol, I might lose some revenue, but not enough to make it worthwhile to endanger our kids. Our market is part of the community. We try to give back as much as we can. One of the things we do for the neighborhood is sponsor a local Little League team. It would break my heart if I saw one of them vaping or smoking cigarettes. There's no way I would want to sponsor a Little League team and then turn around the next day and put those same kids at risk for tobacco addiction. So I've learned more about tobacco products, including menthol. I can stand here today and say, get these things off the market. Um, Flavored tobacco products are clearly targeted to getting our kids hooked at tobacco. The flavors are brown sugar, graham cracker, hot cocoa, nectarine, and chill orange creamsicle and zombie. These aren't adult flavors. Um, let me just say again that ending the sale of menthol cigarettes is just as important as getting rid of flavored vaping products. For too long, these cigarettes have been marketed to people of color and resulted in a lifetime of addiction. Um, we are the adults here. We have the power to protect our children from something we know with absolute certainty will adversely impact their futures. When you get ready to cast your vote on LD 1550, remember that menthol cigarettes and um, mint flavored to chew tobacco and banana cream pie vaping products are cynical strategy to addict our children to tobacco. Um, it's time to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Please support LD 1550 and put our children's development and future success first. And then 
back to me. Um, several of my friends got nicotine tattoos together my senior year and were trying to quit, but they couldn't make it the school day without a smoke break. And it was really upsetting to see my friends who weren't willing to smoke normal cigarettes, have addictions to vaping products because it was just as serious a detriment to their learning and to their day-to-day -day life. And it's just really upsetting to see 18 year olds like struggle with an addiction. So I think laws like these would positively impact teens um, in immeasurable ways. So that's it. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next we'll go to Laura Harper. Representative Meyer, Senator Claxton and members of the Health and Human Services Committee my name is Laura Harper, and I'm a senior associate at Moose Ridge Associates. I'm testifying before you today on behalf of my client, the Behavioral Health Community Collaborative, or BHCC. The Behavioral Health Community Collaborative is a coalition of eight nonprofit community behavioral health organizations, all governed by volunteer boards of directors. The collaborative includes Kids Peace, the Opportunity Alliance, Oxford Mental Health, Shalom House, Spurwink, Sweetser, Volunteers of America in Northern New England, and Gateway Services. We are a professional association devoted to improving the lives of the clients we serve, those with behavioral health needs, and building a strong community-based mental health system in Maine. We urge you to support LD 1550. The history between the tobacco industry and those living with mental illness is similar to that of other communities you've heard from today. You've learned about Project SCUM, targeting the LGBTQ and homeless communities. You've heard the history of menthol and mint flavored tobacco used to target people of color. You've been presented with mounting evidence of big tobacco's focus on enticing our kids to try tobacco products with flavored baits like Pop-Tart, Sour Apple, and even Unicorn Puke. This is an unscrupulous industry that has no qualms with focusing on our country's most vulnerable populations to addict and eventually kill people with tobacco. When we look at the tobacco industry documents from the 1980s and 90s, we find the industry targeted psychiatric hospitals with sales promotions and giveaways of value brand cigarettes. When it comes to enacting smoke-free policies in hospitals and medical facilities, the tobacco industry has fought these restrictions, specifically at psychiatric institutions. Furthermore, the industry has paid for a significant body of research in its attempts to assert that smoking is both less harmful to those with schizophrenia and that it is a necessary self-medication tool. Does this sound familiar? This is an argument similar to what we've heard regarding the impact of tobacco regulation on low-income populations. That the tobacco use is a necessary coping mechanism with the stressors of being poor this assertion is insulting to those with mental illness and people with low incomes. Our health or wealth status does not mean we are less or more deserving of a life free from addiction. We mentioned Project Scum earlier. <laughs> RJ Reynolds urban marketing plan in the 1990s specifically focused on targeting value brands to street people. The industry's targeting of the homeless population who are disproportionately burdened by mental illness has been even more agrar agrarious, including donations of cigarettes and blankets branded with tobacco logos to homeless shelters. This despicable targeting has paid off. The nicotine dependency rate for individuals with behavioral health disorders is two to three times higher than the general population. And in addition to having higher smoking rates, adults with mental illness also tend to be heavier smokers. May needs to take action now to address the high rates of tobacco addiction for people in our communities with mental illness. By prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco products, including mint and menthol, we can have a profound impact on tobacco initi initiation and reduce use. So we urge you to please vote ought to pass on this important legislation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for being here and bringing your testimony. So unless anybody has an objection and understanding that we have a little over like 40 minutes of uh, supportive testimony to go and then the opposition testimony, um, I'd recommend we take a break, make it until 1235. So we have a half hour and we'll, we'll be back here at 1235 uh, for completion of today's hearing. Thank you all for being here.
So it's 1236. I think we can get started again. I hope everybody had a nice leisurely lunch uh, in the sunshine, maybe. Um, a couple things to remind people about. We are on a three minute clock and you'll get a two and a, uh, a warning at two and a half minutes. I had to uh, get in touch with a couple folks today to ask them to keep their background neutral and a couple other people about not using props. So I just mentioned uh, that for this afternoon's work. <clears throat> we'll go through those, uh, the list of those who are registered by 830. And then we'll ask if there are additional people who'd like to speak because we'll make sure that we want to make sure that everybody who wants to has a chance to uh, be heard. So I think we'll start now and go until 2, 2.15ish uh, for another break and uh, <clears throat> conclude after that. So we will we'll resume hearing for people who are testifying in support of this bill beginning with Laura Morris, welcome. Welcome, thank you so much. Um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Laura Morris and I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. I come to you as a granddaughter of a grandfather who lost his lung very early on when I was young, a COPD sales rep who would see hundreds of people in their homes holding onto oxygen in one hand and a butt in the other because this horrific product is so hard to stop using. Um, the mother of a 27 year old who is now struggling with vaping of THC, which I'd like to touch on later on for a second. And a prevention specialist who's been in the field for 25 years and it doesn't even matter the data that you hear today, I have seen it firsthand hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of youth and um, school districts who have been negatively affected in communities by these horrific products. I would have come with 130 youth to the Capitol last spring to educate due to COVID, I couldn't, but kids are scared and they are confused and they want their voices heard. We know that 3,000 people or more died from these products, more than homicides, suicides, shootings, overdoses, drunken driving combined. It's more addictive than heroin. These people don't know how to get off of it. And today's vaping is yesterday's tobacco. We used to be ads with doctors talking about smoking on these ads. And if you're pregnant, so you would have a low birth rate baby, that's what we're doing with vaping today. And we should not be duped. We knew it before, we know now, we should not be duped again. Um, youth are the ones who are losing most of all, because if they get them before the age of 21, we know they have 50% more of a chance of having lifelong customer. So what's happening in the trenches that we see day in and day out? Out, we see seventh graders who can get on their computer and access buying jewels by just hitting yes, they're 21 and having it sent to their home. Access is everywhere. There's 
absolutely no reason why 21 stops them. Um, we see kids starting as early as fifth grade. We do tobacco programs in third and fourth graders and these third and fourth graders know all of the ads that they see on the street with the cartoon characters vaping in the woods and they all think it's fun and innocent and it's just so uh, mis misleading. Um, we work with social workers who are scared because these kids come to them and they don't know how to stop. There are no cessation pro programs, very few for youth and that is a real problem as well. Once they start, they don't know how to get off. Um, they are full of anxiety and depression. It's just totally exacerbated and we have behavioral health problems coming out of, uh, out of our ears. Um, okay, thank you. Um, we don't, we are bombarded by a multi-billion dollar industry and we feel like the who's down in Whosville. We need your help. We need the power of what we can do today with this particular bill. It gives us an opportunity to protect our children, save lives. We can't do it alone, we're too small, but this is, where, this is a time where we actually can make a difference. And I'm appealing to you not as legislators, but as human citizens that care about the health and future of our youth. It is real and you have the power to change it. So I urge you desperately to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Not seeing any questions, we'll go to Maria Donahue. If you will unmute and join us. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Maria Donahue. I live in Southwest Harbor and I have been in public health for 20 years. I'm here today in support of LD 1550 and act to end the sale of flavored tobacco. 20 years ago, Maine was heralded as a leader in the nation's tobacco control efforts. We were one of the few states to put our tobacco settlement dollars toward public health programs with an emphasis on tobacco prevention. The number of high school students who smoked cigarettes dropped from 39% in 1997 to 9% in 2019. In 1999, Maine was one of the first states to pass legislation making restaurants smoke-free and in 2003, Maine became the fifth state to adopt and extend a comprehensive smoke-free workplace law to bars. Unfortunately, many of the gains we made in tobacco prevention and control have been undermined by the introduction of vaping devices as alternatives to combustible tobacco. As cigarette smoking became increasingly banned, legally and socially, the tobacco industry developed new products to get around indoor smoke-free laws. Cigarette smoking has declined, but in 2019, nearly one in three high school students in Maine reported using some form of tobacco, including cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, cigars, and e-cigarettes. We're hearing from students and adults alike that the number is much higher. Everyone is vaping. They say, cigarettes are gross, but vaping is cool. With thousands of fruit, candy, and dessert flavors of tobacco products, many young people don't understand that e-cigarette aerosol isn't just water vapor. We even hear parents buying vapes for their children because they think they are a harmless candy flavored novelty. In fact, nearly all vaping products contain nicotine. One of my colleagues offers vaping workshops to youth in Washington County. Students have shared that they watch TikTok and see colorful ads with fun flavors like unicorn milk and bubble gum that grab their attention. Their parents and teachers are afraid for their futures. Kids compete to see how fast they can consume the juice in one pod, the equivalent of one pack of cigarettes. They can consume one pack in seconds. With regular cigarettes, that is not humanly possible. Flavors aren't harmless. Flavors hook kids. The tobacco industry is trying to hook a new generation of users. Nicotine changes brain cell activity in adolescence. Youth and young adults are much more susceptible to nicotine addiction, which can also increase the risk for addiction to other substances. Let's help keep Maine on the map as a leader in tobacco prevention and control. Let's give our young people their best chance to lead healthy, productive lives free from tobacco addiction. I ask this not only as a public health professional working to keep all Maine kids healthy, but also as the mom of 12 and 15 year old boys that I hope never get started or hooked on flavored tobacco. Please vote to end the sale of flavored tobacco products, including mint and menthol in Maine. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we'll go to Melissa Stacy. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Melissa Stacy, and I'm the grassroots manager for ACS Can in Maine and Massachusetts. I'm reading testimony on behalf of Jake Warren, a 21 year old from Winslow, in support of LD 1550 about his lived experience. 
Cigarettes have completely taken over the schools and cigarettes from junior high through college. When I was in high school, the bathrooms were filled with kids between classes using their e-cig product. Young adults and teens don't see the connection between e-products, cigarettes, and how nicotine addiction can take over. E-cig products like Juul have just as much nicotine in a pod as a pack of cigarettes. These small juice cartridges that contain nicotine, flavoring, and chemicals are much more easily consumed than cigarettes and much more quickly <clears throat> than common for a pod to last a full day. If you ask anyone why they use it, it's because it tastes good. My favorite vape flavor was a Red Bull flavor called Energetic Bull. It's been three years and I can still taste it every time I think about it. After a few weeks of using these devices, it becomes part of your life. Without even realizing it, you are addicted. It's such the norm, it's like having a cell phone. I always had an e-cig product throughout high school. A local vape shop would host a game night, which would be filled with high schoolers and young adults trying the new flavors. We are the consumer for this product and it was geared towards us. I would go there all the time with no issue and e-cigarettes were at our fingertips. Once I got into college where I was playing for an intense D2 soccer program, I bought my first Jewel. All around campus, you can find used cartridges scattered on the ground like cigarette butts and students ripping while walking to class. I didn't think it would become a problem for me. I was a driven college athlete and while I knew my parents were very concerned about my e-cigarette use, I dismissed their concern. I had done my research and even told my parents that. By the middle of the fall season, I was buying a total of eight pods per week and it had completely taken over my life. I was spending much more than my weekly budget allowed. I started to rely on my jewel for my daily tasks and I couldn't go without it because it would affect my mood and attitude too much for me to be productive. I was anxious, irritable, very angry, feeling unhealthy and coughing. My parents scheduled a doctor's appointment for me and I was not on board. During this visit, I quickly learned this isn't something you can do on your own. That first step made me wanna win this battle. I transferred schools and focused on getting healthy. Two years later, I'm still working on it and realize it's a part of who I am now. The dangers and addiction to nicotine are just now being recognized by my age group and I am seeing firsthand how my friends don't even try to stop. It helps to share my story, but I wish I'd never picked up an e-product. I'm watching adults pointing the finger at each other. Parents and teachers aren't doing their job. Consequences aren't strict enough, but I think lawmakers let their guard down to tobacco companies. We knew cigarettes were bad for you, tasted awful and smelled terrible. I would never have smoked a cigarette. I didn't view e-cigarettes as a tobacco product and I was wrong. Ending the sale of flavored tobacco products is a big step in preventing kids from starting and will encourage users to quit. You have a chance to do something right now to take one step in the right direction. Believe me, this cannot wait. This is addiction. We need to stop this problem before it gets worse or a whole generation will be paying the price. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, uh, Melissa. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Norma Dreyfus. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Dr. Norma Dreyfus, and I'm a retired pediatrician in Aralsic, and I'm here to testify in favor of LD 1550. It is a fact that smoking kills and harms both the smoker and those around him or her. And we know so much more now about the health effects of tobacco than we did when I sat in the back of an amphitheater in medical school with smoke wafting up from the smokers in the front rows. For instance, we now know that tobacco smoking during pregnancy accounts for 17% of sudden infant deaths, and there is increased risk of stillbirth, potential associated complications, and preterm birth. The effect of tobacco smoke on the development of asthma begins in utero with untoward fetal lung changes. Not only is smoking involved in the development of asthma, but asthma's prevalence and severity is increased in a smoke environment. The risk of middle ear disease, childhood overweight, learning and neurobehavioral problems, and preclinical atherosclerosis is also increased by second and third hand smoke exposure. Most adults who smoke started their smoking in adolescence, the majority having started nicotine before age 18. Over the last 20 years with really hard work, adolescent smoking was declining. That headway is now being reversed in the teen population because of the introduction of flavored tobacco products. The availability of flavors was among the most predominantly cited reasons for youth e-cig and cigar use. Many teens falsely believe that e-cigs with flavor are less harmful than tobacco flavors. 
And there's increasing data that adolescents and young adults who do use e-cigs are at a higher risk to transition to the use of traditional cigarettes. The executive function and neurocognitive processes of the brain are not fully developed in early adolescence. The psychoactive ingredient in e-cigs is nicotine, which has a neurotoxic effect on the developing brain. The amount of nicotine in the electronic systems varies widely, and there's often discrepancy with the quantity on the label. Some amounts are equal, or, are equal to or in much excess of what is in a conventional cigarette. Nicotine is addicting and adolescents are physiologically more vulnerable. The earlier the age of nicotine containing products, the stronger the addiction and the more difficult it becomes to quit. This puts adolescents at risk of the marketing schemes of the tobacco industry. As stated by Nancy Brown, former CEO of the American Heart Association, quote, the tobacco industry is relentless in its pursuit to recruit the next generation of addicted users at an early age, exploring new technology and appealing flavors to seal their deadly deal. In 2016, 30 seconds, please. In 2016, the Surgeon General reported that electronic cigarettes are unsafe for children and adolescents. There are toxicants and carcinogens found in the delivery so solutions of electronic systems. Please vote in favor of LD 1550. Flavored tobacco products attract kids. Prohibiting their use will halt the progression to tobacco use, as well as the adverse effects of the electronic systems that sell themselves. Thank you, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Dreyfus. I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So we'll go next to Rebecca Bullis. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Becca Bullis. I am a resident of South Portland and executive director of Maine Public Health Association. MPHA is here in support of LD 1550 and act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. MPHA is the state's oldest, largest, and most diverse association for public health professionals. We represent more than 500 individual members and 30 organizations across the state. Our mission is to improve and sustain the health and well being of all people in Maine through health promotion, disease prevention, and the advancement of health equity. By far, to date, the most robust and comprehensive review of e cigarettes uh, was, was published in May 2020 in CHEST. Uh, and in my, my testimony, there's a link to that report, and I encourage you to take a look at it. I think it's worth reading. I want to make three points today that build from that review as well as the work of others in, in the tobacco research field. The first is that data are insufficient to support the use of e-cigarettes as a harm reduction strategy. While e-cigarettes are marketed as a harm reduction tool for tobacco, um, for, for tobacco smokers wishing to quit, systematic reviews suggest a lack of clear efficacy. In fact, research shows that smokers do not quit with e-cigarettes, but rather switch to e-cigarettes. Moreover, in addition to, to nicotine, e-cigarettes contain several harmful ingredients, including ultrafine particles that can be hailed deep into the lungs. And there's evidence to suggest that these particles lead to cardiovascular injury with links to negative effects on our resting heart rate, blood pressure, and the cells that line our, our blood vessels. Bystanders can also breathe in this aerosol, which also damages their health. E-cigarettes also contain flavoring chemicals that are linked to serious lung disease, VOCs, and, and heavy metals such as nickel, tin, and lead. In other words, the harm from use is not reduced, it's just different. The second point I want to make is that it's common for adults to use both e-cigarettes and combustibles, which is also known as dual use. Among adults, 55% of current e-cigarette users also smoke cigarettes, and as you've heard earlier, youth who start using e-cigarettes are two times more likely to start smoking combustible cigarettes within two years. The third point I wanna make is that data suggests that tobacco use may be a gateway drug. Data suggests that there are relationships between cigarette and alcohol use, as well as risk for the use of illicit drugs, including marijuana, heroin, and cocaine. In a recent national survey, more than 90% of adult cocaine users smoked cigarettes before they began using cocaine. And in a landmark 2011 study, researchers identified a proposed biological mechanism to explain the association, and that's that nicotine reprograms the expression pattern of specific genes that are associated with addiction, which ultimately alters the behavioral response to cocaine. The bottom line is that e-cigarettes are not risk-free, even if you've never smoked cigarettes. Safer does not mean safe, and if you smoke cigarettes and want to quit, FDA-approved nicotine re replacement therapy is the best, healthiest, and most cost-effective option. Main strong laws provide 
comprehensive and affordable, and in most cases, no cost coverage for treatment. Preventing tobacco use is good public health, economic, and social policy. LD 1550 promotes, promotes public health, and we respectfully request that the committee oh. votes 1550 ought to pass. Thank you very much for your time and, and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. I see we can go to uh, Sonia Connolly. Hello. Hello. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Sonia Connolly, and I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco. In 2020, I began working in the public health arena for the first time. Most of that work is primary prevention with the focus on obesity, resiliency, and tobacco. In this role, I've been working in partnership with Flavors Hook Kids to end the sale of flavored tobacco. In my personal life, I've always known that tobacco was harmful. My grandfather smoked menthol cigarettes for 20 years and both my parents smoked. My parents' addiction to nicotine as teens always ma um, also made it easier for them to use other substances. My grandfather ultimately died of lung cancer and both of my parents died due to their addictions. So I do understand the harmful impact, but what I really didn't understand was how targeted flavored tobacco is to our children. The tobacco industry knows that if they can addict their consumers young, they might just have them for life. It's hard to imagine any legislation that would have more of an impact on our children of today and the generations to come. Over these months, I've met many people who are passionate about this topic and they just couldn't join us today. I'd like to share some of their stories. Sue Sell from Machias. I quit smoking 28 years ago. I started when I was 17. I quickly switched to menthol, which was a game changer for me. I could smoke more and it seemed so soothing. It took smoking to a whole new level. Later in life, the chronic coughing started. I would cough all night long and I couldn't sleep. I knew it was because of the tobacco and I had to stop. I now have grandkids and I don't want that life for them. Let's get rid of to uh, flavored tobacco, which includes menthol. And then another story is Sarah McConnell of Lubeck. Flavors hooked me. Growing up, my parents and grandparents all smoked. During middle school, I decided to give it a try. I took a liking to my dad's menthols. I continued to smoke for over 16 years. It wasn't until my dad, at the age of 49, died of lung cancer and after many attempts that I finally quit. 30 seconds, please. Thank you. Uh, my brother still smokes and I really worry about my niece and nephew. Flavors hook main kids. Let's put an end to flavored tobacco. Thank you for allowing me to share my own story and a few from my surrounding communities. And at this time, I can answer any questions that you might have. I'm on. Thank you for your uh, testimony. Um, now we'll go to uh, Stacy uh, Frizzle Edgerton. Hello, I am Stacy Frizzle Edgerton. Um, good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. Um, I am both a parent to three teenage daughters in high school and the executive director of People Plus and the Brunswick Area Teen Center Program in Brunswick, where I have worked for the last 10 years. I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Uh, at People Plus, if you're not familiar with what we do here at People Plus and the Teen Center Program, we are the area senior center program and teen center program. We're here to basically make happiness, health, wellness, exercise, meals, et cetera, for our uh, bookend societies. So we have our seniors and our teens. Um, this bill impacts both of them. Certainly we have a lot of older adults who smoke still. They were addicted as young people. Um, they prefer their menthol cigarettes primarily. Um, we've kind of talked about it as a group. We've had a non-smoking group in the past, but really our teenagers, we've seen an enormous increase over the last 10 years in the use of tobacco in the teen center. And it's not cigarettes, it's vaping. They are vaping like crazy. Um, 
the, it, there's no question, absolutely, that the menthol, the candy, and the fruit flavors are the primary reason the kids are trying these products. They do um, fun little games like guess the flavor, and they'll take a hit on a vape and blow the smoke into like several other kids' um, faces to see if they can guess the flavor. And then if they get it right, they get a hit off the vape. Uh, and that was a game we caught some kids playing outside, um, in front of the center, um, not that long ago. Uh, another uh, example of, of the use that's just gone through the roof. We had a young girl in seventh grade, uh, come into the teen center and someone told, um, Jordan, our teen center coordinator that she had, um, a vape pen in her backpack. And instead of having her backpack, searched, she threw the entire thing out the window of the second story building and then fled the scene just so she could keep her vape private. She was banned from the teen center for a month. It was the place that she ate dinner five days a week, four days a week. It was the place that she had internet access, um, that she hung out with her friends and she gave up a month's worth of access, uh, to all of these things simply so she could keep her vape. We also know that there's a number of kids, thank you, a number of these kids are spending their lunch money, they're making choices to spend their lunch money on vape products instead of on lunches, uh, especially now that school is giving out a bag lunch every day. They feel it's a score for them because now they can just spend their lunch money on vape products. So, I mean, there's, I could go on and on with stories from the teen center and the ridiculous use of these flavored products. Um, I've talked to my own children and they've all said, the only way they would ever vape is with the, um, the flavored products. They market it as non-addictive and non-tobacco, that they're just fun, light flavored waters, and they're really healthy for you. They're good for your body. And uh, it's just, so it's, yeah, it's really a nightmare. And these kids are buying it hook, line, and sinker. So I appreciate any of you that can possibly help us persuade others to vote yes on, 15, five, on, on 1550. Thank you for your time. I'd be glad to answer any questions about the Teen Center program or anything we could do to further address this issue. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, not seeing any questions. Uh, we can hear from uh, Teresa Kelly Gillis. Welcome. Hi. Um, good. I guess it's afternoon now. <laughs> good afternoon, um, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Teresa Kelly Gillis. I live in Brunswick, and I am here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of all flavored tobacco products in Maine. I am proud to say I am the campaign organizer for the Flavors Hook Kids main campaign. I am also a mom of two and a Brunswick school board member. I am here to read testimony from a teacher and a student who are unable to be present today. From Lynn Diagostino, as a physical educator for over 30 years, I have seen the impact of advertising, targeting elementary school students. Students share their stories of siblings trying tobacco because of the cotton candy and other flavored tobaccos. I explain to them, because something tastes good does not mean it is good for you. Do you remember the cigarette ads on TV? Now we have social media, constant advertising pressure of, of, for our kids. Flavored tobacco products are like those TV ads we fought so hard to get rid of. It is time to stop flavored tobacco sales. Please, Maine's future depends on healthy kids, teens, and adults. This one's from Morgan Washburn, a Brunswick 10th grade student. I started vaping in eighth grade. It became more severe when I got to high school. I got pneumonia due to my compromised immune system from vaping. Vaping caused deep tissue scars inside my lungs from the harmful metals in all vapes and e-cigarettes. I, I was told using flavors were better for you than smoking. I was told it was fun. I was told I would have more friends if I did vape but that was all a lie. 
I made better friends with my hospital bed and my inhaler than I did with any people. Once I tried unflavored tobacco, it was the worst thing I've ever tasted. The tobacco industry makes fun flavors that reel you in. By targeting my generation with flavors, the tobacco industry is creating its next group of nicotine addicted customers. 30 seconds, please. I am not willing to sacrifice my health or anyone's to the tobacco industry. By voting yes on LD1550, you'll prove you aren't willing to sacrifice my generation either. Um, I just wanted to say, um, due to it being Teacher Appreciation Week, um, I wanna say thank you to all the teachers in the state of Maine that every day rise to meet unprecedented challenges, guiding students through uncertain times, inspiring them with a passion for learning and setting them on a path to a bright future. So I hope you join me and thanking them and help them by preventing youth tobacco use and addiction. Thank you and I appreciate your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, before we hear any other testimonies, I wanna give Senator Baldacci a chance to introduce himself. Good afternoon, I'm Joe Baldacci. I represent State Senate District 9, which is the city of Bangor and the town of Herman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, we'll hear from Kevin O'Flaherty. Welcome, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, other members of the committee. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty, and I'm the Northeast Regional Advocacy Director for the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I know it's been a long day, uh, but we are in strong support of LD 1550. You're going to hear a lot of talk today from opponents about the ideas of adult choice and freedom. And when you do, I hope you'll look them in the eyes and ask them, in all honesty, what freedom an addicted person really has, or what choice a person is making when 70% of tobacco users want to quit but can't, and how they can even call it an adult choice if 90% of all tobacco users became addicted as teenagers or even younger. Make no mistake about it, flavors hook kids. If you look at documents from the tobacco industry, we know that these products were actually conceived and designed to attract and addict kids. Sadly, the data you've seen shows how successful they've been at accomplishing this goal. I know that you've already heard that four out of five youth who have ever used tobacco started with a flavored product, but I'll bet you have no idea how many adults start with flavored tobacco. And why do you think that is? It's because it's irrelevant. Less than 5% of all tobacco users actually start as adults. 95% start when they're younger than 21, and 90% start when they're teens or younger, and flavors are why. When you have a product that is this successful in attracting and addicting kids, just restricting access to it won't work. A product that is designed for kids and marketed to them is going to find its way to kids. Even if every single retailer is following youth access laws to the letter, and we know that doesn't always happen, if these products are available, they will do what they were designed to do, and that's addict children. The research also proves that there are two factors more than any others which determine whether kids will ever get hooked on tobacco. Those factors are price and the availability of flavors. If tobacco is cheap and flavors are available, kids are much more likely to get addicted. If prices are high and there are no flavors, they don't. That's why you can't just enforce the age of sale more effectively or restrict these products to particular retailers or say some flavors are or particular products are bad while others are okay. That is what the opponents will tell you you should do. And the reason they'll suggest that is because it will be ineffective. Lastly, the argument that we should keep these products on the market just because some adults may prefer them is incredibly immoral seconds, if the cost for doing so is to sacrifice even more kids to a lifetime of addiction. While some adults may use e-cigarettes to quit, you do not need flavors to do so. And there is zero evidence that e-cigarettes are helping decrease smoking rates on a population level. So if you wanna end this cycle of addiction and prevent Maine kids from ever getting hooked on tobacco, nicotine, and a world of other substances and behaviors that will likely follow, then please pass this law without delay. Thank you for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions about my testimony or this policy in general. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you for being here, Mr. Flaherty. Uh, next, we'll hear from Hillary Schneider. 
Good morning, Senator Claxton, Representative, or good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Hillary Schneider, Director of Government Relations for Maine for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of LD 1550. Maine law currently prohibits the sale of flavored cigars. However, the way the law is written allows for some exemptions and has created some enforcement challenges. This bill builds on existing law, accounting for lessons learned from Maine's law, as well as laws and ordinances across the nation. While here representing ACS CAN, like others, this is personal. I'm a mom of two Maine boys, a high school freshman and a fifth grader. I'm the daughter of a woman who started smoking in her early teens, a nurse who struggled with tobacco addiction throughout my childhood and lost her two-time battle with cancer when I was 12. While I lost my mom more than 30 years ago, the loss impacts my life every day. A few weeks ago, my 10-year-old son told me that when his friends talk about spending time with their grandmother, he almost cries as he never had the opportunity to meet his. Tobacco use is a leading preventable risk factor of cancer. Cancer impacts nearly everyone, but it does not impact everyone equally. One of the reasons is tobacco use. Smoking is responsible for an estimated 30% of Maine cancer deaths, more than 1,000 deaths in 2017. Maine has the sixth highest rate of tobacco-related cancer cases in the nation and the 11th highest rate of tobacco-related cancer deaths, not metrics where we wanna be a national leader. To reduce the impact of cancer, we must prevent all Maine kids from ever using tobacco products and support those who use tobacco to quit their addiction. I started hearing my son talk about e-cigarettes at 12 years old when in seventh grade. My son has generalized anxiety disorder and asthma and was becoming increasingly anxious about peers using e-cigarettes regularly that could not quit. He was worried that other kids would start using when they wanted to fit in with popular athletes who were using. He was increasingly anxious about using the school bathroom because he said, even if kids were not vaping, he could smell the sweet aerosol lingering in the air and was worried it would trigger his asthma. When my son's anxiety is heightened, it impacts his ability to learn. His mind cycles with anxious thoughts and he has trouble focusing on anything else. I share this story to demonstrate the widespread impact of e-cigarette use in schools, not only on kids who are addicted, but the entire school community. My younger son in fifth grade is worried about going to junior high next year, nervous about kids vaping after hearing about it from his brother. To be clear, this is not just about e-cigarettes. Kids who use e-cigarettes are more likely to go on to use combustible cigarettes. And I have witnessed this with my eldest son's peers. More than one in 15 Maine high school students smoke combustible cigarettes with a high of one in eight in Washington County. One seconds, in 13 please. male high school students, including more than one in 10 male seniors smoke cigars. Flavors are a key driver of youth tobacco use. Regularly, I hear about Maine's struggles with recruiting and retaining a skilled youth workforce, youth flight, and businesses' high health care costs. Smoking costs Maine $811 million per year in direct health care costs, including $260 million in state Medicaid costs. When opponents talk about costs from reduced tobacco sales, please also consider the savings that are not accounted for in this bill's fiscal note. The savings from reduced tobacco use related to Maine lives, our kids' future, productivity, and healthcare savings for Maine's taxpayers, individuals, families, and businesses. The question before you is, are you going to support reducing the toll of tobacco and can cancer, or are you going to support an industry whose profits rely on continuing to dick to new generations of tobacco users? ACS CAN urges you to support LD 1550. By passing this bill, we can reduce the use of tobacco products, reduce the death and disease associated with their use, and make progress towards achieving health equity. Thank you for this opportunity to provide this testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions. So uh, now we'll go to uh, Jaden Love. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator Clayton and Representative Mayer and the honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on the Health and Human Services. My name is Jaden Love. I live on Indian Island in the Penobscot Nation, and I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco. I am Penobscot tribal citizen. I am also a member of the Penobscot Nation Youth Council, and I attend the University of Maine. Our traditional tobacco has been used by Penobscots and indigenous people since time immemorial as a medicine with cultural and spiritual importance. But the traditional tobacco has been tainted with by the tobacco industry. Chemicals poured in tobacco to make, more, to make it more addicting and flavorful. When I entered high school, vape products hit the market. It seemed like high schoolers from every school had one in their hands. The bathrooms were called vape rooms or jewel rooms, 
more flavors hit the market like mint, cucumber, mango, and many more, which made it more appealing to youth. Big tobacco companies target youth with flavors, appealing advertisements, fancy packaging, and smoke shops are made more to look like candy stores from the outside. People of color are targeted the most when it comes to commercial tobacco products. Native Americans are more likely to smoke cigarettes or vapes and become addicted. Our medicine has been turned into poison by the, uh, by the commercial tobacco industry. They are killing people and it needs to stop. Maine's future depends on healthy kids, but flavored tobacco products are luring and hooking another generation and it's time to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Please vote yes on LD 1550. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions of this uh, witness? Not seeing any, uh, we'll come back at the end of testimony from all those who had signed up by 8.30 and ask if anybody else would testify, would be interested in testifying. But now we'll go to here uh, on the opponent side of the issue. Uh, first from Dan Riley, welcome. Thank you, Senator. Representative Meyer, members of the committee. My name is Dan Riley, I'm an attorney with a firm of Norman Hansen in Detroit here in Portland. And I appear today on behalf of our client, Reynolds American. You've heard a lot of testimony today with anecdotal evidence. My point today is just going to be to let you know what I have provided to you uh, as exhibits to my written testimony. Uh, the primary point of my testimony is that there is a, a very definite and surgical approach that you as a committee can take to the issue that you've heard about today from all the proponents. And that surgical approach would be for the state to use this vehicle to focus on disposable vapor products. And the reason I'm, I'm pointing to that is because the evidence shows that that is the type of product that youth have migrated to since the federal government acted, the FDA acted under the Trump administration to ban cartridge-based uh, electronic cigarette delivery devices ends uh, and left a loophole open to allow disposable vapor products with flavors to remain on the market. If you use this bill and the amendment that we have provided to you as exhibit six of my testimony, then you can focus on that problem and direct the state's attention to that exact issue. So the other issue, the other evidence that I provided to you in my exhibits are, are the following. The first is I would recommend that if you read anything about what happened down in Massachusetts, that you read the one page article that I provided to you from Forbes magazine. It just lays it out very clearly as to what actually happened after Massachusetts banned flavor products. Uh, it also talks about what other states who are considering this very same legislation um, should look at as the cautionary tale of the Massachusetts experience, what they call the Massachusetts mistake. And just this week, the Connecticut legislature decided to adopt an approach more along the lines of the amendment that I have seconds, offered. Please. That amendment just exempts those products that are going through the FDA pre-market authorization process. And that's what Connecticut has decided to do just this week. Maryland last week decided not to follow Massachusetts example. So with that, you'll hear plenty of other uh, testimony about the impacts of that. But I wanted to make sure that you knew that you had that information and you do have the FDA press release from uh, just this past week about what they plan to do with respect to menthol and flavored cigars. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for Mr. Riley? Thank you for getting that literature posted to our website so that we could review it. Thank you. 
And uh, now we'll hear from John Scheer. Thank you, Chairman Claxton, Chairwoman Meyer, and members of the committee. My name is John Scheer. I'm the Executive Director of the New England Convenience Store and Energy Marketers Association, speaking today in opposition to LD 1550, and I've also submitted detailed written testimony. Because we represent convenience retailers throughout New England, I have a deep and evaluative understanding of how this very same policy has failed in Massachusetts and would likewise fail in Maine. It's this knowledge I wish to focus my testimony on today. Massachusetts banned the sale of flavored tobacco effective June 1st, 2020. Prior to that, we could only speculate what the consequences of a statewide ban would be. Today, with 11 full months of data, we know definitively what happens. And that's that a statewide ban of flavored tobacco doesn't work. Why? Because products in demand will always find a market. In those 11 months, New Hampshire and Rhode Island have combined to make up 85% of the lost cigarette sales. In other words, sales migrated over the border only to return for sales and consumption. Not th this is, no, this is just cigarette data. It's safe to assume the same has occurred for moist smokeless and e-cigarettes. Those are legal sales we're tracking. So we don't know how much is coming in illegally or from online sales. In Maine, menthol cigarettes are 18% an, are of the total cigarette market. Flavors account for 88% of the moist smokeless market and 72% of the vape market. Menthol cigarettes alone is a $120 million market. You cannot ban a $120 million plus market and expect the results you hope to achieve, which presumably is that nobody will use or initiate on these products any longer. It's, these, it's, it's the communities that are closest to the New Hampshire border that will bear the full brunt of the policy, but make no mistake, the products will find their way throughout Maine as they have in Massachusetts. Even the FDA recognizes the existence of a thriving black market. Part of its recently announced action on menthol includes a careful evaluation whether, uh, of whether a ban will create a new illicit market for products sold outside the regulatory system. This debate isn't about gross revenue or big tobacco trickery. It's about creating sound policy and consequence mitigation. Your intentions are good, but LD1550 is a deeply flawed policy. It is also flawed is in that it goes far beyond the products with youth appeal, flavored e-cigarettes, and would ban products that are statistically adult preferred products. This will not harm tobacco manufacturers, mind you. This will continue to make, they'll continue to make the same sales, just not through Maine retailers. The policy harms your local businesses and Maine adults. Maine leads the nation today in cessation and education funding and effectively uses its licensed, regulated, and enforced system with retailers at its, as its gatekeepers. This is the tool you should continue to use. In fact, Connecticut just made the came to the same conclusion by amending its flavored tobacco ban. 30 seconds, please. Thanks, to focus exclusively on flavored e-cigarettes with an important PMTA and MRTP exemption. I encourage you to inform yourselves on this issue uh, beyond anti-tobacco sound bites and look closely at what Connecticut decided, why the policy failed in Massachusetts, what the recently announced FDA policy does and does not do, and what the PMTA process will mean for the future of the industry. Thanks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. Scheer? And does your testimony explain the uh, alphabet salad that you used there in the last paragraph? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks. But if you need any further clarification, I'm happy to provide that. <laughs> not, not a place I spend much time, but I understood some of the reference, but not all. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Anna Bettencorp. If you'll unmute and join us. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. So um, I speak as a retailer. Um, i and I'd like to talk a little bit about Massachusetts regulations. I currently work for Energy North Group, which is a convenience store chain in Maine. We operate in Southern and Northern Maine. We have a total of um, 16 C stores and two car washes there. I heard earlier a lot of testimony about youth products, youth getting products and it being targeted to um, youth, which is not true in the sense of the convenience store. I can I share Mr. Share's um, thoughts in that we are the gatekeepers and we keep the product out of the hands of youth. 
But what I can tell you about is if you enact this policy, it's going to fail as it has in Massachusetts. I spent 23 years of my retail career in Massachusetts, and I can tell you that there's absolutely positively, and I've seen it with my own eyes, counterfeit product, you know, um, making its way in from other states. But the best governor that Massachusetts ever had um, for New Hampshire's business was Charlie Baker. I can tell you that I saw we have bordering stores, the company I previously worked for in New Hampshire, and the sales went down in Massachusetts, but we had a store in Salem, just boom. We all of a sudden, we started selling 50,000 packs a month, more than we previously had. And the sales doubled in the categories. So what I'm telling you is this will not solve the problem. You're still going to have um, customers using the product, just getting it from other sources, whether it be illegal um, channels of illicit trade. Because I can tell you in Boston, you can go in most con convenience stores that are not chain owned and buy a pack of Newports that the state is not getting any revenue on and is illegal to be there. And I just see the same things happening in your state if you enact this. This is not the way to keep youth from using the product. I am convinced if you want to keep youth from using tobacco products, it's education. So when I can tell you, I'm 43 years old now, when I was younger um, and in my school years, there were far more resources available to quit smoking and I realized there are budget restraints. But I don't think that retailers who keep the product from youth should be the ones that suffer for the choices made. Um, it, it, the process should be education. And that is all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing that perspective, Ms. Bettencourt. Um, next, we'll go to Anthony Miranda. Welcome. I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, my name is Anthony Miranda. I'm the executive chairman from the National Latino Officers Association. I am here to talk to you about the unintended consequences of the ban that you're speaking to, but I'm going to change my testimony a little bit based on all the conversation I listened to this morning. We spoke about protecting our youth, and that had been the focus. Unregulating and creating an industry that's unregulated product makes it more dangerous for our youth. Right now, the current products are being sold in a controlled environment where it's regulated, it's in the stores, and they tell the young kids they can't get access to it. However, what you're now doing is saying it's going to be available on the street or be available to an illicit market that can be altered and things can happen to it. You're opening up a, 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 an enforcement area where you say, well, it's not going to be people are going to get arrested for it, but people will ultimately require some type of enforcement. Most of your medical agencies, and again, this is a sickness. It should be treated as a sickness. It should be treated as an education product. It should be as something that will be focused on a health issue as opposed to something that will ultimately turn into a law enforcement issue. When you start having the illegal sales of these products, again, you're talking about a band which means that ultimately it becomes a black market product. It's something that's going to be sold on the streets in our community, which impacts our quality of life, which eventually turns into a call for law enforcement interaction. Again, a drug sale in the corner is no different than a cigarette sale in the corner. We've seen this in many different states where it happens. And you see many of these cases that impact, especially the community colors, that resulted in, in death because of quality of life issues over the illegal sale of cigarettes. Um, so when I caution you to this is the following. While we are talking about nobody's promoting cigarette smoking, that's not what we're talking about. We're definitely not talking about promoting cigarette smoking to our youth. We're saying that adults do have a choice to make, but education has been an effective tool and providing additional health options have also been an effective tool to preventing that type of addiction that we're talking to. Historically, it wasn't available to us and historically it wasn't. But again, now we're at a different stage. We have a community where you're saying that has a majority of population of people of color who are using menthol cigarettes, and you're saying that you want to ban it. That results in an unnecessary potential police contact in communities of color and in other communities. Again, I stress to you, it's about control of the product. It's monitoring. They have rules and regulations in the industry where we have it now. When you put it in the street, you're going to create police situations that are going to totally impact all our communities in a negative fashion. So consider that when you're making this decision right now. We're not talking about, you know, ban the flavors, ban the, the, um, the, the vapor products. These are things that not sh shouldn't have been out there to begin with. They also are things that are not regulated right now. 
However, cigarette sales, and men, cigarette sales and mentor cigarettes are a regulated industry and there are control mechanisms in place. So imagine that they, people are still going to gain access to it, but now there's no control mechanism. They can be altered. Other additional things can be added to them. It's got, not going to be an effective product that's going to be in the black market in our streets. So again, I caution you. I welcome any questions that you have for me. Now, speaking from a law enforcement perspective, this has law enforcement implications, regardless of you not addressing them. It will eventually be a law enforcement issue. Thank, thank you for your testimony. I'm not seeing any questions right now. Um, next, we can go to Anthony Scott. Good afternoon. Looks like you're still muted. There we go. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer in the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Anthony Scott. I'm representing Portland Smoke and Vape, and I'm here today in opposition to LD 1550. Uh, I could echo some of the other things that you're hearing today, where it's going to create a black market, and the youth are going to have access to this and, and find a way, which you're create effectively creating for them a, a market for them to be incredibly lucrative with young people that aren't going to be ID through this, but. Uh, one thing I do want to cover here and uh, is my experience as a store owner during the February 2020 flavored pod ban. And I had a lot of people uh, of age, uh, adult users uh, that would come in. And once they found out that the pods that they used that were flavored were, were banned, they decided that they would resort if it was their choice to resort back to a tobacco vape or what they're used to, which is a tobacco cigarette. They, they took that option and they went back to smoking cigarettes. We no longer see them in our stores anymore. Uh, I think with the passage of, of this legislation, you're going to see the rise. Not only are there uh, young adults in their, in their twenties and thirties that, you know, may have started vaping, but if you knock out their entire, uh, what they're used to, a flavored system, and they have a choice and they've ever smoked cigarettes, they're going to choose that over a tobacco vape. And it's, it's very concerning. Uh, I believe this, this actual ban is, is too wide. Uh, you're, you're categorizing everything together. And I hear a lot of talk about menthol cigarettes, and that's kind of what seems to be more of a target on this because with the federal FDA and the recent uh, stuff that they put out looking to ban menthol cigarettes and you're categorizing vape along with that. And they're two separate things. And within the vape market, there's, there's separate nuances uh, within the industry for large types of devices, which are pretty common knowledge that you do not find these in schools. They're not for the young people that are being used. Uh, they, they contain a lot lower strength of nicotine in them as opposed to like the higher jewel type devices. And I did hear Mr. Riley speak on disposables, which typically it is something that you will see the, the younger people uh, using. Uh, we have uh, talked 30 about- 30 seconds, please. Thank you. We, we've heard talk about maybe a nicotine cap and something that I could do, but with this ban, you are wiping out everything uh, for everybody. And if you come into the stores and you, you see the people that are using the lower strength nicotines, it's a lot of adult users. So please don't group them in with this bill. This is not intended for everything. Uh, the people that are proposing this bill, they want the stuff that's targeting the kids. Don't target the stuff that's the adult users. Thank you. I take any questions if you have any. Thank you for uh, that testimony. Uh, next, we can go to Brett Scott. Yes, my name, is, my name is Brett Scott, and I own Smokers Haven. I have two locations in Maine and 10 locations in New Hampshire. Um, I first of all, I just want to ask the question that, you know, the, where these products are for people that are 21 plus, and I understand that your concern is that there's youth access. And there was a few things that were causing and were a driver of that, one being these products being shipped through the mail. That has been addressed. These products are not being shipped through the mail anymore. It's not allowed in Maine, and it actually federally also, they no longer are being shipped through the mail. So that in itself was one of the major contributors of these products getting into the hands of youth. Also, 
I think it's important to look at the fact of why are vapes being put in the same category as traditional tobacco? And if we're talking about, you know, we know that cigarettes are a problem. Vapes are a better alternative. If you were to come into our stores and actually talk to some of these customers and hear some of these customers tell their stories of how vapes got them off from traditional tobacco and how they feel better, I think it's important to actually maybe go to some of these stores. I'd welcome you into any of our locations to be able to hear some of these stories firsthand from these customers. We've seen people that have been smoking for 30 years come in and we're able to switch them to vaping. And I think that there is definitely a benefit there as well. And I think that putting these all in the same category is, does not make sense. As far as banning cigarettes, why don't we just ban all cigarettes? The vaping is a better alternative. And obviously we sell cigarettes. I'm not against the ban on the menthol cigarettes specifically, but the part of putting vapes in the same category is absolutely wrong. Also, there is a PMTA process by the FDA. All these products had to submit an application as of September 9th of last year. These products had to go through a scientific review. In the words of the FDA, that they will be using scientific data that demonstrates the product is appropriate for the protection of public health. Quote, that is what the FDA has to say. If they do not deem these products to do that, then they will not be allowed to remain on the market. That process is happening. The one year timeline is coming up this September. It's ex we're almost there. So I guess that's uh, all my testimony. At this point. Thank you. Thank you for being here, taking the time. Um, next, we're going to hear from Chris Jackson. Thank you, uh, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, members of the committee. I'm Chris Jackson. I'm a resident of Bodenham and am here today on behalf of the Cigar Association of America in opposition to LD 1550. Uh, simply put, the Cigar Association is adamantly opposed to youth usage of cigars and its member companies have adopted practices to curb usage in adolescence. And these practices have been successful and youth usage rates are now at an all time low. Uh, as you have heard just last week, the FDA announced its intention to issue a proposed product standard seeking to ban all characterizing flavors in cigars, the proposed product standard will be subject to comment and the Cigar Association of America will, will absolutely engage in that process. We're adamant that tobacco is an adult product and minors should not use any tobacco product. But this ban would do very little other than to limit choices of adult cigar consumers as the reason for adding flavors is product differentiation and identification as is the case for a host of other consumer products such as wine, beer, and spirits that are not intended for underage use. Um, this past Sunday, I read with some disbelief the cover story of the main Sunday Telegram, Portland Press Herald, titled Edibles with an Edge. And if you haven't read it, I hope you go pick it up and see if you don't pick up on some irony um, of this here in a band flavored cigar is a product that the underage population does not use as a rule while other industries whip up cannabis infused goodies like gingerbread flavored or sea salt caramel bonbons, pumpkin cheesecake and chocolate dipped strawberry French macaroon edibles. The sub headline of the, the, the article itself states THC infused gummies, candies and baked goods is making marijuana mouthwatering. But I just, I point that out to you and I hope you consider it. Um, we're strongly opposed to this. I've submitted some written testimony that has more detail um, from our perspective. And thank you for your time and patience today. Thank you <clears throat> for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Next, we'll go to Christine Peters. Good afternoon. Hi, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you. So my name is Christine Peters. I am the Chief Operating Officer for the Maine Smoke Shops. We are an employee owned company that employs around 80 employees across the state of Maine. It is very disappointing to us that during a global pandemic, trying to keep ourselves and our customers safe, that we must now fight for the rights of our customers and employees to purchase flavored tobacco products that have been on the market for decades, not talking about vape and electronic cigarettes. I feel like the national epidemic of the younger people vaping has opened Pandora's box in terms of the flavor ban. No retail establishment thinks, hey, let's sell tobacco products to minors today. We stand with you 
and trying to keep underage kids from getting their hands on any tobacco products. I myself, being a former smoker that started when I was 15 years old by taking my mom's cigarettes behind her back, I was not looking for you know, advertisements to get me smoking. It was my mother that smoked, that got me to smoke. Um, I, as a parent, have educated my two adult daughters not to make the same mistakes that I did. We have seen in Massachusetts that the flavor ban has created those consumers to find other means to get their products. We see customers coming from Massachusetts buying menthol cigarettes. Um, and so during this pandemic with so many businesses closing, I would think that lawmakers would not want to cripple main businesses more. The state would be at risk of losing $21 million a year in revenue and the state budget would take at least a $22 million hit. It will create a black market. It will drive business to New Hampshire. I can remember back in 2007 when we banned flavored cigars, we had a store in New Hampshire and our customers would make a trip once a month to get cigars for themselves, their neighbors and their relatives. I have also seen no scientific proof that menthol cigarettes or flavored tobacco products are any more harmful than non-flavored. And in an environment where it is crucial to follow the science, where is the science in all of this? I wanna thank you for your time and please ask you to follow the science. And remember that we're trained to check IDs and prevent underage smoking. The local drug dealer down the street that will be selling menthol cigarettes will not ask for an ID, nor will you collect the excise tax from that sale. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Christopher Bollier. We see you're unmuted. We're not seeing you if we're supposed to, and we're not hearing you yet, Christopher. Are you there, Christopher? It's your turn. Okay, now you're unmuted again. I forgot to mention at the start of the hearing that we have a daily allotment of technical problems that we have to fulfill. This would be one of those. Okay. Um, Christopher, you're unmuted. Now you're muted. Unmuted. Go ahead and speak if you'd like. Okay, uh, let's come back uh, to Christopher and uh, we'll hear from Corey and I don't want to even mess up your last name. If you want to unmute Corey. Corey Pegues. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having me. Good afternoon to everyone. Let me just first put a disclaimer out there that I'm not a smoker, and I'm not advocating smoking. I'm coming to you as a 21-year veteran, uh, retired as an executive from the New York City Police Department. I'm also part of the National Coalition of Justice Practitioners. I heard the testimony this morning. It was heart-wrenching. It actually was a tearjerker to hear those stories. But, you know, the common denominator with all of those stories, most people haven't seen or touched the individuals that, took the cigarettes or smoked the cigarettes, uh, you know, because there was 21 and older. But what the nation has seen is Eric Garner, who allegedly was selling Lucy cigarettes, have the life choked out of him. Well, what else they saw was they saw Sandra Bland get pulled over in Texas, refused to put her cigarette out and allegedly hung herself and she died in the cell. But more recently, what America has seen was George Floyd going to a convenience store with a counterfeit, alleged counterfeit 
$20 bill to purchase a pack of cigarettes and have the life choked out of him for nine minutes and 29 seconds. That's what America has seen. That's our common denominator. Actually, the world saw those three instances. So as a Black man and being a commander and two of the most violent priests in the city of New York for 21 years, I know that in Black and brown communities, the police hunt. And in white communities, they protect and serve. And the last time the government got involved and was worrying about Black people's health, it was the war on drugs. And we saw what they did with the war on drugs. They took a bunch of Black and Puerto Rican people, put them in jails. And we're still dealing with that right now. Generations, we're dealing with that. Okay, and now there's an opioid crisis, and it doesn't really affect the Black and brown community, but it became a health issue. And I'm happy that America has smartened up. The only way you can deal with somebody that's addicted to smoking is just like opioids. It's counseling, treatment, and education. But when you ban something, it's like prohibition. When they had prohibition, everybody went underground to make liquor. It's going to be the same thing. Already in New York State, the whole state of New York, 50% of the cigarettes are so underground. So we already know that when you do a ban, the underground is going to be open. And if you think for one second that you have health issues now with people smoking, once you enact the ban, you're going to have real serious health issues because people are going to be making cigarettes, menthol cigarettes in their backyards and in their basements. You're not going to know what you're smoking. They're going to be coming from China. They're going to be coming. They're going to be coming from India. I want to just really leave you with this. I want you to really understand this to the legislators. You can ban it, but you won't stop the sale. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the time. Thank you for taking the time to uh, testify and for your years of service in the New York City Police Department. Thank you. Oh, now we can go to Christopher Bollier. Welcome. You want to unmute? There we go. Are we working now? It is. Awesome. That's terrific. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Claxton, Chairwoman Meyer, and members of the committee. My name is Chris Bollier, and I am the Director of Retail Operations for Cigarette Shopper. We operate 22 tobacco-only stores in Maine and have some 100 hardworking employees. As virtually all of our revenue is from tobacco products, and more than 25% of our sales are from flavored tobacco products, the flavor ban in LD1550 would be particularly damaging to our stores, removing a significant number of the tobacco products that we sell from store shelves. Protecting youth from access to tobacco products is a goal shared by everyone, including retailers. We train our employees to prevent sales to underage individuals, and we do not allow anyone under the age of 21 to enter our stores. In fact, over the past 10 years, our stores have been inspected by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to determine compliance 238 times, and we have a 99% passing rating on not selling to underage persons. This means that our stores are not the problem when it comes to youth having access to tobacco products. LD 1550 will not do anything to protect young people and will not have any impact on consumption of flavored tobacco products in Maine. All it will do is drive sales from legitimate Maine retailers like our stores to one of two places, to New Hampshire, which has decided not to ban flavored products or to illegal unlicensed sellers of products who will bring flavored tobacco products into Maine and sell them to whomever has the cash to buy them. All you are going to accomplish is to take these products away from legitimate Maine stores like Cigarette Shopper and give it to New Hampshire retailers or to criminals. That does not sound like a policy that is in the best interest of Maine and it certainly is not in the interest of our business or our employees whose jobs wouldn't be would be in danger if this bill passes. If we lose more than 25% of our business, then Hope Gagner, Donnie Woodard, Kayla Libby, Julie Snell, Matt Allen, Julie Parker, Dave Curran, Michelle Parker, Lindsey Gould, Axel Wallingford, and some 90 others could face being laid off. Please do not put us in the position of having to terminate employees when all they have done is work hard and prevented tobacco sales to kids. Please support Maine businesses and youth and oppose LD 1550. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. 
Thank you, Mr. Bullier. I'm glad we got those technical problems sorted out. As am I, thank you. Okay, uh, next we'll hear from David Daniels III. Welcome, sir, if you wanna unmute and join us. Mr. Daniels, are you with us and wanna unmute? There we go. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. My name is David Daniels III. I'm a retired Bridgeport, Connecticut police lieutenant with 25 years plus service. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak today in opposition to Maine's, Maine's proposed menthol ban, LD 1550. 65 years old, I'm a non-smoker. First eight years of my career, I taught the D.A.R.E. program, a drug resistance education program in public and rural schools. I did not ever believe that children should have access to such things and everything that, and I think that we should do everything that we could to make sure that they don't form such habits. Grownups are a different story and that they should be allowed to make their own choice. I think that a, a menthol ban will do nothing to curb adult usage of menthol products. People of color are large purveyors of these products, have been able to legally purchase them for over a hundred years at will. I believe that they will continue to do so crossing state lines if necessary to get them, or worse turn to what could be a burgeoning black market, unsafe, unregulated, and illicit. Also, as a retired law enforcement officer, I fear that with the current relationship between police and communities of color, will worsen over time. It's bad enough right now that you can hardly turn on the television and, and see on every network the negative interactions, most or some culminating in death. I know that that the people that fashion this legislation profess to only be targeting the seller. But if the desired effect is not what you get, then eventually they'd be forced to go after the buyers as well. I can see officers using this menthol ban as a pretext to stop and engage people of color or target them to see what else is possible for them to discover or glean information for. for. It's ironic that nationally, most states are embracing marijuana as they try to ban menthol cigarettes. I think more time and energy should be used to educate, formulate cessation programming to battle the problem. Once again, I'd like to thank you for your time and this opportunity to speak. I too would be happy to answer any of you. I don't see any questions, uh, Lieutenant, but again, thank you for years of service uh, in the police department. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Next, we're going to hear from David Hancox. Welcome. Welcome, thank you. I'm David Hancox and I was the Director of State Audits in the New York State Controller's Office. I've written and taught on issues focused on assessing government programs and policies such as the bill before you now. <clears throat> While RJ Reynolds has compensated me for my time preparing these comments, the opinions expressed are my own, informed by my years of auditing government policies to determine if they were effective. I've also submitted written testimony. Flavor bans did not reduce smoking in Massachusetts and won't reduce smoking in Maine. In the first three months after it was implemented, sales data show that 70% of Massachusetts menthol demand went to neighboring states. In-state sales of non-menthol cigarettes accounted for the remaining 30%. There's no evidence that the smoking rates declined. Menthol cigarettes account for 54 million of the $71 million Maine collects in sales and excise taxes on the flavored products this bill would ban. Many consumers will continue using these products, but New Jersey and other states will collect the revenue as we saw in Massachusetts. Economic activity, legal economic activity will decline in Maine. Flavored products account for 43% of tobacco sales in Maine. Tobacco sales also drive retail sales of other goods. This bill could cost Maine retailers more than $310 million. Retailers will try to fill some of this loss by cutting costs, which means cutting jobs and cutting wages. Illegal economic activity will increase as criminal traffickers establish illicit distribution chains for banned products in Maine. Cigarettes are the most widely smuggled legal consumer product and the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms is concerned about the criminal enterprises and terrorist organizations that move cigarettes across jurisdictional lines. 
The opportunities for smokers to reduce their risk by switching to less risky tobacco products will decrease. Smoke components, not menthol or flavors, drive the disease caused by smoking. This bill bans products that are not consumed through combustion and therefore present less health risks than cigarettes. Smokers who would switch to a flavored non-combustible product might not switch without the flavor. And this bill will deny smokers access to products the FDA has found and will find to be appropriate for the public health. The FDA in making this decision will consider risks to youth and all the other concerns that the proponents of flavor bans hope to address. This process is presently underway. Indeed, the FDA is also considering, thank you, is also considering whether a nationwide ban on the use of menthol cigarettes makes sense. If a federal ban is implemented, illicit trade will still be a problem, but it will come from Canada and other countries. In any event, a federal ban won't drive the same revenue and market distortions that necessarily arise when menthol cigarettes are legal in one state and banned in another. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your perspective, sir. Uh, you have a different one than other folks we've heard from, so I'm glad. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, next, we can go to a phone call. Welcome uh, former Chief John Dixon. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. All right. First and foremost, I, I want to thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to speak on this. Uh, as stated, I'm a former chief of police. I'm actually a pa past president of Noble, the uh, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, the second largest police organization in the world. Uh, and importantly, uh, Black Hats as well. I'm a law enforcement professional. Uh, I'm a black man that grew up in the inner city. In the poor oh, we're losing your audio, Chief. Two black boys. law enforcement professional, please be fooled when it's said that law enforcement has limited involvement in enforcing bans. Menthol cigarettes will be used as a precursor stop to lead to where the menthol cigarettes are coming from. Uh, and so bans don't work. And we've seen this already. I mean, we have examples of this. If you go back to prohibition, you know, that came out of prohibition, you have more speakeasy come about during that time period, you know, to the point where alcohol was, you know, and so as a black man growing up in the inner the city, the reason I became a police officer is a man shot and killed over a $13 radio in my neighborhood where we had continuous disproportionate contact from the police, which led to excessive force and police abuse. The more police come in contact with our young people, not just our black and brown people, our young people in general, the more possibility of incidents occurring. And, and this right here will just be one more reason. Can you imagine your 17-year-old, you know, your 18-year-old, you know, being approached by assuming that they're smoking a menthol cigarette and they're trying to figure out, you know, uh, where they got that menthol cigarette from and, you know, that interaction going to be. And, and we've seen across the country where that interaction can definitely end up a negative interaction. And lastly, and more importantly, I'm a father of black children. Even as a law enforcement officer, as a chief of police, I have to have a conversation with my children as they go out there uh, to embark in the world because, you know, I have to say, you know, son, be careful. If you get pulled over by the police, stick both hands out the window. Please don't make any furtive movements. Please don't say anything, you know, or, you know, even if he is disrespectful to you, you know, as our young people constantly say, they diss me, you know, even if he diss you, please come home to me so I can have that you know, I can deal with whatever issues need to be dealt with later. You know, I, I've never, never tell my son, be careful because that menthol cigarette may put his foot on your neck. But I had, I have often, seconds, had to, if you get pulled over by the police, please let them know who you are right away so that you can come home 
and 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 you can be safe. So I, I say to you all, take a look at this. Unintended consequences are real. We had three strikes you out, a lot of bad policies out there, you know, and it turns out years later, you know, that it affects a particular community more than it affects anybody else. So I, I tell you, please take a look at it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Chief. You've been um, you've been amazing about hanging in there on the phone. So thank you for that <laughs> for your service. Thank you, sir. He joined us at nine o'clock on a phone call. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, Hallie Tarenko. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and the members of the Joint Standing Committee of Health and Human Services. Um, my name is Haley Tranko, and I'm a full-time public administration student at the University of Maine Augusta. I'm also a full-time employee at a glass and vape gallery down in Hallwell, and I would like to present this testimony against LD1550, an act to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Vaping has seen increased popularity over the years, and often people are quick to dismiss that popularity as being due to the fruity flavors available to consume consumers. The benefits of enjoying enjoyed by longtime smokers after converting to vaping are often not discussed. Every day at my job, I see lifelong smokers who thought they would never stop quitting cigarettes who are able to convert to vaping. And while they are still feeding their dependency on nicotine by vaping, they're breaking down the social barriers that burden a lot of smokers. Because vaping does not involve smoke or tar, those who convert to vaping do not deal with the stigma of yellowing teeth, yellowing windows and walls of the indoor places they indulge in, and they do not have to walk around conscious of the fact that they smell like cigarettes, knowing how offensive that smell can be to non-smokers. Being able to switch to vaping as an alternative and not having to exhibit so many telltale signs of being a smoker allows smokers to be more accepted by society and their families, and often the first step to quitting any addiction is feeling accepted by society and having supportive people to fall back on. Another common myth about vaping is that it appeals mostly to younger people and therefore is more likely to find its way into the hands of underage people. But in reality, their appeal remains the same as normal cigarettes. A study by the advocacy group Tobacco Free Kids found that 24% of 12th graders had tried a cigarette at least once in their lifetime. Another study conducted by Brookings Research Institution found that 24% of 17 year olds, essentially the same age group, had reported trying an e-cigarette at least once. The temptation to try illicit substances at a young age is fundamental and it will not be solved by limiting the flavors of these substances come in. The state would also not be preventing people from buying flavored baits with this bill. They would only lose their game from the market while citizens flock to the next state over. I have witnessed firsthand that people who vape are not easily deterred from buying them. When the sales tax of wholesale vape products increased earlier this year, our store in turn had to raise our prices by 50%. And I have not had a single customer unwilling to pay an extra $10 for their favorite vape. It doesn't phase them and neither will it drive across the border um, intimidate a frequent customer. And if this bill is, as is my understanding, being passed because the state truly feels that youth enjoys va flavored vape products, then this is the wrong bill to pass in a state with an epidemic of young people leaving after completing their education. And I don't want anyone to get the impression that I'm arguing vaping is healthy. It is objectively not healthy. But I'm pointing out that there are unseen non-health related benefits of vaping that do not get public attention. And I would also point out that I would stand in opposition of a ban on fast food, alcohol, or any other indulgence that grown adults in a free country should have access to. Imagine a, please. Thank you. Imagine a legislation proposing that soda only come in one plain flavor to discourage childhood obesity. It would not be perceived as an effective measure by the public. I urge you guys to explore the cons of this side. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'm not seeing any questions. So now we can go to Johnny Green, if you'll unmute, sir. Good afternoon and thank you, Mr. Chair, and to all who are assembled. I also have been on the line since 9 a.m. Uh, this morning. Uh, I'm the senior pastor of Mount Nebo Baptist Church in the village of Harlem, and I'm also the president of Impact New York, mobilizing preachers and communities, an organization that consists of over 500 churches throughout the Empire State and across the United States of America. I have uh, come to this uh, hearing to state uh, unequivocally that I uh, take a strong stance against the uh, ban on the sale of menthol cigarettes. This bill uh, that has been put forth today, LD uh, 1550. Uh, I don't smoke. I don't advocate as a as a clergy uh, smoking. 
Uh, but I also know that I don't have a right to tell people how to live their lives. Uh, being a pastor for more than 35 years and being in ministry for more than 42 years, I've seen a lot of people die from cancer as a result of cigarette smoking, uh, et cetera. I do know that uh, menthol is the choice of, of cigarettes for people of color. Uh, one of the things that really alarms me is when people come to hearings like this and uh, state uh, in their uh, arguments uh, for banning cigarettes that they're concerned about what's going on in the black and brown community. Uh, when you check their records uh, beyond things that only interest them, you don't see them uh, advocating for black causes. And so that concerns me. And then uh, the interreaction, you know, of being the president of Impact and also national board member of National Action Network. Uh, I know personally Gwen Carr, the mother of Eric Garner. I marched uh, in Staten Island. I've been with uh, Ms. Carr uh, since day one of her son's assassination, uh, murder on the streets of Sta Staten Island. And I know uh, what can happen when there are unintended consequences as a result of uh, black and brown people having interactions with the police department. So I'm asking the legislators in Maine to please uh, vote against this ban. Uh, because it will lead, in my estimation, to uh, some very serious uh, interaction between police and members of the Black community. And we can no longer afford to see another situation like Eric Garner, George Floyd, and many other names that have been called today. And so along with my clergy organization, Impact, uh, and Black and Brown people from the community where I serve, we 30 seconds, please. encourage you to... Uh, vote down uh, this bill and not pass it. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Green, for your testimony. Is there a question from Senator Baldacci? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask, and it's not necessarily particularly this witness, but to any of the witnesses, because I know one disclosed it while they were talking, but it might be helpful if people who have received money from uh, tobacco companies, because one of the speakers already indicated they were being paid to speak. Um, we, if, you know, people should disclose that if, if there are other speakers who have been compensated, I think it's important for the committee to know that. Let me just ask Mr. Green, um, as, uh, what are your uh, organization's connections with the tobacco companies or the tobacco industry? Do they contribute to? I'm speaking today on behalf of Reverend Dr. Johnny Green. Very good. And you're not being compensated by any? I'm speaking on behalf of Reverend Dr. Johnny Green and I've stated my convictions as to why I think there should be this ban against uh, this bill. That, that should This bill should be voted down. I, I understand. I respect. We'll that. move on to the next witness and hear from uh, Carl Abramson. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify before you all today. My name is Carl Abramson, and I am here on behalf of Americans for Tax Reform, urging you to oppose LD 1550. Prohibiting flavors in e-cigarettes will hurt businesses, decrease state tax revenues, keep cigarette smokers using deadly combustible cigarettes, and will do nothing to prevent e-cigarette use among teenagers. We also cannot ignore the disproportionate harm that a ban on flavored tobacco will have on minorities by contributing to the over-policing of minority populations. Prohibiting a legal product used primarily by marginalized communities is exactly why the ACLU opposes proposals like LD1550, because they know that bans on menthol cigarettes will, and I quote, disproportionately impact people in communities of color trigger criminal penalties, prioritize criminalization over public health and harm reduction, and instigate unconstitutional policing and other negative interactions with law enforcement. If the goal of this bill is to decrease smoking rates, then banning flavored vapes, which are scientifically proven to help people quit smoking, goes against every principle of sound policy. Evidence shows that e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than combustible cigarettes, and they're uh, more than twice as effective at helping smokers quit than other methods like nicotine patches or gum. As such, vaping has been endorsed by dozens of the world's leading public health organizations as safer than smoking and an effective method of, method of smoking cessation. 
If a majority of cigarette smokers in Maine switch to vaping, Georgetown University Medical Center estimates that more than 27,000 premature deaths would be avoided. This would save and transform lives. Additionally, flavored e-cigarettes are even more effective for adult smokers who are trying to quit cigarette smoking. There was a study published recently in the journal on nicotine and tobacco that showed that smokers who try to quit with a flavored e-cigarette are 43% more likely to succeed than those who use an unflavored product. And again, I know others have said this, but I, I really recommend you all look at Massachusetts, um, which imposed a ban on flavors last year, and they're losing more than $10 million a month in excise tax revenue. Cigarette sales have gone down in Massachusetts, but they've increased in New Hampshire and Rhode Island more than they went down in Massachusetts. It's been a disastrous policy for the state, and I urge you all to avoid making the same mistake. If the Maine legislature wants to gift their state cigarette tax revenues to the state of New Hampshire, LD 1550 is the way to do that. We should also look at San Francisco, which banned flavors in e-cigarettes in 2018, and there was no decrease in vaping rates among youths. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey found that the number one reason teenagers try e-cigarettes is because they're curious. Only 5% of teenage vapors say they were drawn to e-cigarettes because of flavors. We've heard arguments today that kids are drawn to e-cigarettes because of flavors, but data shows that this is not true. And just, just to conclude here, bills related to public health must be evidence-based and they must be driven by data. Thank you. This bill is not, and as such, I urge you to vote against LD 1550. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Mr. Abramson. Uh, we've had a request from the committee for people who are testifying to identify if they would, whether they're being compensated by any tobacco company. I think that's a fair request and a general request. Yes, sir. There... Um, as a nonprofit organization, Americans for Tax Reform respects the privacy of our donors, and we politely request that you all do the same. Very good. Representative Stover, did you have a question? Yes, Mr. Abramson, you testified that in Massachusetts um, that it hasn't worked or failed. Um, and um, I'm just wondering, do you know, has there been any serious effort to repeal the law in Massachusetts? Uh, Ma'am, I cannot speak on that. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Senator Baldacci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Abramson, thank you for coming before us. You're speaking as uh, on behalf of the Americans for tax reform, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, isn't it true and been well documented in the press over the last 20 years that- Let, Americans Let's keep the question specific to the bill, Senator, please. Can we keep well, the question? I think it is relevant for us to know the ties that this uh, organization has been funded by the tobacco I think industry he, for 20 years. I think he addressed that question. I think we have to individually weigh the value of the testimony as we do with everybody else. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, we'll hear from uh, Kelly Willigar. Welcome. Hello, all, can you hear me? We can, Kelly. Okay, for some reason you can't see me and I'm not gonna mess around with that. Um, I am not being paid by a tobacco company to be here. I am here on behalf of, oh no. Now I've got a notification. Hang on. How does this work? Okay, here I am. Hi. <laughs> um, I am here on behalf of myself and I'm going to represent the um, folks who are um, dependent on combustible tobaccos and nicotine addictions. Um, I would also like to point out um, just very quickly, I'm taking some of my time to say this. Um, the American Heart, American Lung, and many of our um, education programs that are in favor of our youth not using vaporizer products or tobacco products are paid for by the big tobacco settlement. So, you know, really that kind of takes that off the table. So anyway, um, I'm here to represent people who have a horrible addiction today. I wanna to talk about um, something different. I wanna talk about compassion. I wanna talk about how we treat people with addiction with such respect and love in our communities um, when somebody has an addiction to opioids, we send them to a clinic perhaps. Um, sometimes they're given a prescription called Suboxone. I'm sure you're all much more familiar with it than I am. Um, you would not prescribe that to me as I am not an addict. It is not a vitamin, um, but it is a healthier alternative to their addiction, to their street addiction, where their drugs are made and sold and you know horrible things happen to them and the people around them. Now, vaping products are a 95% healthier product on the market they represent that same thing. They are the alternative for people to use to be able to get off those terrible combustibles. We spent all morning, and yes, I was here from 9 a.m. listening to testimony about how terrible combustible tobaccos are, including menthol. And I agree wholeheartedly 
people are dying. People have been dying for what, a hundred plus years from smoking tobacco. Um, unfortunately, because of the tobacco settlements, we aren't um, able to completely take them off the market and get rid of them, which we should be able to. We can't, but we have people who are addicted to those products. They are addicts, just like our other you know, folks are. Uh, you don't um, charge $100 for their medication at the clinic because that's gonna motivate them to quit their addiction. That's going to heal their addiction because they have to pay more money than they can afford. Of course not. We give them counseling, we give them help. We give them healthier alternatives to be able to get through that addiction, to be able to survive, to see their children get married um, and many other things along the way. Um, you know, we don't make hypodermic needles with little razors in the end so people can't use them. We give them to them. We give them a healthier solution. We give them some place to go if they need a safe place to conduct their business. And when they walk in the door, we don't tell them that they're a burden on the healthcare system. We don't tell them how much they cost us. 30 we, give cents. Our, we give them our compassion. We give them our love and we treat their addiction. And that is what vaping products do. And we all know that adults love flavors. So all you have to do is walk down the aisle at the grocery store. You have to now because of the arrows, right? And how many flavors are out there? Um, I'll also say that um, Nicorette gum, which is a nicotine replacement therapy, does not come in tobacco flavor. The flavors that they have are fruit and mint flavors. Adults like flavors. Adults need a healthier alternative to combustible cigarettes. And the ones that are on the market now don't have the percentage rates that they think of. Thank you. Thank you all for listening today. Thank you. Good to see you again, Kelly. Different circumstances than last time. <laughs> um, next, we'll go to uh, Kevin Colangelo. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Claxton, Representative Maya, and distinguished members of the Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, my name is Kevin Colangelo. I am a Maine resident and a director of operations for Rusty Lanton Markets, which is based out of Brunswick. Uh, our business operates 18 stores across Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, and we employ a great number of employees in the state of Maine. I'm very disappointed to hear that the Maine State Legislature is considering a ban on menthol cigarettes and flavored dip across our state. I urge you to oppose this measure. With that being said, we do agree on one thing. We need to address underage vaping, but banning all flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes, makes no sense. Rusty Lanton employees are all required to watch the No Butts Retailer Training Program even before getting on the register. We also on a monthly basis test employees on the policies for checking IDs to help prevent the sale of tobacco to minors. Rusty Lanton takes this seriously and continues to train our employees at all levels to help prevent the sale of tobacco to all minors. Maine small business owners have struggled to keep their doors open during this prolonged economic slowdown. Not, not only has gas and in-store sales been impacted, but I've also had to invest in additional safety measures resulting in unforeseen costs negatively impacting our bottom line. As a company, we have truly felt the pain from the ban of menthol products in the state of Massachusetts. When the ban went into effect, our four locations saw a drastic drop in our tobacco business of approximately 22%. With that being said, we also felt the positive impact at our store locations in New Hampshire after the flan, uh, flavor ban went into effect, which caused a sales increase of 24% from people crossing the state lines to get their products. We strongly feel the pressure to ban menthol in the state of Maine will directly drive the business to the neighboring state of New Hampshire. Lastly, this broad ban on flavored tobacco products would jeopardize a significant portion of my revenue and quite frankly, could force my business to reduce labor and in some cases, close some stores. A ban on these products would put thousands of Maine jobs at risk. I urge you to vote against LD 1550. Please do not move forward with such a broad ban. Thank you for your consideration and I'll answer any questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Colangelo. Are there any questions? I, I don't see any. So uh, we'll move to uh, Kyle Feldman. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. To the main committee on health and human services. My name is Kyle Feldman and I am a vice president of National Convenience Distributors, NCD. NCD is a full line convenience store distributor in the Northeast selling fro grocery, frozen, refrigerated food, beverages, school supplies, health and beauty products, general merchandise, as well as cigarettes and tobacco. We have always recognized the value of our services, so it's not surprising that during pandemics and crises, we are deemed an essential business, providing the very essential services and products to our customers who supply communities for their needs. We also find ourselves navigating the recent events that have led to nationwide civil unrest across America, which also has put pressure on our businesses and obliging curfew orders for safety precautions. NCD is one of the largest privately held companies in the Northeast. Over the last 100 plus years, we have grown to over 20,000 plus customers, which includes hundreds of customers in Maine. In addition to all of this, we're also a very large tax collector in Maine, proudly remitting upwards of over $20 million a year in support of the state that enables us to employ, employ so many individuals and touch so many lives in a positive way. This background is necessary for you to understand and so that you realize I'm not just some fly by night individual wanting my voice heard, or we as an organization are not only worried about revenue. We are your partners and are just the concerned about keeping vapor products out of the hands of youth. However, LD 1550 is not the answer. The goal of this committee is to evaluate bills through the lens of the public health. However, we must ask to what point does the health interest of governments infringe on individual freedoms? Proponents of this bill will tell you that this bill is protecting the kids of Maine. However, reality is far from that. We acknowledge that something must be done to prevent youth access to vapor products. However, traditional products like cigarettes and moist snuff are not attractive to youth and banning these products will do nothing except restrict adult access. In Maine, 2019 data showed 28.7% of Maine high school students reported currently using e-cigarettes at least one time in the past 30 days. That's an increase from 15.3% in 2017. However, the CDC High School Youth Risk Behavior Survey from 2019 shows that only 1.8% of high school students have smoked cigarettes frequently. 30 seconds, sir. Nareev Shah, director of the Maine Center of Disease Control and Prevention, is quoted notably the 2019 response to show a decrease in the percentage of Maine students who smoke or use other forms of conventional tobacco products. The title of LD 1550 should read, an act to punish local retailers and restrict adult freedoms. The concept that this bill will do anything contrary to that point is false. Consumers will still buy the products in New Hampshire. Youth will still purchase the products via friends and family. Adult freedoms will be restricted. Those are the facts. I recommend the main legislator do a full audit of tobacco sensation and prevention programs to see where and why they are failing. I also implore this legislature to sign into law an act in pro prosecuting adults who provide tobacco products to youth. In summary, we are your partners in preventing youth access and use of tobacco bills, but LD 1550 do none of that. If you want to have a robust dialogue, you must include local businesses like mine. We are on the front lines and in convenience stores every day. So we have keen understanding of this issue. Vote no on LD 1550 and instead let's create a task force of local businesses, health advocates, and subject matter experts to truly address the issues facing our youth. Thank you very much. I hope everyone has a safe and enjoyable Mother's Day. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. I'm not seeing any questions. So now we'll go to uh, Michael Matt and Dr. Madden. Welcome. Thank you very much. You hear me okay? We can. Great. My name is Michael Madden. I'm a family doctor and the former chief medical officer of a multi-state managed care company serving the Medicaid and Medicare populations. I've been practicing medicine for more than 36 years and have worked extensively on issues such as opioid addiction, HIV, and smoking. In following the suggestion from Senator Claxton to make our, personal, our comments personal, 
I am passionate about helping adult smokers because my mother died of smoking related illnesses, but I also care a great deal about youth because I am a, thing, a grandfather and it is possible to do both. While Kent Reynolds has compensated me for my time in preparing my testimony, let me be clear that the opinions expressed are my own. I have also submitted more detailed written testimony to the committee, which I urge you to review as the data presented may be new to you and could broaden your thoughts about these important topics. I speak today in opposition to HB 1155, and I urge you to consider the public health need to balance limiting youth access to tobacco products with the enormous opportunity non-combustible tobacco products present for tobacco harm reduction. Harm reduction is a key public health principle employed to mitigate deadly health risk. Examples include methadone for opioid addiction and condom use to, to decrease HIV transmission. While not reducing these risks to zero, harm reduction substantially improves safety and saves lives. Smokers die prematurely not because they consume nicotine, which is not a carcinogen, but because of how they consume it in a combustible form. For example, moist snuff users, the majority of whom use flavored products, experience significantly lower risk of disease than smokers. And leading health authorities have agreed that vapor products may substantially reduce smoking's harms. Industry data show that 66% of adult moist snuff users and more than 53% of adults who make the switch from uh, uh, combustible tobacco to uh, e-cigarettes choose non-flavored products uh, for their uh, consum consumption. And the FDA has recognized the availability of flavored tobacco products may help smokers move away from use of combustible cigarettes. Let's be clear, youth should not use tobacco products of any kind. And Maine's 2018 law, along with the federal government's 2019 law, uh, to ban the sale of tobacco products to those under the age of 21 are the proper tools to address youth access to these products. 30 seconds, please. The 2020 National uh, Youth Tobacco Survey's data suggests that these products may be working since the rate of daily teen smoking has continued to drop and less than 5% of the, to less than 5% of teens, and it's the lowest level ever. And teen experimentation with vaping, any vaping product in the last 30 days, fell by seven percentage points last year. I also echo the support you've heard for the FDA PMTA process and avoid putting Maine in a contradiction to federal approval of vaping products that will have a net public health benefit. This bill ignores the fact that adults prefer flavored products when making the decision to move from smoking to vaping. True tobacco harm reduction requires a broad array of non-combustible tobacco products be accessible and appealing to current smokers. I urge you to review my written testimony and to reject this proposal that would limit the choices available to Maine smokers. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Senator Baldacci. Uh, Dr. Madden, uh, you're aware that the Surgeon General of the United States issued a report in 2020 calling youth use of, of e-cigarettes an epidemic. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you disagree with the Surgeon General of the United States? I don't disagree with him, but the issue is broader than just youth access because we need to provide a broad array of opportunities for smokers. And remember, they're the ones that are dying of tobacco-related illness, of current smokers to have options to move away. I hope you're also aware that the stated federal policy or government policies of Great Britain and New Zealand support tobacco harm reduction. So there is controversy in this area. So you do agree that it is an epidemic or you don't? I'm not sure from- The definition of an epidemic is a higher rate than it would have been without some other intervention. So yes, the rate of, use, of youth use of vaping is a higher rate than it used to be because of a, a number of different factors. Uh, so if you wanna use the term epidemic, yes, it is an appropriate term but essentially that only means that it's at a higher rate than it used to be. Okay, and how many other states have you testified uh, for sim against similar initiatives? Uh, several, several, I don't have- And they any. were all paid for by the tobacco- Five, six, industry. something like that. They're all paid for by the tobacco industry? Yes, but as I said at the beginning, 
These are my own opinions, and I've reviewed the literature extensively, as have these other entities in other countries. Thank There's you, Senator. Controversy here. You're absolutely right, Senator. And we need to look at all of the data and all of the inputs. Thank you, sir. And, and as I understand it, Dr. Madden, your uh, testimony includes some uh, additional layers of information that we should review. There are There is additional information and it is all cited with information from the literature, published information. Thank you for that. Thank you for being here. Okay. I think, I think at Thank this you. point, since we've been sitting for a bit, um, a five minute break and then we'll resume. Uh, there are a number of other folks to hear from in opposition. There are some who are neither, a couple who are neither for nor against. And then we'll check and make sure everybody feels like they've had a chance to be heard of the folks who've lined up to testify. So we'll take a break until 2.35.
So at this point, we can resume our hearing. We have a dozen people to hear from. So let's start with uh, Mike Sherwood. I'm unmuted, but I don't have a picture going. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine and you can still testify. Okay, it's got a message just popped up. Start my video. Okay. Hi, my name is Mike Sherwood. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm the owner of two stores, Norway and Bitterford Smoke Shops, and we are an adult only store. You must be 21 to enter. Uh, we have 17 employees, and I have worked uh, the last 40 plus years in the convenience store and smoke shop field. And my estimate is that my two locations would lose about 15 to 20 percent of our combined sales would be over a million dollars over a 12 month period of time if this bill is passed. Uh, this would be devastating to our profitability and force us to make some tough decisions. This bill just affects too many categories in my stores, uh, cigarettes, cigars, smokeless, e-cigarettes, vapor products. Uh, it would be devastating to my locations and I'm here today to urge you to oppose the bill. And uh, I thank you for your time and I'm not compensated by any tobacco companies. Uh, I'm sitting here at corporate headquarters at my kitchen table. <laughs> thank you for that testimony, Mr. Sherwood. Appreciate your being here. I don't see any questions. So then we'll move on to uh, Richard Moranos. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. My name is Rich Marianos. I'm the retired assistant director with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms the Department of Justice. I'm currently a professor at Georgetown University and a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. During that time, I was uh, given my senior executive service through President Barack Obama. What I wanted to talk about is the criminal implications of a flavor ban and some of the things that I would like you to take into consideration if this legislation were to pass. One, prohibition doesn't work, it's never worked, and an increase in taxes increases crime. Um, a big part of this is the creation of crime, which I've dedicated 28 years of enforcing and trying to put a stop to. Tobacco crimes are about a $10 billion industry along the Eastern seaboard. And one of the last times that the state of Maine raised taxes, 18% of the sales moved to the outside criminal market, which is very important to consider. When I talk about um, the crime area, I was a little disturbed earlier about people calling it a, a, a red herring when we know from activity that's created around the United States in the markets where they're selling Lucy cigarettes for $2 a piece in the street corners to kids, to street gangs getting involved in it, to high value targets such as terrorists. All of these, which I have investigated or put handcuffs on or put in jail, are very important that they're not a red herring. It's fact, truth, and it's a way of life for the criminal environment. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring out is the community effect is, right now law enforcement, and this is what I work on quite a bit in the cl classes I teach at Georgetown, are uh, the effect with police in the community. And if we give cops one more reason to go in for senseless ordinances and senseless harassment, we're going to create a bridge, like a first, a, what I call the Ferguson effect, where it's going to be harder to, for cops to work with the community and try to get information they need to do their jobs better. Um, Finally, it's over $50 million in profits that are at risk right now for the state of Maine, which that can be used for better issues. Earlier, <clears throat> when we talked about the proponents to the bill, not one person, no one, talked about a solution to how we can make the situation better or you know, gave any proffer about education or treatment. And I think that is very, very important when we're talking about putting out an ordinance or a, a plan or a law to have some strategic plan on how we're gonna deal with the repercussions. But Massachusetts is a disaster right now. They're hemorrhaging seconds, sir. Before. And you don't wanna be the second state in the United States to be known for being part of this disastrous idea. Public safety has to be part of a public health strategy. 
and I need you to take that into consideration. We know who the predators are. People have talked to it about the people that are making cotton candy, gumdrops, and the things that are attracting youth. Why don't we go after them? Why don't we seek litigation and work towards protecting the consumers and go after the ones that are being predatory to children? I appreciate your time and I ask um, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Mr. Marianos. I have a question from uh, Senator Baldacci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Marianos, uh, thank you for your testimony. You were also been identified as a paid consultant to uh, tobacco to, to tobacco companies, isn't that correct? Oh, I've been paid by the federal government for 27 years. I've been paid by Georgetown University. I've been paid by the industry, the IACP. But what I'm talking about is something that's passionate to the criminal problem of the United States. Well, the and, question, and don't question, don't, excuse me, sir, let me, finish. Please excuse don't me, interrupt sir, let me finish here. Let's not shame the country in a criminal problem that's of academic proportion to wonder where all I'm getting paid by. Yeah, does the industry support me? Yes. Does law enforcement support me? Absolutely. Does uh, the educator support me? And right now, when I do a case study on bad policy, the university is going to pay me for my testimony right now. So you know where my money's coming from. Mr. Marianos, thank you for that answer. You're welcome. The fact is we had asked people to disclose are you being paid? Is this a comp? Yes, I said I'm being paid by industry. Yes. Okay. I think that's important for us to know. I was yes, elected to you. represent people in Bangor and Herman and in terms of this is an important public health issue. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask questions. Of America. I was elected to serve and I'm going to ask questions in order to determine what is the right public health policy. Okay. I'm not going to be lectured by somebody who is Senator, paid by Senator, the tobacco industry. You have a question, you have a question for Mr. Mario? No, I think he's answered finally that he okay. has disclosed Very it good. and wasn't disclosed in his testimony. Thank so you so we, much for your service. We can move on to uh, Robert Brooks. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you everybody for your time. Uh, my name is Robert Brooks. Uh, I am the tobacco category manager for Norea Energy Corporation. Uh, we are based in Worcester, Massachusetts. We operate 147 gas stations throughout New England. Uh, 28 of those stores are in the state of Maine and we employ over 400 people in the state. Um, some of those jobs could be at risk if LD 1550 passes. Uh, therefore, we are opposed to this bill. My years spent working in the convenience store industry has afforded me the opportunity to witness uh, purchasing behavior shift as local and state uh, tobacco restrictions take place. Uh, and simply put, uh, in my experience, state prohibitions of products that are still legal in neighboring states and legal under federal law don't work. Um, we witnessed this firsthand last year in June of 2020 when Massachusetts passed their uh, similar law to this one. Uh, in the months that followed, we monitored our cigarette business closely and we saw our New Hampshire business increase 12%. Rhode Island business increased 30%, Maine 6%. Uh, Massachusetts was down 22%. Um, so the other states offset what we lost. Now these increases in these other states um, are typically unheard of in a traditionally declining category. Um, this shift in business happened essentially overnight after the effective date of the mass ban and those trends are continuing today almost one year later. We saw similar trends in our smokeless tobacco and alternative nicotine categories as well. It was clear very early on that the stated intention of the Massachusetts menthol ban was not working. These products were still finding their way onto the streets and into the homes of mass residents. The main re reason for this is that tobacco users want what they want and will find a way to get it. They will get it by traveling to neighboring towns or states and often buy in bulk and resell to their friends and family. This increases the number of private sale tobacco transactions taking place in the community. Collectively, I think we can all agree that we do not want any tobacco sales happening outside of a licensed tobacco retailer's operation. These transactions cost, cost tax revenue and proper age verification practices are not taking place. To that point, uh, licensed tobacco retailers value their licenses to sell these products. At Norea, we take great precaution to ensure that the, the tobacco products we sell are only sold to those age 21 and older. All of our frontline employees are trained, trained extensively on age verification practices, and we are investing in additional technology to utilize ID scanning in our point of sale registers. 
Lastly, I want to add that while I am here today representing a Massachusetts-based company, I am also here as a resident of Hollis, Maine, parent of two small children, voicing my personal opposition to this bill. My story with nicotine use is an example of how this bill will hurt adults trying to stop using traditional cigarettes. I smoked regular non-menthol cigarettes for 16 years. 30 before seconds. Sure. Uh, before switching to electronic cigarettes seven years ago. I used mint, menthol, and flavored e-cigarettes to quit traditional cigarettes because I did not like the taste of tobacco flavor e-cigs. Uh, I have not touched a combustible cigarette for over seven years. I continue to use e-cigarettes and other flavored nicotine products because I enjoy it. And I firmly believe that my health has improved since quitting traditional cigarettes. In closing, I ask that you please do not pass LD1550 as it will only hurt essential businesses and adults trying to switch from cigarettes and do very little to restrict youth access to these items. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. And next we'll go to Thomas uh, Bryant. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Chairperson Meyer and committee members. My name is Tom Bryant and I am the executive director of the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, a national retail trade association with member stores in Maine. The FDA has taken significant actions and is proposing additional prohibitions to remove flavored tobacco products from the marketplace. And for this reason, our association urged you not to support LD1550. One of those actions was in February of 2020, last year, when the FDA banned the sale of most cartridge-based and pod-based electronic cigarettes because they were attractive to youth. Then, every manufacturer of electronic cigarettes was required to file a pre market tobacco application called a PMTA referred to earlier with the agency by September 9th of 2020 or they had to remove their products from the market if they didn't file. The standard that Congress requires the FDA to apply to these PMT applications is important because the product has to be quote appropriate for the protection of the public health in order to be authorized to remain on the market by the FDA. So with the FDA having set scientific knowledge and the resources to review these PMTA applications and apply this congressionally mandated public health standard of being appropriate for the protection of public health, please consider not proceeding with LD1550, but allow the FDA to administer its regulations to determine which products remain on the market or which are removed. In fact, just yesterday, the FDA announced it issued warning letters to 24 companies requiring them to remove electronic nicotine products from the market because they did not file PMTAs. So the agency is active in enforcing their regulations. Moreover, and this has not been discussed yet, the FDA has a special authorization process for manufacturers to seek what is called a modified risk tobacco product authorization or an MRTP. This kind of designation for a modified risk tobacco product is reserved for the FDA if the product has reduced risk or reduced level of toxic exposure to the user. To date, 12 products have received an MRTP authorization. Some of those are flavored, but LD1550 would even ban the sale of those flavored MRTP products, which the FDA has already determined are beneficial to the public health because they have a lower health risk. Also with the FDA announcing just last week new regulations to prohibit the sale of menthol cigarettes and all flavored cigars, this federal action should be allowed to proceed and LD1550 should be paused since the FDA regulations will focus on many of the same products that will be banned by LD1550. Finally, it is important to note that Connecticut, Maryland, and Virginia did not pass bills this year banning all traditional flavored tobacco products because of the many reasons put forth today by the other uh, opponents. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. I'm not seeing any questions. So I think at this point, we should go to the folks who would like to testify neither for nor against. And we can begin with Guy Bentley. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to speak and thank you for your patience. I know it's been an exceedingly long day. Um, so much has already been said, so I won't add too much to it, but just a few facts and figures I wanted to correct that I heard in previous testimony and then once again emphasize what's happening with flavored tobacco products on the FDA level. 
Um, I believe I heard it said earlier that the majority of youth smokers use menthol cigarettes. Um, that's actually not correct. The percentage of youth using menthol cigarettes, that's of youth who smoke, is 46%. So 54.5% of youth who smoke use non-menthol cigarettes. And recently, a study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that when there was a ban on menthol cigarettes in Canada, uh, unfortunately, it did not reduce smoking because youth switched to non-menthol cigarettes. As for flavors in e-cigarettes, which has been a big focus of the committee, um, it's absolutely true that the majority of youth use, who use e-cigarettes use flavored products, but that shouldn't necessarily be confused for the reasons why they use it. So the CDC conducted a study to investigate this question and found that 78% um, of youth who vape cited reasons other than flavors. And that has, has, has already been said, youth vaping has fortunately been going down um, since last year, and that was prior to the introduction of lockdowns and school closures. Uh, now, with the FDA process that has been talked about in this part of the hearing, um, it is kind of a win-win for Maine here, because if the FDA deems that these products we're discussing today are net harmful to the public health, if after thorough investigation, which is happening as we speak, and which will conclude this year, that if FDA determines that the costs are too high and the benefits are not worth it, they will be removed from the product this year. So it should really be left up to the FDA to decide the net harms and benefits of these products after conducting thorough investigation of these products and decide whether they're gonna ban these products or promote a policy like we have in the, um, in the United Kingdom where I'm sure it's painfully obvious that I'm from where the National Health Service, which is our universal healthcare system, promotes e-cigarettes to smokers trying to quit. And I can happily say that my own mother, who recently celebrated her 70th birthday, quit several years ago, thanks to switching to vaping. But with that, I will stop it there and happy to answer any questions. And once again, thank you so much for your time. Um, Mr. Bentley, thank you for that. And I see you've uh, submitted your testimony. So thanks for having that available. Um, did I understand you to say that the FDA would be making their decision and enforcing it in the same by the end of the year? The PMTA uh, deadline for deadline for a decision on whether these um, pr uh, products can be approved or not. The deadline is currently set for September, I believe, this mm -hmm. year. So if they if they look at these, and that includes both the devices and the flavors, it's the whole gamut of these products that you're seeing put in applications. And so if they decide that, for instance, one type of e-cigarette is particularly beneficial or effective, stay on the market, help smokers quit, that's fine. But too many youth are using this one, we're gonna take it off the market, no, no more. Much like we actually saw last year with the federal action to actually take um, flavored products in um, closed system e-cigarettes. So for instance, like uh, products such as Juul, uh, were no longer allowed to sell um, uh, most of their flavored products along with all the closed systems because there was a concern that whilst youth weren't using the open system products, which you mostly find in bake shops, for instance, that there was uh, a number of them using the closed system products. So the FDA took action on that front. And those companies, they can apply to and have applied to the FDA to put their products back on the market. And it'll be up to the FDA to say, you've made improvements, the liability has gone down here or uh, or we're going to keep these off the market. So yeah, thankfully, we will have some actual decision and guidance on this uh, um, later this year. So I, un I understand the decision will be made by the FDA, but you may not, you may be undervaluating the Americans' abilities to be litigious. Uh, that they spent a long, a number of years in court following that release. No, thankfully, the law and the Tobacco Control Act of 2009 is um, uh, pretty airtight. And ever since e-cigarettes were deemed tobacco products in 2016, um, there, there was litigation, particularly around that date, um, of trying to shift the date around, or saying the deeming rule itself was unconstitutional. Um, those, um, those litigations failed, so we are sort of at the end of the road here. So I think it's a sort of decision time for the FDA to really evaluate which of these products are going to help smokers quit, which are a threat, and so on and so forth. And thankfully, there's a large staff at FDA that can, um, that can evaluate these product applications, which are extraordinarily long and uh, expensive. I believe FDA estimated the, around the average cost of a single PMTA, which you have to file for each individual product, is around half a million to a million dollars. 
uh, and some put it as high as five to 10 million. So it's, um, if you want to have an e-cigarette approved or a, um, a product that is less harmful than traditional cigarettes, um, you have to have a pretty thorough application and process in place, which you know, should hopefully be reassuring um, if and when those products are approved. Thank you for that information. I appreciate that. Representative Perry, you had your hand up. Yes, I did. Actually, I, I was going to ask uh, in the UK if uh, the e-cigarettes are uh, over the counter or were they, pres were they prescribed as a uh, smoking cessation uh, treatment? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, they're over the counter. Uh, so just as, as you would see in the United States, there's um, vape shops. They're also sold in supermarkets. But um, local doctor surgery, so your general practitioner and so on, if you're a smoker and you've tried to quit with the patch or the gum and hasn't worked, tried to go to cold turkey, they will say, if you can't quit through any other way, give vaping a try. And in fact, um, there are, in fact, vape shops in several uh, NHS hospitals now to encourage smokers to try and switch over to e-cigarettes. And every year, Public Health England, um, the UK's main public health authority reviews uh, the literature around um, vaping and e-cigarettes they keep an eye on youth use which fortunately in the UK even with a much more we might say liberal policy on vaping the youth vaping rate in the UK is actually significantly lower than the in the US so I completely understand that there's massive concerns when we saw the big uptick in youth vaping in 2018 and so on uh, that there were concerns around that thankfully that's dropped off a little bit and hopefully things like tobacco 21 and FDA enforcement will push that rate down. But I think what is interesting is that it shows that you can have access to these products for current adult smokers and not necessarily increase the youth vaping rate. And flavors in the youth, there's no regulation or there is regulation on product safety, but there's no limit on uh, flavors in the UK. Mr. Bentley, can you, can you help us understand, uh, you're obviously well informed in this arena, can you help us understand about the Reason Foundation and, and how, you, how you've come to be knowledgeable about this? Yeah, so the Reason Foundation, we're a 501c3 nonprofit think tank. Um, we conduct public policy analysis on several areas ranging from education to pensions um, to areas that I work in, like tobacco harm reduction uh, and so on. So we're a nonprofit public policy think tank, much as uh, you would expect from me living in Arlington and across the road from DC. So part of that uh, nexus, so spending my days in policy papers and dusty white briefs, that's, uh, that's the focus. We originally founded in California, but uh, most of our staff work, um, work all over the country on, uh, on various different issues. I personally came interested in this issue when I was back in the UK as a reporter and, um, and covering this story in a big way when it was much more controversial in the UK than it was now. I think we're sort of having the debates the UK had maybe five, 10 years ago on this subject. That's how I became interested and I moved to the US and um, started working on, uh, on these issues. Thank you. There's a question from Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How are you funded, please? Uh, we're funded uh, purely through donations. Uh, we don't take um, any government funding whatsoever. We won't take government grants or contracts uh, for any of the work we do. Uh, so we, like any other 501c3, we're just funded through voluntary donations. Do you, t do you get dollars from the tobacco companies? Uh, you would have to speak to our development part, uh, departments about that. Um, I'm a policy analyst. I do not get involved um, with our funding mechanism. I believe, however, as a resource, we also publish a magazine called Reason Magazine. It's been around since, uh, I believe it's 1968. And I believe at the end, I think it's our, their end issue every year, there's a list of, um, uh, there's a list, list of donors. I could be wrong on that, but I, I believe that's there as well. But I'm not in the development department, but um, it would be happy to send you the information of uh, our development director. Would you please? Thank you for your uh, information and uh, your testimony. We'll be reviewing that. Um, as we looked around, we found somebody else who wanted to testify who wasn't able to be with us earlier. Uh, I'll uh, invite uh, Ron Bailey. Dr. Bailey, do you want to join us? by unmuting and uh, offering your testimony. Yes, so Ron Bailey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Ron Bailey, can you hear me? We can. Are you talking to me? Hi, Ron Bailey. We can hear you. 
All right, Beth, Beth we've got Yeah, I'll be brief as well, uh, kind of late, late in the day. I've been moving around in the hospital here, but my name is Ron Bailey. I'm a forensic psychiatrist by training. I think I'm involved in this as a past president of the National Medical Association in 2013. Uh, currently, I serve as the assistant dean for education at uh, UCLA Charles Drew School of Medicine in Los Angeles, and I'm the CMO and the medical officer for Kedron Psychiatric Hospital. My comments are very brief. I've been involved in forensic psychiatry for 30 years now. I think that all the comments today, I've listened to the entire testimony, have been really outstanding. I think they do pull at your heartstrings in, in each and every area, especially the personal stories of persons who've had, uh, family members who've had difficulty related to uh, access to and use of uh, tobacco and tobacco products and the health consequences that it can cause. So I often start by simply saying that as a doctor, uh, I certainly uh, treat people for addiction and the like. I think that those issues are, are relevant. Some of the testimony today has also pointed out that education really is the key to decrease personal behaviors that are, are adverse in, in every spectrum. But for me, really, the key issue in this, in this business is this, this issue regarding the concept that uh, our legal system has unfortunately created a process where all too often uh, young persons, young men, uh, blacks and browns, are disproportionately um, adversely impacted by laws that create or criminalize uh, create the opportunity for, I think, for uh, policemen to come into contact with uh, young persons uh, on one issue so and they have absolutely the conflict or arrest them, I think, on other issues. Uh, Those are, I think, really often the, uh, the key difficulties. So I submitted um, a written testimony. I have testified before in other states on this very issue uh, representing the NMA. Uh, I have been compensated, I think, for my time, uh, as I was asked to speak to before earlier. Um, but these are really my thoughts and my comments, and I hope that the persons who are, who are voting the, the legislators will appreciate that. I think it's the unintended consequences very often in our society that these kinds of laws have created because of the complex that we're in that I think are, are problematic. The issue is a very good one, but to criminalize it, I think it's a problem, especially for young individuals, or African American particularly, uh, in how our legal system very often engages with them. I'll stop with those comments. Well, thank you for your comments and your succinctness. I appreciate that input. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Bailey? I don't see any, sir, so back to work. Thank you for thank being you. here. You too. Thanks for having me. So I'm deferring to Ms. Withy to confirm that there's nobody else who wants to testify, that everybody on our current attendee list this has a chance to be heard and if you haven't please put your hand up but as i scan the list it looks like we've heard from everybody um, so at this point we uh invite questions to go to kristen braun uh, in anticipation of a work session what kind of questions have you representative stover had one You're on mute, you're still muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'll pass for now, thank you. Okay. All right, any other, any, yes, Representative Craven? Mr. Chair, um, I would like to see um, the scientific um, um, information about uh, vaping being a good alternative to quit smoking. Um, and um, if it's possible um, to get a list of the chemicals that are uh, that are in um, some, you know, like maybe Juul or, or some other brand um, that's popular. Thank you. I think we heard testimony today that um, yes, it helps and no, it doesn't help. Um, so I know, that's why I'm so confused. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Senator Baldacci. If we could uh, get like uh, reports from the Surgeon General's office within the last couple of years on this topic, as well as some respected publications like the New England Journal of Medicine and that type of thing, it would be helpful to get some, you know, recent um, scholarly academic work um, in this area would be helpful as background information. I also, yes, uh, Senator Craven, Representative Craven. 
Thank you. There was a senator in that box a minute ago. Okay. Thank you. So I'm I'm also confused about Massachusetts. Uh, I'm sure that they expect it to have tax losses, and but it sounded so catastrophic. Uh, could we have some kind of, uh, of 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 information about what else happened? We heard from uh, we heard from one person that said it was uh, successful, and we heard from a number of people who said the revenues went across the border. Um, any other questions? Um, I think I need a list of the categories of products we're talking about, not the specific names. I don't need the 1500 varieties for flavors, but I think if we're going to be um, careful about this, we need to make sure that um, category by category, we're, we're not creating problems. So, so categories of um, for just e-cigarettes? Uh, or... No, just uh, so there's cartridge and there's non-cartridge, there's okay. enclosed and open, there's um, combustible. I, I just need to, I need a big picture if we're going to start to try and dissect this and do a good job with it. Okay, so both uh, e-cigarettes and combustible. And then um, also smokeless tobacco too? Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Some of those I'm much more familiar with than the other. Luckily, I stole some cigarettes from my father when I was 10 and got sick as a dog and haven't been back since. So, <laughs> any, <laughs> any, uh, <laughs> couldn't help myself. It's been a long day. Thank you all for hanging in there. Are there any other questions from Ms. Brown? There being none, and I'm knowing that she doesn't want to raise the possibility of additional work for the rest of the committee for the Sorry. rest of today. Sorry. Yes, Sorry. Attorney Craven. Well, uh, I meant to ask um, our young dentist that was here before, but could we have some numbers around uh, mouth um, damage or cancer uh, for the, um, you know, the chewing tobacco or the the uh, one the little the little cans that. Snuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do know that Kathleen Dunbar's testimony. She had some some good information. She's a hygienist. There was she some number in there. Yeah, she had some numbers in there as well. Representative Stover. And I would just add that smoking in general, whether it's cigarettes or e-cigarettes or or snuff, all of them have a deleterious effect on your oral health. Yeah. Um, nice, nice to better. Yeah, more I mean, fully understand that cancer, but it just really is a, it's very bad for your mouth, as it turns out, it's all of it. So I think we could find some information on that. That would be great. Representative Griffin, did you have your hand up? I was just trying to help uh, Representative Stover. She was waving at you and I wasn't sure if you saw her. Okay. No, I, I know to check that box. She's a waiver. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Griffin. <laughs> Welcome. The team effort. Are there any other questions to go to Kristen in anticipation of a work session probably next week? Uh, there was some discussion about chairs and leads and scheduling after we get all done. Is that something that you are up for, Representative Griffin and Senator Moore? You okay with that, Representative Meyer? Sure. Sure, just to finish up the schedule for next week. Yeah, since all we have right. Thursday and Friday available now. Yeah, uh, not that we have to use all those days. <laughs> no, we, we could take a day off on Friday. That'd be nice. That'd be good. All right. <laughs> so I think with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn until next week. Um, I'm not sure when. I haven't looked that far ahead. Um, I'll thank everybody for their attention. It's 10 o'clock on Monday. 10 o'clock on Monday. I think that was our first uh, first attempt to ease back on the schedule a little bit. Ms. Withy, did you have anything you wanted to contribute before we go? Thanks for hanging in there. I know you've been busy, right? One thing after another. Moving people in. <laughs> yeah, moving Happy people Mother's in and out. Day, yeah. I would move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. <laughs> There's a I motion. Would would you I would second that and, and thank everyone for being here today and spending oh. your Friday in committee. A sunny Friday. All of <laughs> yeah. those in favor of adjourning until 10 o'clock on Monday. <laughs>